from the book jacket. Fighting alongside the Corellian rebels, Han and Leia are locked in a war against their son Jason, who grows more powerful and more dangerous with each passing day. Nothing can stop Jason's determination to bring peace with a glorious Galactic Alliance victory, whatever the price. While Luke grieves the loss of his beloved wife, and deals with his guilt over killing the wrong person in retaliation, Jaina, Jag, and Zek hunt for the real assassin, unaware that the culprit commands Sith powers that can cloud their minds and misdirect their attacks, and even turn them back on themselves. As Luke and Ben Skywalker struggle to find their place among the chaos, Jason, shunned by friends and family, launches an invasion to rescue the only person still loyal to him. But with the battle raging on, and the galaxy growing more turbulent and riotous, there's no question that it is Jason who is most wanted, dead or alive. Chapter 1 Above the Planet Kashyyyk Aboard the Millennium Falcon The Falcon banked over a vision of hell. Directly below was a roiling surface of blacks and yellows, reds and oranges. Eastward, the carpet of fire gave way to doomed forest. The line between the two zones was an irregular and uncertain one, and even at the distance of a couple of kilometers, Han Solo could see individual trees at the border burst into fire, some of them exploding from the heat. Westward, superheated air rose in a column kilometers in diameter, hauling smoke high into the atmosphere, obscuring the afternoon sun. And it was the smoke column that showed the real danger of the maelstrom. As that column rose, it drew in air from all directions, constantly fanning the fire around it, feeding the voracious beast that burned out of control. It had once been an unbroken vista of soaring rochere trees and other foliage. But a few days earlier, the Star Destroyer Anakin Solo, at the order of Jason Solo, had directed its long-range turbolasers at the surface of Kashyyyk, concentrating fire to cause square-kilometer patches of forest to explode in flames. These strikes were intended to punish the Wookiees for harboring Jedi and for dragging their feet before committing their forces to Jason's galactic alliance. Punish they had. The fires had grown into firestorms raging out of control ever since. The falcon kicked as she glided over a thermal updraft. Han brought her back to smooth level flight, cocking his head to hear any sound of a panel dislodge, a bolt kicked free by the unexpected motion but no new noise was added to the catalog of thousands he knew by heart. The communications board crackled with Leia's voice. Sweep complete. I've planted the last beacon. Han sent the disc-shaped freighter into a bank and descent toward their rendezvous point, about two kilometers outside the fire zone. Any problems? Nothing but. Had to make some quick repairs on one of the beacons— and I keep having to dodge streams of fleeing animals. The falcon bucked harder as a particularly ferocious thermal caught her, and then she was out over unburned forest. The ground was higher here, the trees far shorter. Not one of them was over half a kilometer in height. Geological surveys showed that the soil here was too shallow to support full-grown rochers. A subterranean ridge of stone stunting the trees, would mark the fire's stopping point, in this area, at least. Han checked the comm board, looking for the signal being transmitted by Leia's last beacon, and homed in on it. Waru! Stand by on the winch! There was an affirmative growl across the intercom. Han could also hear it more faintly, echoing up the cockpit access corridor behind him. Waru was standing by at the starboard docking ring, open to Kashyyyk's atmosphere, ready to retrieve Leia. Han allowed himself a brief smile. 
It was good to have a Wookiee aboard the Falcon again. It reminded him of the old days, when he and Chewbacca were young and carefree, assuming that being hunted by bounty hunters and Imperial anti-smuggler forces didn't count as cares. And Waru wasn't just any Wookiee. He was Chewbacca's son, a clever son, a good warrior. If things had been very different, if Han's son Jason had not turned out the way he had, perhaps the Falcon could have been Jason some day, with Waru at his side, a continuation of Han's roguish legacy. Instead, Jason had become something dark, something terrible, a self-appointed leader determined to impose rigid control over the galaxy. He had conspired, tortured, betrayed, murdered, all with a confidence in the rightness of his cause that was the match of any madman's. And though Han tried to tell himself that Jason was dead to him, nothing but a stranger wearing his son's face and name, each new outrage Jason committed still gripped his heart in an iron fist and squeezed hard. The communications board beeped to indicate that they were close to the beacon source. Han depressed the bow to give himself a better downward look. He heard a thump from the starboard side, followed by a growl of complaint, and grinned again. Sorry. No more sudden maneuvers, I promise. The Rocheers were still tall enough here that the forest floor was a deeply gloomy and dangerous place. There was no clearing to set down in. But Leia was visible, her white robes starkly contrasted among all the greenery, standing on an upper branch as if loitering on a Coruscant pedwalk, unconcerned about winds or the potentially pesky force of gravity. She waved. Han positioned the falcon directly above her. All right, Waru, bring her up. A moment later, he heard the whirring sound of the winch lowering its line to Leia. The crew of the Millennium Falcon was about to commit an act that, under other circumstances, would have been considered as horrible as Jason's setting of fires, because the two acts were almost the same. A Confederation cruiser in low planetary orbit would soon fire its turbolaser batteries down at the forests, setting portions of them ablaze. But this strike would be surgical, precisely following the kilometers-long line of beacons Leia had planted. Once that line was drawn, the turbolasers would broaden it toward the east. And the Falcon, other freighters carrying fire-snuffing foam and Wookiee firefighting teams would control it along its western perimeter. The controlled burn, once extinguished, would leave only char for the advancing wildfire to meet, and that char would be too broad for wind-borne sparks to jump. The fire would end here, and the Falcon and other ships would move on to create firebreaks elsewhere, eventually checking the wildfire everywhere. Finally, its food all consumed, the firestorm, the beast, would die of starvation, leaving behind millions of burned acres and a scarred, smoke-shrouded world. Han heard the winch stop its whir, then moments later resume it, bringing Leia up to him. He felt a wash of relief. He knew she could take care of herself. That didn't mean he didn't worry whenever she put herself in the path of danger. He set the falcon into a gentle eastward course, sending it away from the firebreak area, and checked to make sure his communications were still set to the Confederation frequency. Millennium Falcon to Lilibanka. Beacons are in place. You can begin. At number one, if you please, not number twenty. He heard a chuckle, before the voice of the cruiser's mail communications officer replied, Acknowledged, Falcon, and thanks. Then there was a new voice, female, pitched low and seductive, from close behind Han. Your feelings betray you. Jolted by adrenaline, Han jerked around to look. 
standing in the entrance to the cockpit, was a woman. She was robed nearly head to foot in dark garments. Only her face showed. And it was a beautiful face, blue-skinned, cheerful of expression. Her name was Alima Rar, and she had come to kill him. Han drew his blaster. As he did, Alima gestured, a flourish that swept her cloak away from her body, and reached out with her left hand as her right snatched her lightsaber from her belt. Han's pistol, barely clearing its holster, flew from his grip and into hers. Han gaped at her. She should not have been able to do that. Her left arm was useless, had been ruined years earlier, but now it was fine. She tsk-tsked at him. We are a Jedi. We choose not to be shot. We have been shot before. It is not pleasant. She dropped the blaster. It rang as it hit the deck plates. Han put bravado he didn't feel into his voice. So? What are you going to do, talk me to death? His mind flashed through the weapons and resources he had at hand. They included one hideaway vibrablade, which wasn't much use against a Jedi like Alima, and one very large weapon that had seldom let him down. We are going to wait. Until your piranha beetle of a wife can see. And then we will shove our lightsaber through your heart. She can hold your corpse and cry. Won't that be nice? Not really. There were times when it was a wonderful thing that Han knew the Falcon as well as he did. That he knew her well enough to handle every control. Every instrument, even if blind or disoriented. Without taking his gaze off Alima, he reached forward and disengaged the freighter's inertial compensator and artificial gravity generator. In the same instant, he hit the thrusters and hauled back on the control yoke. He stood the falcon on her tail and blasted off toward space. With the inertial compensator off, the sudden acceleration crushed him back into his seat. His head swam with unaccustomed dizziness. Alima's expression changed from one of good humor to round-eyed surprise as she fell backward. Han heard her thump against the wall of the cockpit access corridor. She had to have hit where the corridor angled away toward port and stern. He heard his blaster pistol clattering along after her. Then there were more thumps and clatters, as Alima and the blaster rolled down the slope the angle wall now constituted. There was also laughter. Peals of Alima's laughter. Waru, his golden-brown fur gleaming orange and red in the glow of fire visible through the docking ring, was just hauling Leia aboard when the falcon bucked her bow suddenly pointed straight toward the smoke-filled sky and accelerated. Waru and Leia were slammed into the aft bulkhead of the corridor just inside the starboard docking ring. Abruptly, the bulkhead was floor, and the acceleration pressed them down like a big, invisible hand. Leia unbuckled herself from the winch harness and drew in a breath to shout at Han. Could he have failed to notice that the Falcon's artificial gravity wasn't functioning? Then she heard it, laughter echoing off the Falcon's bulkheads and floor plates. Waru stood, his great strength making the move look easy despite the several gravities of acceleration hauling at him, and offered a confused-sounding rumble. Ali Marar, she's aboard. Leia drew on the force to augment her physical strength. She stood shakily, took her lightsaber in hand, and ignited it. Let's go. Stiff-legged, she marched the several meters down the boarding ring corridor. The ramp that was the Solo's usual means of entering and leaving the Falcon, now constituting a grimy wall to her right. 
She reached the hatchway leading to the freighter's main corridor, the curved passageway that offered access to all of the Falcon's compartments. But stepping into the main corridor would cause her to drop for a considerable distance. Then the curved corridor wall, acting as a steeply angled floor, would cause her to tumble painfully until she reached the gap accessing the freight lift. At that point, she'd fall several more meters and slam into the bulkhead separating internal compartments from the sublight engines. Her gymnastics ability and force skills would allow her to handle those movements without injury under normal circumstances, but at several gravities, she wasn't as sure. The freight lift was probably where Alima was now, but Leia couldn't be sure of that either. The laughter had ceased and Leia could not find Alima in the force. Leia glanced over her shoulder at Waru. Get to the cockpit. That's where Alima is going to end up. Protect Han. Watch out for poison darts. Waru groaned in assent. He moved past Leia, crouched, and leapt across the main corridor, catching with both hands the corner where a side corridor led to the weapons turret access tubes. Even against the multiple gravities hauling at him, he clambered up until he stood on that side corridor wall, turned to face Leia, and leapt back toward her, this time grabbing the sides of the hatch opening well above her head, the opening that led to the cockpit access corridor. Han's voice came over Leia's comlink. Hang on, guys! Wincing in anticipation, Leia grabbed both sides of the hatch access where she stood. She heard Waru's grumble of complaint. The falcon snap-rolled, spinning axially and simultaneously changing direction. Straining to hold herself in place, Leia saw nothing change around her. But she heard the sounds of cargo containers, furnishings, and loose wall and floor plates ricocheting around the freighter's interior, and she felt disoriented. Then she realized why. Above her, Waru's legs were no longer hanging downward. They were splayed across what should have been the corridor's ceiling. That meant the falcon was now upside down. As Leia watched, the Wookiee wriggled his way into the cockpit access corridor. He was out of her sight, but she could still hear him complain. Leia rolled forward, an acrobatic tumble that propelled her into the main access corridor. She landed carefully so as not to crush any of the glow rods, sensors, or other items mounted on what should have been the ceiling, but now served as her floor. She had to find Alima. But that wouldn't be too difficult, for the mad Twi'lek's merry laughter reached her again, distinctly from the direction of the Falcon's stern. Lightsaber lit, she carefully moved in that direction. Ahead to the left, upside down to her current position, was the freighter's engineering station, its consoles permitting the monitoring of every system aboard ship. Ahead to the right, the curved wall gave way to the broad opening leading into the engineering bay, with its access to the freight lift, hyperdrives, sublight engines, and other critical systems. From that direction there was the sound of a lightsaber humming, but it was a constant tone a weapon being held still, neither advancing nor maneuvering. Leia reached out through the force, looking again for her quarry. She detected first Waru, then Han, then Waru again. Again? She opened her mouth to call a question over her comlink, but the lightsaber ahead of her began snapping and hissing as it contacted a metal surface. Leia swore under her breath, and charged forward. As she rounded the corner into the engineering bay, she spotted her quarry. On the far side of the freight lift, Alima Rar stood beside the broad circular housing of the hyperdrive. She held her lightsaber in two good, steady hands as she drove its point deep into the housing, sending up sparks that illuminated the bay brilliantly. And she was standing on the floor. The true floor her feet planted on the surface above Leia's head as though gravity didn't matter. She looked over as Leia entered. Princess, 
Come help us destroy the hyperdrive. Then together we can cut the engines to pieces. Wary, Leia advanced. I'll cut you to pieces first. That will show me how to do it. You first. Alima's words were cut off as the falcon suddenly spun axially, dropping the floor from beneath her feet and sending her crashing into the ceiling, throwing Leia's shoulder first into the starboard bulkhead. A few moments before, Lumpawaru had held the four corners of the cockpit doorway with both hands and both feet. He grumbled loudly at Han. Han glared at the Wookiee over his shoulder. I don't care what Leia said. Get back there and help her. Grumble. I'll shut the cockpit hatch. If Alima gets back up here, she'll have to cut through it, which will give the two of you plenty of time to get here. Grumble. If it'll make you feel better, I'll look where I'm flying. Han turned to face forward. Not that there's anything else up here, and the proximity alarms will let me know if— the proximity alarms shrieked and alert, and the sky outside the cockpit viewports lit up so brightly that Han's vision washed away to whiteness. He believed he could feel an instant sunburn on his face and hands. Waru howled. Shutting his eyes, Han snap-rolled to starboard. Waru's howl of complaint remained constant. The Wookiee hadn't been torn free from the cockpit opening. What had he almost flown into? Then Han knew. Lilabanka, in orbit, had begun her firebreak bombardment, and Han's maneuvers had sent the Falcon straight toward the first blast. But now which way could he go? He couldn't see, and any direction might send him straight toward... into the second blast. Any direction but two. He continued his spin into the tightest rightward arc he could manage, bringing the Falcon around 360 degrees so swiftly that the freighter's struts and rivets groaned in complaint. Then, when only his pilot's experience told him he was again on his original course, he pulled the yoke back and sent the freighter straight up once more. Flying that way, he couldn't move laterally far enough to hit the second beam. He was momentarily safe. Waru wasn't. The Wookiee's howl modulated from outrage to surprise. Han heard Waru slam into the bulkhead of the cockpit access passage, then follow Alima's earlier bumpy path as he rolled down the corridor. There was a momentary silence. Han winced as he visualized Waru being catapulted into the main access corridor. In an instant would come a big bang of Wookiee on metal. The falcon spin pinned Leia against the corridor for long moments. She drew on the force to help her push away from it, resisting centrifugal effect. But it took all her concentration. That and the need to keep an eye on Alima and an ear on all the items of cargo, machinery, personal gear, and, for all she knew, personnel— ricocheting off bulkheads all over the ship. Alima was not as encumbered by the Falcon's movements. The spin had pinned her for a moment to the ceiling, but now she rose as if gravity were proper and steady. She rose on two good feet, despite the fact Leia knew she'd lost half of one foot. Her features were as youthful and unblemished as when Leia had first met her fifteen standard years before. Leia forced herself to keep her voice low and calm. Finally invested in some prosthetics, did you? And some vanity surgery to rid yourself of facial lines, sags, scars. Nothing so crude. We are simply ageless and eternal now, as we have always deserved to be. Alima lifted her lightsaber in a traditional salute. A come-fight-me gesture. The falcon stood on her tail again. Leia, caught off guard, hurtled toward the rear of the engineering bay, right past Alima, who didn't budge. 
Leia spun her lightsaber in a defensive arc, an attempt to block the blow she knew must come. But it didn't. Alima merely danced aside. Leia crashed into the stern bulkhead, an impact that sent waves of shock through her back muscles, shoulder blades, spine. For a brief second she was helpless, bent with pain. But Alima didn't whip out her blowgun to send a dart her way. She didn't even essay a lightning-quick leap, followed by a maiming slash with her weapon. She advanced slowly, walking carefully down the ceiling toward Leia. Recovering, Leia reached out, a flailing motion that sent a wash of force energy toward her enemy. Alima merely rocked back on her heels and looked faintly amused. Growing weaker? Perhaps it is the infirmity of age. There was a dull rattling noise, and Waru, spinning like a child's toy, hurtled down at Leia from the main corridor. Leia twisted aside and exerted herself upward through the force, slowing Waru's fall. The Wookiee crashed into the bulkhead beside her, but softly, not hard enough to impair a being of his size and strength. Alima's smile broadened. In a movement that was curiously clumsy and unpracticed, she raised her lightsaber and charged to swing it down at Waru. Leia raised her own blade, catching Alima's seemingly unpracticed attack. Their blades met, sizzled, sparked. Waru rolled away from the two of them and sat up, swinging his bowcaster off his back and aiming it at Alima. The weapon, built tough to Wookiee standards, did not seem to be damaged. No! Leia lashed out with her foot as Waru fired. She connected first, kicking Alima backward, and angled her own lightsaber to catch the bowcaster bolt. It sizzled out of existence against the blade. Puzzled, Waru offered an offended growl. He rose to his feet and hastily recocked his bowcaster. Leia got her feet under her and leapt toward Alima, positioning herself between the Twi'lek and the Wookiee. She caught Alima's next strike this one as suitably swift and ferocious as any Jedi's, before it could sever her right arm. But she did not press her attack. Waru, don't shoot. There's something wrong. Trust me. Waru offered a little grumble of complaint. He aimed, but did not fire. Leia strained against Alima's blade, panting from pain and exertion. Their blades sparked and sizzled as they pressed against each other, slid along each other's lengths. Alima tried to disengage and strike, but Leia simply followed her step for step, staying close, fighting purely defensively. Alima struck a second time, and a third, all shots toward one of Leia's limbs. But Leia blocked two of the blows, dodged the third. Alima's smile did not fade, but after another moment her strength seemed to. She sagged back as Leia continued to push. Fine. Her tone was light, but there was a forced, brittle quality to it. We will meet later. She leapt up and backward, landing on the main corridor wall above, her motion so light and graceful that it seemed she could not possibly be affected by the falcon's constant upward acceleration. Then she turned and ran toward the hatchways to the circuitry bay and crew quarters. Leia and Waru leapt after her, an effort for both Jedi and Wookiee. But, though Alima had been out of sight for only a few moments, though she could not have made it as far as either hatchway, she was gone. Chapter 2 Chief of State's Briefing Office, Coruscant The advisor's voice was like the droning of insects, and Darth Kytus knew what to do about insects, ignore them or step on them. But in this case, he couldn't afford to ignore the drone. The advisor, whatever her failings as a speaker, was providing him with critical data. 
nor could he raise a boot to crush the source of the drone. Not with Admiral Chan Niathal, his partner in the coalition government running Coruscant and the Galactic Alliance, sitting on the other side of the table. Not with aides hovering and holocam recorders running. To make matters worse, the advisor would soon wrap up, and inevitably she would address him by the name he so disliked, the name he had been born with, the name he would soon abandon. And then he would once again feel and have to resist the urge to crush her. She did it. The blue-skinned Amwati female, her feathery hair dyed a somber black, and her naval uniform freshly pressed, looked up from her data pad. In conclusion, Colonel Solo, Kytus gestured to interrupt her. In conclusion, the withdrawal of the entire Hapen fleet from Alliance forces removes at least twenty percent of our naval strength, and puts us into a game of withdrawal and entrenchment if we are to keep the Confederation from overrunning us, and the treachery of the Jedi in abandoning us at Kuat is further causing a loss of hope among the segments of the population who believe that their involvement means something. Yes, sir. Thank you. That will be all. She rose, saluted, and left silently, her posture stiff. Kaidas knew she feared him, that she had been struggling to maintain her composure all through the briefing, and he approved. Fear in subordinates meant instant compliance and extra effort on their part. Usually. Sometimes it meant treachery. Neothel addressed the other aides present. We are done here. Thank you. When the office door whooshed closed behind the last of them, Kaidas turned to Neothel. The Moon Calamari her white admiral's uniform almost gleaming, sat silently regarding him. The stare from her bulbous eyes was no more forbidding than usual, but Kaidas knew the message that they held. You could fix this mess by resigning. Those were not her words, however. You do not look well. Hers was the gravelly voice so common to her species, and in it there was none of the sympathy that Admiral Akbar had been able to project. Neothel was not expressing concern for his health. She was suggesting he was not fit for duty. And she was almost right. Kaidas hurt everywhere. Mere days before, he had waged the most ferocious, most terrible lightsaber duel of his life. In a secret chamber aboard his Star Destroyer, the Anakin Solo, he had been torturing Ben Skywalker to harden the young man's spirit, to better prepare Ben for life as a Sith. But he had been caught by Ben's father, Luke Skywalker. That fight. Kaidas wished he had a holo recording of it. It had gone on for what it felt like forever. It had been brutal, with the advantage being held first by Luke, then by Kytus, in what he knew had been brilliant demonstrations of lightsaber technique, of raw power within the Force, of subtle Jedi and Sith skills. For all his pain, Kytus felt a swelling of pride. Not just that he had survived that duel, but that he had waged it so well. At the end, Kaidas had lost a position of advantage. Luke had slipped free of the poison-injecting torture vines with which Kaidas had been strangling him, when Ben had driven a vibra-blade deep into Kaidas's back, punching clean through a shoulder blade, nearly reaching his heart. That had ended the fight. Kaidas should have been killed immediately. For reasons he did not understand, Luke and Ben had spared his life and departed. It was a mistake that would cost Luke. Bearing dozens of minor and major wounds, including the vibrablade puncture, a lightsaber-scored kidney, 
and a fierce scalp wound, Kaidas had been treated and resumed command of the Anakin Solo, only to experience more injury, emotional injury this time. In Kashyyyk space, his fifth fleet had been surrounded by Confederation forces. Late arriving Hapen forces could have rescued him, but the Hapen Queen Mother, Tenel Ka, his comrade and lover, had betrayed him. Swayed by the treacherous persuasion of Kytus's own parents, Han and Leia Solo, she had demanded a price for her continued military support of the Alliance, and that price had been his surrender. Of course he had refused, and of course he had battered his way out of the encirclement, leading the remnants of the Fifth Fleet back to the safety of Coruscant. So when Neothel said he did not look well, she was correct. He keenly felt his worst injury. Not the vibroblade wound, not the scalp tear, not the kidney damage. All three were healing. All three were the kind of pain that strengthened him. It was the wound to his heart that plagued him. Tenel Ka had turned on him. Tenel Ka, the love of his life, the mother of his daughter Alana, had forsaken him. Neothel's severe expression didn't waver. You could fix this mess by resigning. He gave her a tight smile. Thank you for your concern. But I'm recovering quickly. And I have a plan. We'll need to follow the recommended protocol of a fighting retreat for the next few days, at which time the Hapens will come back into the war on our side. Our job today is to figure out how best to employ them when they return to the battlefield. Since the Confederation thinks they are staying on the fence, we can utilize the Hapens for one devastating surprise attack. We need to decide where that attack will take place. You are sure the Hapens will rejoin us? I guarantee it. I have an operation in motion that will ensure it. What resources do you need to carry it out? Only those I already have. Have I seen details of your operation? Kytus shook his head. If I don't forward a file, no one can intercept it. If I don't speak a word of detail, no one can overhear it. Too much is riding on getting the Hapens back, for me to wreck things by divulging details too freely. Neothel remained silent. A more incendiary personality would have taken offense at Kytus's implied questioning of her ability to handle secret matters. Neothel chose not to recognize it as an insult. She merely turned to the next matter on her agenda. Speaking of secrets, Belindi Kalenda of Intelligence reports that Dr. Seya has been pulled off the Centerpoint Station project. Seiya reported that he had come under suspicion of being a G.A. spy. Which, of course, he is. What's his new posting? And can he get us any useful information from there? Neothel shook her head in the slow, somber way of the Moon Cows. Kalenda ordered him out. He is already back on Coruscant. Kytus resisted the urge to break something. She's an idiot, and Saya is an idiot. He could have stayed, weathered whatever investigation they brought against him, and begun feeding us information again. Kalenda was certain that he would be arrested, investigated, and executed. Then he should have stayed in place until arrested. Who knows what his cowardice has cost us? 
Even reporting on ship and troop movements could provide us with the critical advantage in a battle. Kaidas sighed and pulled out his data pad. Snapping it open, he typed a brief note to himself. Neothel rose and leaned over so that her bulbous eyes could peer upside down at his screen. What is this? A note to myself, to have Saya arrested. He provided Kalenda with false information that led her to extract him from a danger zone, which is the equivalent of desertion under fire. He will confess. He will be executed. Ah! Neathal resumed her seat, but offered no protest. Kaidas appreciated that. Neothel was clearly growing to understand that Kaidas' approach was best. It kept subordinates motivated, kept Deadwood out of the ranks. What next? Emissari and some of her allied worlds in the Hala sector just announced they were defecting to the Confederation. Kaidas shook his head dismissively. Not a significant loss. No. But it's more unsettling as the possible first sign of a trend. Intelligence has detected more communications traffic between Corellia and the Imperial Remnant, and between Corellia and the worlds of the corporate sector, which may be nothing more than an increased recruitment effort by the Confederation. Or it may have been initiated by the other parties— a prelude to negotiations and more defections. Also irrelevant. Kaidas felt a flash of irritation. Yes, these were matters that the Joint Chiefs of State needed to address, but they would all be resolved when the Heaps Consortium came back into the fold. Anything else? No. Excellent. When the meeting was done and the awful had departed, Kaidas remained in the office. He stared at the blank walls. They soothed him. He needed soothing. Inside, he was ablaze with anger, resentment, a sense of betrayal, all the emotions that fueled a Sith. In the days since his fight with Luke, he had come to the realization that he was all alone in the universe— it was like the plaintive wail of a five-year-old. Nobody loves me. He could manage a smile at just how self-pitying it sounded. But it was true. Everyone who had once known love for him now hated him. His father and mother, his twin Jaina, Tenelka, Luke, Ben. Intellectually, as he had embraced the Sith path, he had known that it would happen. One by one, those who cared about him would be peeled away like the outer layers of his skin, leaving him a mass of bloody, agonized nerves. He had known it, but experiencing it was another matter. His body might be healing, but his spirit was in greater pain every day. Everyone he had loved now hated him except Alana. And he would not allow Tenel Ka to turn his daughter against him. He would cut down anyone who stood between him and his child. Anyone. Sanctuary Moon of Endor Abandoned Imperial Outpost Years earlier, before Jason Solo had been born, before, in fact, Luke and Leia knew they were siblings, before Leia had confessed even to herself that she was in love with Han, Yoda had told Luke that electrical shocks, applied at different intensities and at irregular but frequent intervals, would prevent a Jedi from concentrating, from channeling the Force. They could render a Jedi helpless, but Yoda had never told Luke that emotional shocks could do the same thing. They could. 
and just as no amount of self-control would allow a Jedi to ignore the effects of electrical shocks on his body, neither could self-control keep Luke safely out of his memories. Every few moments, a memory, freshly applied like a current-bearing wire on his skin, would yank him out of the here and now and propel him into the recent past. Boarding the Anakin Solo Finding Jason torturing, torturing, Luke's only child, his son Ben. The duel that followed. Luke against the nephew he'd once loved. The nephew who now commanded master-level abilities in the Force, though he had not been and never would be elevated to the rank of Jedi Master. And no pain Luke suffered in that fight was equal to Ben demanding the right to finish Jason. That demand had brought Luke to where he was now, sitting cross-legged on the floor of an upper-story room of an abandoned Imperial outpost, staring through a wide transparasteel viewport at a lush Endor forest he was barely aware of, his body healing, but his spirit sick and injured even after all these days. Shocked almost beyond understanding by Ben's bloodthirst, Luke had prevented his son from executing a death blow against Jason. Nor had Luke chosen to finish Jason himself. He had led Ben in sudden flight from the Anakin Solo, a flight to prevent Ben from taking the next, possibly irreversible step toward the dark side that Jason had planned for the boy. But was it the right decision? At that moment, it had seemed like the only possible choice. Ben's future, his decency, had teetered in the balance. Had either Skywalker killed Jason, Ben would have fallen toward the dark. Some people came back from the dark. Luke had. Others didn't. Ben becoming a lifelong agent of evil had not been a certainty. What was certain was that Jason was alive. And now, as Jason furthered his plans for galactic conquest, more people would die. They would die by the thousands at least, probably by the tens or hundreds of thousands, perhaps by the millions. And Luke would be responsible. So had it been the right decision? Then against thousands of lives? Logic said no. No, unless, in falling to the dark side, Ben became as great a force for evil as Jason Solo was, or their mutual grandfather, Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader, had been. Emotion said yes. Yes, unless Ben interpreted Luke's refusal to kill as a sign of weakness, and that decision fostered contempt in him contempt for Luke and the light side of the Force. That could push him along Jason's path despite Luke's intent. And either way, those thousands would die. A translucent white rectangle, tall and very thin, appeared on the viewport ahead of Luke. It rapidly broadened, revealing itself as the reflection of a door opening in the wall behind him. Jedi Master Kip Duran stood in the doorway, his brown robes rumpled, his long, graying brown hair damp with sweat and unkempt. His expression, normally one of mild amusement, layered over what was usually interpreted as a trace of cockiness, was now more somber, neutrality concealing concern. Grand Master. Come in. Luke did not turn to face Kip. The view of Endor's wilderness was soothing. Kip moved in, and the door shut behind him, eliminating the illuminated rectangle from Luke's field of vision. The door chimes do not appear to be working on this passageway, and you are not responding to your comlink. Luke frowned. I didn't hear it. Maybe the battery is dead. He pulled his comlink from the tunic of his white Tatooine-style worksuit. 
The ready light on the small cylindrical object was still lit. A quick examination showed that the device had been shut off. Puzzled, Luke turned it on again and tucked it away. Just a routine report. The stealth X's are spread by wing pairs across a broad area, under camouflage netting. Many of the pilots found useful landing spots in areas where debris from the second Death Star came down and created burn zones. The younglings are packed into two large chambers, acting as dormitories on this outpost. But a reconnaissance team of Jedi Knights has found a cavern system not too far away, that will provide ample space for a training facility, and some defense against orbital sensors. The Jedi Knights are relocating a nest of rearing spiders there. Once they're certain the spiders and their eggs are all gone, we'll begin transferring the younglings. Good. But don't put too much effort into making those caverns livable. We'll be leaving Endor before many more weeks pass. Kip nodded. Otherwise, we seem to be dealing well with the local Ewoks. Any we know? No. Wicket's family group's territory is still limited to areas south of here. But your idea of bringing in C-3PO as an interpreter is paying off. The local clan seems to like him. Good. Kip did not immediately reply so Luke turned to give him a look. The younger master seemed to be pondering his next words. Luke cocked an eyebrow at him. Anything else? There's been some question about our next action against Jason. Ah, yes. Luke turned to look out the viewport again. I don't know. Why don't you arrange that? There was a long silence. Then, Yes, Grand Master. The rectangle of light reappeared. Kip's reflection moved into it, and it closed again, leaving Luke in silence and peace. And confronted by the memory of Jason, bloodied and battered almost beyond recognition, crawling away from him. Ben's vibra-blade lodged in his back. Ben's face appeared before him, mouthing the words, This kill is mine. Luke shivered. Chapter 3 Kashyyyk, Mytel Base Hangar Housing the Millennium Falcon There were still bright spots before Han's eyes right at the center of his focus, from the brilliance of the turbolaser blast he had almost flown into. He had to scan, traverse his line of sight, in order to work around them. Directly before him was an old sabac table with a rusty rim and a grime-spotted felt surface. A brandy bottle and a set of tumblers rested upon it. Beyond was the Millennium Falcon, her boarding ramp down, with Wookiee utility vehicles and Confederation spacecraft parked beside her. The long hangar door the Falcon faced was open, showing riverbank, trees that were stunted and tiny by Kashyyyk standards, and skies filled with haze and smoke clouds dimming the sunlight. Other buildings were visible on the far side of the river, all remnants of a long-abandoned spaceport dating from the years of Imperial occupation. The medics had said the bright spots would fade within a few hours. Not that this was much comfort. He wanted to be working on the Falcon now, at this instant. Grinning momentarily at his own childlike impatience, he lifted his tumbler and took another sip of the liquid within it. It burned a little as it went down, a smooth, flavorful heat. What is it? Leia... Seated in the spindly metal chair next to his, had seen his smile. I was thinking that if you're going to have to put up with enforced downtime, there are worse ways to do it than with a good brandy and your best girl. In his peripheral vision, he caught Leia's smile. 
but her tone was slightly less agreeable. So many things wrong with what you said. First, you don't mention liquor before your wife. Then there's the whole girl-woman issue. But that's not relevant, because you clearly didn't mean it in a spirit of dismissiveness or disenfranchisement. But the phrase, best girl, implies there are other girls. There are. There's one now. Han pointed. Descending the Falcon's boarding ramp was their daughter, Jaina. As diminutive as her mother, and as beautiful, though with narrower features, she had inherited her father's knack for mechanics, as suggested by her current form of dress, overalls spattered with spots of lubricant and hydraulic fluid. She had also inherited her mother's way with the Force, a fact attested to by the lightsaber hanging from her belt. As she descended, she wiped her hands on an oily blue rag, then noticed Han watching. Dad, all fixed. You're kidding. Jaina shook her head, then took a chair at his table. Alima's attack did some damage, but she didn't have much time to root around in the hyperdrive before Mom interrupted her. I replaced a couple of parts, and it checks out in the green. You'll want to take her up and do a practice run or two, I expect. I expect. Thanks. He gave Leia a sidelong look. I'm getting more obsolete every day. I don't even have to patch up the Falcon's battle damage anymore. Leia gave him a smile tinged with malice. You'll never be obsolete, as long as some people prefer old-fashioned tactics and parts. It's such a shame you can't spank a Jedi. There was a clattering of heels, and Han looked up to see Jagged Fell and Zek coming down the boarding ramp. Fell, son of one of the Empire's most celebrated fighter pilots, and nephew of one of the New Republics, was a well-muscled man of middle height. His hair, neatly trimmed beard, and mustache, black, a white lock at his hairline marking an old scalp wound. He wore a black flight suit. On a dark night, he would look like a face and hands floating in the air. Zack, Jaina's Jedi partner, was unusually tall, his long dark hair currently braided. Like Leia, he was dressed in ordinary Jedi robes. Jag held a blaster pistol, his finger not in the trigger housing, and as he neared Han he reversed it, offering it but first. Found it. Han set down his drink. He took the pistol, twirled it experimentally, and holstered it. Now I feel dressed again. Where was it? During your acrobatics, a hatch over one of the escape pods must have popped open. Your blaster fell into it, and the hatch closed and locked the next time you were right side up. Thanks. Han turned back to Leia. Actually, I could get used to this. Have the youngsters do all the work all the time? Hey, somebody get me a drink. Zek sat in the fourth and last chair, picked up Han's tumbler from where it rested, and moved it two centimeters closer to Han. Your drink, sir. Well, some chores are easier than others. So, Leia fixed the three newcomers with a quick, serious look. Anything? Any sign of Alima? Jag, still standing, shook his head. None. His voice was thoughtful. Extra none. Leia frowned, puzzled. What does that mean? Zek cocked a thumb over his shoulder toward the falcon. Alima left behind no fingerprints, no threads from her robes. There weren't any skin cells on any of the bulkheads you said she hit. Han scowled. She had to have left fingerprints on my blaster. She pulled it to her with the force, caught it in her hand. Her left hand, you said. Jag's voice was thoughtful. Yeah. 
she has to have finally accepted prosthetics, Jag considered. Though the custom is to obtain prosthetics identical to your own original limbs, down to every mole and fingerprint whirl, that's not because of some unbreakable law of cybernetics. She could have gotten replacements without identifying features. Leia shook her head, clearly unhappy. So there's nothing to prove Alima was ever there. Han snorted. Nothing but a damaged and repaired hyperdrive. Which still isn't proof. Zek gave Leia an apologetic shrug. We really don't have any forensic means to distinguish between the cuts of different lightsabers. But why do you need proof? We believe you. Because I'm not sure I believe myself at this point. I couldn't even feel her in the Force. Only Lumpy. I mean, Waru. Leia looked around guiltily, caught in the act of using a childhood nickname abandoned by its owner. Fortunately, Waru was not in the hangar. I don't even know how she escaped. I have an idea. Jaina frowned, thoughtful. But it's pretty weird. Let's go with weird. Much better than nothing. Han paused to refill his tumbler, then waved the bottle around. A want one gesture. Jag nodded. I'll have one. Zek looked at him, startled. Colonel Clean Living accepts a brandy when he might have to fly later in the day? Who is it who says I need to learn to unclench before I lock permanently into a full-body grimace? Seems to me it was a tall Jedi with too much hair. Jag accepted a tumbler from Han and gave the older man a nod of thanks before sipping. Jaina gave Zek and Jag an admonishing look. Back to the subject. Instead of this attack of Alima's being some new tactic, a new piece of the puzzle, maybe it's actually an old one with a new coat of paint. Leia leaned back in her chair, which gave off a metallic creak. Let's hear it, sweetie. Remember when Jason and Ben went to Brisha Sio's asteroid? Ben had a fight with an evil Mara phantom. Han and Leia exchanged a glance. Han shrugged. You're saying we just fought a phantom. A phantom wouldn't leave fingerprints, Dad. A phantom could vanish instantly from a sealed freighter. Han shook his head. But Brisha Sio is dead. Her mother, Lumia, is dead. Right, Dad. But we're getting reports that Alima is now piloting a craft that resembles an ancient Sith meditation sphere. Han stared accusingly at his daughter, then at the liquor bottle. Sacred brandy, you failed me. My daughter is talking, and I don't understand her anymore. Jag smiled. Like her father, she's prone to skipping steps when describing her reasoning. He gestured to quell any protest from Jaina. She means... The only Sith we're aware of in all this mess is Lumia, and we know Alima has been associating with her. Alima probably inherited the Sith ship from Lumia. What else did she inherit? Perhaps some sort of weird Sith force technique? He swirled his tumbler and took another sip. Plus, I'm not convinced there even was a Brisha Sio. It was Zek's turn to raise an eyebrow. What do you mean? Jaina's voice was soft but insistent. Stay on target, Jag. I'm on target. I'll discuss Brisha's Ciel later, Leia considered. So why was I seeing Alima but feeling Waru? Her daughter shrugged. I don't know, but I suspect that your instinct not to cut her down was a very good one. She's going to use this technique again, and she'll get better with practice. Jag set his empty tumbler on the table, shaking his head at Han's silent offer of a refill. 
so our need to find her is more pressing than ever. Especially in light of the fact that she's the number one suspect in the murder of Mara Jade Skywalker. We don't want the Grand Master to devote more and more resources to hunting her down. Not with the Civil War becoming bloodier, more complicated. The Jedi are needed elsewhere. Han nodded. So you'll need Colonel Solo's shuttle, the one he used on the trip to that asteroid. Jag looked dubious. Brisha Sio, or Lumia, would never have let the shuttle leave with a correct plot of the asteroid's location. Han grinned. Just because you're young doesn't mean you have to be stupid, Jag. Sure, she'd have fixed the coordinates in the shuttle's memory. But go deeper into the shuttle's records. Amount of fuel burned to the milliliter per burn. Duration in hyperspace for each jump. Amount of time after leaving hyperspace until the shuttle hypercom receives traffic to the millisecond compared with when that traffic was originally dispatched. Jag considered and whistled again. We'd need some high-end computing and decryption power to process that kind of data. We can get it, Sonny. Talon Card or Booster Tarek will give it to us, if no one else. But first, we'll have to get aboard. Han tried to prevent himself from grimacing, but couldn't. Not quite. Aboard the Anakin Solo. Get a crack at the Colonel's shuttle. Planning session? Jag nodded. A couple of hours. You can come around and get that computer time for us. We all need some downtime for our brains. Zek and Jaina wanted to get in some lightsaber training for when we do run Alima down. Two hours. Han rose, bent to kiss his wife, and marched toward the Falcon, feeling slightly better than he had when the talk had started. Better because things now made a little more sense. Better because he now had a direction. Then, vision still faulty, he stumbled over the bottom of the boarding ramp and was reminded that not everything was back to normal yet. Jaina and Zack left moments later. Leia debated going with them, getting in some additional training, but decided she'd had enough lightsaber work for one day. Jag stared a moment at Han's chair, then sat in it. He glanced at Leia, his posture typically rigid. Don't tell anybody I'm doing this. Doing what? Slowly, methodically, he leaned back in a typically Han Solo-esque slouch. Once his back was flush against the angled back of the aged chair, he put his elbow up on the table, propped his head against his hand. Leia laughed at him. How does it feel? So wrong I can barely describe it. How has your husband managed not to sustain spinal damage all these years? Stubbornness. Jaina's certainly inherited it. Stubbornness, I mean. Not bad posture. She got her posture from my side of the family. Leia sobered. What did you mean about not being convinced Brisha Sio actually existed? Jag took a deep breath before answering. I can't say I have all the skills of a security investigator like Corin Horn, but I'm suspicious of anyone who seems to have only one purpose in life and then immediately dies. He looked off into the distance, past the Falcon, past the walls of the hangar, past the smoke clouds and the burning horizons of Kashyyyk. Nobody had ever heard of her before she showed up on Lord. We've been able to trace a few of her movements and have a single garbled message that suggests she was Lumia's daughter. She died, according to Jason, who has never turned in a detailed report of what went on at the asteroid, and is no longer available for debriefing, 
and the only consequence of her death seems to be that it provided motivation for Lumia to be on Coruscant, breaking into Galactic Alliance guard security and shadowing Ben, who may or may not have killed Brisha Sio. He certainly doesn't remember doing so. That's the sum total of her existence. He held out a cupped hand as though to catch a falling raindrop. There's nothing there. People tend to leave more traces, more memories. It seems more likely that she was a fiction, an agent of, or an alternate identity of Lumia herself. Leia studied him. Focused on some distant place, Jag seemed unaware of her presence, and in his eyes Leia saw a bleakness, an emptiness she had not previously noticed. Jag, you're leaving memories. Startled, he looked at her. What? You were comparing yourself to her, weren't you? To Brisha Sio. You have one purpose left to you, and when that's done, you wonder if you're just going to vanish, leaving no trace behind. Jag's expression darkened. He sat upright, his posture once again rigidly military. Jedi mind tricks. I wasn't reading your mind, Jag. Just your face. Jag rose. His voice became cordial but impersonal. I need to see about commissioning the building of some specialized gear. He spun on his heel and strode from the hangar, boot heels clicking. Chapter 4 Sanctuary Moon of Endor Jedi Outpost The flat top of the outpost had once been a landing pad for shuttles and TIE fighters, and now, some forty standard years later, relics of that era still littered the pad. A discarded wheel from a shuttle's landing gear, a rusty rolling cart that had once held tools, a scattering of corroded nuts and bolts that neither wind nor time had managed to scour from the surface. They met there, Jedi Masters in exile. Luke Skywalker, Kyle Katarn, the Moan Cal healer Silgal, Kip Duran, Corin Horn, the fierce reptilian Saba Sebatine, and Octa Ramus of Chandrilla. Octa, trained by Cam and Tion Solusar, both still recovering from their near fatal wounds at the hands of Jason Solo's soldiers, was more subdued than the rest. Her stillness in the force, clearly a consequence of rigid self-control rather than inner peace. Kip caught Luke's attention. I have something to bounce off you. With a flick of his wrist and an exertion through the force, he sent the ancient wheels soaring through the air toward Luke. Luke somersaulted to the right, and the wheel flew harmlessly over him. He came to his feet, igniting his lightsaber as the wheel dropped to the landing pad surface and rolled nearly to the far edge of the roof before toppling and lying still. Funny. He advanced toward Kip in mock menace. Is this every master for himself? Kip shrugged and ignited his own lightsaber. Might as well. Luke heard snap hisses, as the other masters lit their weapons. This friendly exercise would be horribly dangerous to anyone but a Jedi Master, but all of those present were so in tune with the Force and one another that the odds of a mishap were, as usual, almost nil. Luke charged Kip, but then, well outside lightsaber strike range, skidded to an abrupt halt, Kip's face had just enough time to register suspicion before Luke exerted himself through the force, reaching upward to tree limbs that had grown out over the outpost. He yanked downward. A broad branch slapped down atop Kip, 
bearing him to the landing pad surface and sending leaves swirling out all over the roof. Kip laughed and rolled free, coming up to his feet. No fair. Tactical superiority is never fair. I mean getting leaves and bugs in my hair. Luke felt the approach of Silgal from behind. He leapt up and backward, inverting as he flew, and blocked the Moon Cow Master's strike with his blade in passing. He landed behind her. A few meters away, Saba Sebatine and Corin Horn dueled, each adopting a traditional, formalized lightsaber posture. Saba using a lightsaber in each hand, Corin with his own weapon adjusted to its second setting, its blade now three meters in length and a brilliant purple instead of its usual silver. Octoramus, who had supplied Saba with her second weapon, was content to stand off to one side, using the force to hurl stones plucked from the ground far below through the tumult of practicing masters. Kyle Katarn stood near her, watching all the others, practicing ritualized sword forms and waiting for an opponent to come open. Kip advanced against Luke again, striking at Luke's ankles, while Silgal engaged the Grandmaster's blade. Luke danced over the low strike and put a foot into Silgal's torso, more of a push than a kick, before landing again. The moon cow staggered back a few steps, offering a nod of appreciation. Kip threw a succession of fast blows at Luke's shoulders, occupying him while Silgal recovered. Actually, it's a plan for a mission against Jason. A capture or neutralize, he said, his lightsaber flashing at Luke. Neutralize. Luke frowned. He circled Kip, trying to put him in the middle of their three-way exchange. But Silgal paced him so that Luke remained in the center. Meaning kill. Kip nodded, not repentant. This isn't a mission of assassination, Luke. But if the capture isn't clean, if the choice is to run away and leave him in charge of the Alliance, or finish him then and there... Yeah. Luke felt Silgal's approach behind him. He bent over backward, his lightsaber hand coming down on the landing pad surface to hold his upper body clear of it, and Silgal's lightsaber passed through where his waist would have been. Luke instantly straightened, catching her hilt with his free hand, and stepped away, her lightsaber now in his grip. He twirled one blade at each master. Go on. With an exasperated sigh, Silgal stepped back and exerted herself toward Kyle. The man's lightsaber leapt free from his grip and flew to Silgal's. Kyle offered no resistance. Silgal caught it out of the air, called, Thank you, and dashed toward Corin. Kip looked dubiously at Luke's twin weapons and fell into a defensive posture. The team will consist of one or two masters, three or four Jedi knights, and a native guide. They'll approach the Senate building through the Undercity. As Luke neared and began throwing probing attacks in quick succession, Kip deflected them close to his body with equal speed and minimal movement. When Jason enters or leaves the building, they spring the trap. Coma gas and shock nets as the first wave, the Jedi making their direct assault immediately afterward. He stopped to stare intently at Luke. Luke felt the attack the force propelling numerous small objects at him. He jumped back and brought up both lightsabers as a shower of old nuts and bolts came at him with missile speed. It was like defending himself against Yuzhan Vong thudbugs for the first time in years. But the old skill was undiminished. He calculated which objects had a chance of hitting him and incinerated only them with his blades, letting the others fly harmlessly past. The trouble was, the ones that flew past soon curved around for another attack. 
Meanwhile, Kip continued, We have a shuttle or other enclosed vehicle land for a quick extraction. But the trick is, it's an empty droid vehicle. Our group, with Jason, their captive, actually re-enters the Undercity through a groundside maintenance access hatch modified to serve as an exit. While the shuttle makes its escape run and draws off pursuit, our group goes back the way it came to the true departure point. Who's the team leader? Kip shrugged. Not determined yet. Corin's and Kyle's voices rose simultaneously. Me! Luke, thoughtful, finished incinerating the last of the flying bolts. He switched off Silgal's lightsaber and tossed it over his shoulder. He heard it slap down into her big webbed hand. What about your native guide? Someone to get you through the Undercity, I'm guessing. Do you trust him? Kip nodded. Not as far as I can throw her. That was Corin, his voice punctuated by zaps as Saba advanced on him trying to bat his longer blade aside. Kip made a sour face. Horn, you can't throw anybody any distance. With the force, anyway. This calls your judgment into question. Her. Luke switched off his lightsaber. Maybe I should meet her. Kip deactivated his own weapon. She's one level down. I can have her come up if you want to meet her now. Sure. Luke looked around for something to serve him as a chair. An impromptu throne of the Jedi Grand Master. And decided against the landing gear wheel as being just slightly below his dignity and preferred altitude. He chose the old tool rack and sat upon it. Its corroding wheels groaned under the weight. One of them decayed past the point of functionality, slowly collapsed, tilting the rack slightly forward. Meanwhile, Kip spoke into a comlink. The other masters left off their exercise, extinguished their lightsabers, and gathered around. A section of roof slid aside, and a metal plate rose to occupy that space, lift style. On it stood a teenage girl in Jedi robes, she was red-headed, and she nervously twirled one lock of hair in her fingers. At Kip's gesture, she approached. Luke recognized her and frowned. I know you. See her, from the temple. She came to a stop in front of him and nodded. Yes, Grandmaster. Her voice was faint. Her face was so pale, Luke thought she might be on the verge of fainting. He tried to remember her record with the Jedi Order. She hadn't been with them long, an orphan since childhood, he recalled. She'd been sponsored to the Order by... by Jason. Ah. There would seem to be some question as to your reliability. Siha nodded, agitation making her motion fast, jerky. Some people don't trust me. Why? Because I'm a traitor to the Jedi Order. Corin Horn's eyebrows rose. He looked faintly impressed. Well, I'll give her points for honesty. Luke ignored him. Perhaps you'd better explain that. Siha glanced around, as if looking for sympathetic faces, but returned her attention to Luke. I was little when the Yuzhan Vong came to Coruscant. When the Vong forming happened, most of my family died. I don't remember them except my father. We lived in the Undercity, so deep and out of touch— that the Yuzhan Vong had been driven off-world for months before I even learned about it. My father was dead by then. 
stung by a Yuzhan Vong insect he didn't see in time. I stayed there, with the other refugees and crazies and rejects, because they were the only people I knew. But I met Jason. He'd come down from time to time. Sometimes his visits were years apart. To visit his friend, the World Brain. My home was close to the World Brain's lair. I thought it was a horrible, evil thing. But Jason told me how it was just acting according to its nature. That what it looked like had nothing to do with what it was inside. Jason figured out I was Force-sensitive and arranged for me to become an apprentice to the Order, even though I was old for an apprentice. I know what it's like to be old for an apprentice. Luke's voice was gentle, but now he let an edge creep into it. So how did you betray the Order? I did things for Jason, kept him updated on goings-on in the temple. After he became the head of the guard, he asked me to take things into and out of the temple for him, like spare data pads and replacement electronic components. She took a deep breath before continuing. When your son disappeared, I was the one who helped him get out of the temple without being seen. Luke stared at her for a long moment. At Jason's order? Yes. Luke looked away from her as his emotions threatened to spin out of control. Ben's account of his solo mission had never included a confirmation that Jason had sent him. Ben had never volunteered details of where he had gone or what he had done. Luke had known intellectually that only Jason could have dispatched the boy. But now, at last, Luke had proof, a corroborating witness, and the confirmation hit him harder than he would have expected. This girl had helped effect the plan, had endangered Ben, all out of a misguided loyalty to a very bad man. Luke stared at her again. He tried to remain impassive, but she apparently saw something in his expression and took an involuntary half-step backward. Luke didn't bother trying to keep anger from his voice. How were you found out? She wasn't. She came forward. Silgal put a comforting hand on Sihas' shoulder. When we received word about the massacre on Ossus, Siha blinked and tears came. I don't know how he could do that. Send in a crazy man to bargain with the younglings' lives, to torture Cam Solusar and Tion, and kill all those others. Her tears flowed freely now, but she ignored them. I betrayed the order, but not like that. I'm not going to do that. You're no Jedi. Corin's voice was harsh. Your emotions are all over the map. Even an apprentice knows that. So we can't trust you as a Jedi. We can't trust you to be a calm, collected operative. And now you've left the most dangerous man in the galaxy disappointed in you. He gestured at Luke. Plus, you volunteered to go on a mission to capture the second most dangerous man, when all you had to do to retain everyone's trust was keep your mouth shut. Siha glared at him. Trust isn't worth anything when it's built on lies. Maybe I'm the stupidest girl you've ever met, but even I can figure that out. No one answered her immediately. Even Corin's expression was more evaluative than angry, and Luke knew, both from experience and from what he felt through the Force, that Corin had been goading the girl professionally, his own display of emotion simulated. Finally, Silgal broke the silence. 
in fairness. After the Order broke ranks with Jason and the Alliance at Kuat, when the Guard moved against the Temple to seize it, Siha helped destroy the computers. She carried out a complete set of records and led two Jedi Knights to safety through the Undercity. Luke cleared his throat to catch Siha's attention. You can stay in the Order without going on this mission. A brief, uncertain smile flashed across Siha's lips. I can. You can. You should. Jason is extraordinarily dangerous. If he sees you, he might devote only a single negligent attack to you. Such an attack would distract a Jedi Master, hurt a Jedi Knight, and kill you. She swallowed. Does anyone in the Order... Know the Undercity approaches to Jason's offices? Zek, perhaps. She shook her head. He doesn't know it since the Vong forming. Since the rebuilding after the war. I'd better stay with the mission. And keep your head down. And keep my head down. Luke took a long breath, then looked around. Will you all excuse me? Kip, please escort Siha downstairs, then return to me in a few minutes. They all bowed, and grave-faced withdrew, descending via the lift plate by which Siha had arrived. Alone, Luke stood away from the ill-balanced tool rack, closing his eyes, immersing himself in the force, looking for guidance. His heart should have been the only guide he needed, with the Force offering the occasional nudge when things were unclear. But his heart had been burned beyond recognition when Mara had died, and what was left was in pieces, each piece suggesting a different course of action. Throw everything into the effort against Jason. Hunt down Alima Rar and make her pay for killing Mara. The rot is too deep. The Jedi Order should withdraw and let the warring states fight their way to a finish. Only then can rebuilding begin. This kill is mine. This kill is mine. And the Force was silent. It seemed like forever since it had shown him any guidance about the bigger picture. All it offered him these days was guidance for immediate problems, the here and now. It had been that way since... For how long? Since Mara's death, at least. It could have begun before then. Perhaps he could no longer read the Force. Perhaps it chose not to speak to him any more. And if that was true, he could not remain the Grand Master of the Order. He would lead the Jedi into ruin. Grandmaster? Luke opened his eyes. Kip stood before him. Luke had neither heard nor felt him coming. Luke forced his thoughts back to the present. You've been putting together the plan for this mission? Yes. Why is there some doubt as to who is going to lead it? Kip hesitated a moment. Masters Horn and Katarn have volunteered... I am also willing to lead it, but I haven't assigned a mission leader yet, because I think you should lead it. Absolutely not. Please hear me out. There's worry in the Order. It comes from not knowing where we're going. The Jedi need you to show them. They need you to lead. A mission like this shows them your goals. Your heart. If I lead this mission, I will strike at Jason with hatred. One of us will die, and Ben will follow our mutual example and be lost to the dark side. Luke did not need the Force to show him the future to know that this was true. 
he thought about it a long moment. Here's my decision. Master Katarn will lead this mission. Kip's face fell. Yes, Grandmaster. I leave it to the two of you to finalize details. The conference done, Luke turned back to face the sunlit Endor forest and the momentary peace it offered him. Chapter 5 Hapes, Galactic Alliance Shuttle Approaching the Palace of the Queen Mother The engineering officer aboard the Galactic Alliance Shuttle had a five-day growth of whiskers, a patch over his right eye with the edges of a blaster scar peeking from beneath at forehead and cheek, and a dress uniform whose tunic was pulled out from the waistband. Anyone who had served a few years in any armed force would recognize the man, not by his name, not by his individual identity, but by what he was. Clearly he was a lifelong military man, one who had risen to the highest rank non-commissioned personnel could attain. Indispensable in his role, he could flout regulations and authority with impunity. He was too valuable a resource to court-martial for anything less than a capital offense. New officers appointed over him would try in vain to make him shave, wear his uniform according to regulations, accept a prosthetic eye to replace the organic one he had obviously lost in a battle, and treat his officers with the respect their commissions warranted. He would ignore them for a year or two, and then they'd move on to be replaced by other officers with equally futile agendas. Military personnel would recognize this man, but they would be wrong. Under the synth-skin appliances on his cheeks, under the pasted-on whiskers and cosmetic eye patch, was Darth Kytus. He sat quietly in the co-pilot seat of the cockpit, monitoring vehicle system diagnostics, assisting the pilot with various checklists, and responding in monosyllables to attempts at conversation. He did perk up, though not visibly to the pilot, when the shuttle in its final descent into Hapen airspace came within sight of the cliffside approach to the palace of the Queen Mother. The entire cliff, towering as high as an office building, had been carved in the likeness of some long-dead Hapen noblewoman, down to the two perfect features and intricately detailed jewelry. His visible eye was alert, taking in every detail, as the shuttle entered the visitor's hangar of the palace, incongruously through the mouth of the giant carving. Following space traffic controller directions, the pilot immediately turned to starboard, sending the shuttle along a series of base bases paralleling the giant queen's left cheek. Kytus calculated numbers of Hapen shuttles, crescent moon-shaped Mytil fighters, air speeders, speeder bikes. He noted with satisfaction the continued presence of a Stealth X starfighter, the one flown here by Tahiri. It was still awaiting transport back to the Jedi or the Galactic Alliance, doubtless still waiting for Hapes' own allegiance to be resolved before it could be moved. The Stealth X, with its odd, mottled fuselage covering, looking like a patch of starfield with illusory depth like a hologram, stood out, starkly dissimilar to the elegant and stylish Hapen vehicles. Kytus's shuttle, on repulsor lifts, cruised past many civilian workers and military personnel, the majority of them women. Then, directed by flickering landing lights, the shuttle maneuvered into a bay and sat down. The pilot, a white-furred Bothan male, turned to face Kytus. Why don't you inform our passengers? They may— Then he stopped, scrutinizing Kytus's solemn, impassive expression and slovenly dress. His snout twitched. Never mind. I'll do that. He rose and squeezed past Kytus into the main cabin. Kytus half-listened through the partially shut cockpit door as the pilot addressed the diplomat and aides who constituted all the passengers the pilot knew about. 
are cleared to leave the shuttle, but they do not confirm a meeting with the Queen Mother. Be in for quite a wait. Most of Kytus's concentration was elsewhere, as he searched in the force for the distinctive trace of his child. This was risky. Opening himself up to the force tended to make him easier to detect by Jedi. If Tenel Ka, the only other Jedi-trained individual he knew to be in the region, detected him, things would go badly. Almost immediately he found Alana, a bright, joyous flare in the force, not far away as the hawkbat flew. But between the two of them were countless warriors and security measures. In addition, just finding her through the force wasn't enough. He had to see her. He opened himself still further, hoping for a vision of his daughter. He felt her presence grow stronger within his senses. And then he could see, as if through a long tube, her eyes and nose. He did not pour his strength of will into what he was doing. That sithly impulse would not be helpful with this delicate task. He simply waited, became more still, focused on the image. His point of view drew back and away, and there Alana was, all of her, seated on a chair in front of a broad table low enough for a child her size. Directly before her was a set of controls, a horizontal monitor screen divided into several subscreens, one showing a wireframe image of something like a crude replica of a bantha, one subdivided into dozens of colors and textures. In the center of the table was a set of articulated tubes and spindly droid arms. The tubes exuded resins or blue hardening agents upon those resins, while the arms moved and reshaped them. It took Kaidas a moment to realize that the controls allowed Alana to model a toy while the apparatus simultaneously fabricated it, instantly making it real. I will buy her one, he thought, then pushed the notion away for the time being. He needed something else from this vision. Alana's hair, her clothes, her dark red hair was at the moment a wave of ringlets that swayed as she moved, and she wore a knee-length blue play dress and white shoes that showed no signs of scuffing. Kaidus breathed a sigh of relief. He had seen her wear that dress before, and it was one of the seven styles he'd had replicated for this mission. He relaxed, letting the vision slip away, but maintaining his awareness of Alana's location. He was almost certain Alana was not with her mother. That was good. He didn't want to confront Tenel Ka. If he did, he would probably have to kill her. That would pain him. And it would be even worse if Alana witnessed her mother's death. Kaidus heard the main cabin's exterior hatch open, heard the passengers descend the boarding ramp, heard the hatch close again. Through the forward viewport, he watched as the diplomatic party moved away from the shuttle. It was greeted and scanned by a half-squadron of Hapen security officers. As the knot of them then moved toward waiting turbolifts, he could feel no one aboard. No one but himself, the pilot, and one other. Finally the pilot came forward again. I hope you're a better card player than you are a talker. He resumed his seat in the pilot's chair. We could be here for days or weeks. Kaidus nodded. He reached into a tunic pocket as if to withdraw a pack of cards. Instead, he took out a small, expensive holdout blaster. As the Bothan's eyes began to widen, Kaidus shot him in the chest. The blaster was set to stun. The pilot's eyes rolled up in his head, and he collapsed. Kaidus stood and stepped away from the seats. He pushed the pilot over so that the Bothan slumped between the seats, no longer visible from the outside by passers-by at floor level. 
Though the blaster was highly rated for effectiveness, Kaidus put another couple of stun bolts into the pilot's back to be sure he'd remain unconscious for hours. Then he pocketed the weapon again. Yes, blasters were clumsy and random, to quote an oft-repeated saying Luke Skywalker had picked up from someone in ancient times, but they could be useful. For someone trying to avoid alerting a Jedi-trained opponent, stun bolts were far better than lethal attacks, lightsabers, or anything that manifested strongly in the Force. He went aft into the cargo area and spent a few moments unloading baggage cases from atop a large polymer crate. He punched a number into the crate's security keypad. The light beside it changed from red to green, and he lifted the lid. Inside, a solemn-faced little red-headed girl looked up at him. Her voice was high and piping, but unafraid. Your beard is nasty. Isn't it? He stooped to lift her out of the case. She seemed in good spirits, despite the hours she'd had to remain lying down. But the ready supply of snacks and availability of a game-laden data pad had doubtless helped. Were you afraid, Tika? No. I really have to go to the refresher. Really, really. Kytus gestured forward to the narrow door just on his side of the entry to the main compartment. Go ahead. And when you're done, we're going to put you in a new dress and do your hair. Then have some fun. Good. I want to play. She dashed to the refresher. You will. Elsewhere in the palace... Levels above and many meters away from the visitor's hangar, Queen Mother Tenel Ka stared into a mirror, seeing the worry in the gray eyes of her reflection. A delicate chime sounded. Tenel Ka said, Enter, freeing the security measures on the door. It slid to one side, admitting her father, Prince Isolder. A mature man, once counted among the most handsome in the galaxy, he had grayed with an inevitable grace and dignity that made him a target of envious anger by anyone who had not aged so well. Had he been a common man, he could have earned a lavish income promoting exercise regimens and health supplements. But the loose-fitting, flare-sleeved blue tunic he wore cost more than a year's such income. He bent over Tenel Ka to kiss the top of her head. You seemed to be anxious for privacy. As a good parent, of course I can't accede to your wishes. She smiled despite her mood. You're still a pirate at heart. Disobedient, conceited, cocksure. A lovely compliment. Thank you. He moved to settle on a scarlet divan. What has you so upset? She shrugged. I think it's this meeting with the G.A. representatives. I can't seem to settle on the right amount of time to keep them waiting. It's a harder choice than usual. It's not just about queenly dignity or meeting the expectations of my court about royal prerogatives— in the mirror she saw her father nod. You want to see them when they are at their most desperate, when they are most likely to agree to your demands to have Colonel Solo removed from power. Yes. And you're weighing that against the lives being lost every day in the war. Yes. Isolder considered. Tenel Ka watched him. Normally, she did not need or seek political advice. But her father offered a rare exception. He was not scheming to put himself or some other favorite on the throne. He had decades of political experience, not only within the Hapes Consortium, but also outside in the galaxy at large. Political and, as she had reminded him, piratical, 
His decision-making was grounded as much in the realm of bloody deck plates as in the rarefied air of Hapen noble maneuvering. Finally, he met her gaze again. You've already made your demand of them. At Kuat. I did. Send these diplomats home. Today. Seeing them would only give them the opportunity to argue with you. Seeing them later gives them the hope that they can argue with you then. Ejecting them from Hapen space tells them that there will be no negotiation. That, more than anything, will increase their sense of desperation. She cocked her head, considering. You're right. Another series of chiming musical notes filled the air. This was not a door signal, but a communication indicating that the security alert level within the palace had just eased up another notch. This was not an unusual event. Alert levels rose and fell with the frequency and usually meaninglessness of corporate stock values on Coruscant. Still, Tenel Ka had known the reason for the last one. An hour ago, the arrival of the GA diplomatic shuttle, with the usual security disturbances such an intrusion demanded. This one did not relate to any change of condition she knew of. She pressed a button on the edge of her vanity table. Lady Aros? A moment later her chamberlain entered through the same doorway a soldier had used. A woman of that broad span of years, from their mid-fifties to mid-seventies, when Hapens devoted more and more effort to disguising their ages, and did so with considerable success, she had green eyes, a long, aristocratic nose, and features made for twisting into expressions of disapproval, though she directed only a look of concern toward Tenel Ka. Her gown, layers of iridescent synth silk in gold and brown tones, was appropriate to a Hapen noblewoman, and scarves in the same material and colors bound up and concealed her hair. Queen Mother! Why the last alert change? I will find out, Queen Mother. Aros bowed and withdrew. Isolder smiled, amused. You are nervous today. Yes, I am. So I have to hope something is actually going wrong. I don't want to pick up the reputation of being... unwell. She repressed a wince. Her mother, Tenennial Joe, had been unwell. Sick in her mind, dissociated from reality for a time before her death. Tenennial Joe had not been able to stand up to the emotional shock of feeling through the Force the deaths of thousands of people slain by use of Centerpoint Station's main gun during the Yuzhan Vong War. Tenel Ka could not afford for anyone to think her similarly weak. It would be an invitation to another attack, another assassination attempt. Aros re-entered the chamber. It was an automated elevation of the alert status, Queen Mother. When enough random events occur that the security computers register them, the programs do what is known, I believe, as raising flags, simply indicating— Tenel Ka gestured to cut off her explanation. What random events? Small static interruptions in security holocam feeds. But none has lasted more than a few seconds. Security says that during intrusions, holocam interruptions last for much longer periods— a minimum of half a minute, or a minute. They've checked to be sure that the holocam views, once they resume, are current images, not recordings. Yes, Queen Mother. Aros's voice was endlessly, unnecessarily patient. Tenel Ka frowned, not convinced, and opened herself to the Force. First, she sought out Alana, and found her, nearby calm, sleeping. Then she broadened her perceptions, looking for anything amiss. She felt it almost immediately. 
a short, distinct pulse in the force. Her eyes snapped open. There is a force user in the palace. She punched additional buttons on the keypad of her vanity, and her own image in the mirror suddenly faded to be replaced by an overhead view of a child's playroom. She breathed a sigh of relief. Alana was there, undisturbed, sitting at her modeling table, head down as she worked intently at the controls. Her hair spilled around her face, obscuring it. The bantha that had been her newest creation now had four giant bulbous feet. Then Tenel Ka frowned. A moment earlier, an instant earlier, Alana had been asleep. She keyed in another location, and the view changed to that of the door outside her daughter's playchamber. It was closed, sealed, innocuous, except for the fact that the two guards who should have been on duty there were missing. Coldness, hard as an ancient ice comet, froze her stomach. Tenel Ka stood fast enough to hurl her chair backward. It thumped down on the carpeted floor. She spun on Aros. Alert security! Intruders in the palace! They're making an attempt on Alana! From beneath her robes, suited to an afternoon's lounging beside an artificial waterfall, she pulled her lightsaber and dashed past Aros, her father behind her. Security chimes were sounding as the two of them reached the main corridor accessing the secondary royal quarters. Rightward, it led toward Alana's playroom. Leftward, it led to security stations that in turn gave way to less secure areas. Security agents dashed in either direction as noblewomen, pursing their lips in disapproval of the confusion, stayed out of their way. Tenel Ka paused and extended her senses into the force once more. It took only seconds, seconds that dragged on like hours, and then she felt her daughter again to the left, and down. She spun in that direction and ran, allowing the force to lend her speed, leaving her father far behind. Chapter 6 It was as though an invisible thrill-killer had been on a spree within her palace. Tenel Ka ran past a group of courtiers huddled around an open door. Beyond was a uniformed guardswoman, her throat slit, blue eyes open and fixed, blood pooling beside her. A few meters past, in a nook frequented by lovers and conspirators, a musician held the curtain aside to reveal a male courtier lying on the floor, his neck at an unnatural angle. Tenel Ka felt a ripple in the force at the next nook beyond. She tossed the curtain aside. No scene of murder met her eyes, but there was a hole in the floor, roughly circular, a meter across, its edges smoking. A security officer running in her wake panted, Queen Mother, we must precede you! Ignoring her, Tenel Ka dropped through the hole. She fell ten meters. Drawing on the force to soften the impact, she landed on the hard, uncarpeted flooring of a service corridor, a gray-walled, cheerless passageway she had never seen before. The plug that had been cut out of the ceiling above was beside her. Up and down the corridor, kitchen workers and food servers, the subdued colors they wore indicating their lowly status, stood as if paralyzed by shock. There was no sign of the assassin's passage, but a serving boy of perhaps sixteen years, his eyes more alert than most of those around him, jerked a thumb back over his shoulder then shielded his eyes from the sight of the Queen Mother racing past him. Ahead, around a bend in the corridor, there were more workers circling and staring at the body of a cook. A minute later Tenel Ka took another ten-meter drop, this time to the roof of a stopped turbolift. She stepped into the access hatch and fell two meters to the turbolift floor. The lift doors were open. Beyond was the visitor's hangar. Here, nothing as delicate as chimes indicated a security breach. Shrill alarms screeched. Security and maintenance personnel ran toward her, away from her, some rushing to their alarm situation duties, some just panicking. 
at least two vehicles were active. Not far away, a shuttle painted in white, sporting the Galactic Alliance crest on its sides, had its repulsor lifts going. It was moving, but only to edge ever closer to the stone wall alongside its bay. A security team was in place behind stone and duracrete columns all around the shuttle. Some were aiming at the vehicle with blaster rifles, while the leader, speaking into a field comlink strapped to her wrist, was doubtless broadcasting instructions to the pilot. But Tenel Ka could not see a pilot through the shuttle's forward viewports. She reached out toward the vehicle with the force and detected something aboard, but that presence felt inert, nearly lifeless. A diversion. She broadened her perceptions again, looking with increasing desperation for Alana. There, forty meters past the tableau with the shuttle, another vehicle had its engines running. It, too, was surrounded by a security team holding positions behind columns. Tenel Ka raced past the shuttle, ignoring a salute from a startled-looking guardswoman, and got a good view of the other active vehicle. Tahiri's Stealth X. The coldness in her gut intensified. She did not need to peer into the visor of the pilot's helmet to know who had her daughter. It could only be Jason. She was halfway to the Stealth X when she realized that while its repulsor lifts were being used at full strength, filling the air with what sounded like an animal scream, the starfighter was not moving. Its shields were up, too, though no member of the security detail was firing. Tenel Ka heard one of the guard officers shout, barely audible over the repulsor lift howl, Hold your fire! He has the girl with him! Another two steps, and Tenel Ka could now just see the top of Alana's head. Her daughter was in Jason's lap, webbing holding her to her father. Her head was forward as though she were asleep or preparing for a crash landing. Tenel Ka felt a little flicker in the force. From behind her, not from Jason's direction. She stopped and spun, igniting her lightsaber. There was no attack coming from that direction, but the diplomatic shuttle was now flush against the hangar's stone wall, and Tenel Ka's sense of dread, of anticipated attack, grew. Get back! Her words could not possibly carry to the security officers surrounding the shuttle, but she poured her anxiety and intent into the force, broadcasting her command on an emotional level. Get behind cover! Suiting action to words, she leapt behind one of the natural stone columns lining the hangar bay and put her back to it. She turned her head to glance toward Jason. He looked straight at her, offering a tight little smile, then held up a comlink. He pressed the button on it. The universe went white and the column kicked against Tenel Ka's back. Tenel Ka heard her daughter calling for her, but the Hapen Queen stood in red mud up to her knees, with Alana nowhere in sight. Broken columns tilted at odd angles, and severed arms and legs the size of public transportation speeders protruded from the mud, as far as the horizon in every direction. Mommy? Tenel Ka opened her eyes and sat up, looking around wildly for her child. Her head hurt, and her ears rang like someone playing a timpani on a gong. She recognized her surroundings, one of the numberless waiting rooms up at the royal residence level. This one, decorated in subtle variations of purples and off-whites, was adjacent to Alana's playroom. She must have been dreaming. Tenel Ka sat on a morphing divan that had been adjusted to daybed dimensions. Isolde rose from where he'd been sitting on a chair opposite her. Lie down. You're hurt. His words were dim, hard to hear over the ringing in her ears. Instead, she stood, wobbling in sudden passing dizziness. Where's Alana? 
Jason Solo has her. The soldier's face was pale, as ashen as it had been the day his wife had died. The shuttle blast, a shaped charge, was sufficient to blow a hole in the hangar's exterior wall large enough for his starfighter. He made orbit in his X-wing and escaped. The coldness in Tenelka's gut spread to envelop her entire body. Her legs shook. Her father put his hands on her shoulders, steadying her. Please sit. We have battle cruisers and battle dragons strung along the routes between here and Coruscant. But it's likely that he will have picked an escape route we can't predict. She let a soldier guide her back down to the divan's surface. How long? Two hours ago. The diplomatic party has been detained and is being interrogated. Isolder's voice was grim. The shock they're expressing. I can only guess at this point, but I think it's genuine. It looks like they thought they were on an actual mission of negotiation, and that Solo used them only as a diversion. Has he communicated... Has he sent terms for her return? Isolder's expression became even more sour. He left a message, a data chip handed to me by the little girl who acted as Alana's double. I'll play it for you. He rose and moved to a table to activate the monitor upon it. Who is the girl? A Coruscanti orphan named Tika. Solo promised that if she would do this one thing for him, he'd take her to a world where there were thousands of beautiful women, one of whom would become her new mommy. Tenelka clapped her hand over her mouth. It was just one more horror, and the least of the ones she had endured in just a few waking minutes, but it somehow pointed more starkly to Jason's inhumanity than all the murders he had perpetrated to see Zalana. A soldier stepped away from the monitor. Jason Solo popped up on the display, somber, dressed in his Galactic Alliance Guard colonel's uniform. Greetings to the esteemed Queen Mother of the Hapes Consortium. His voice did not exactly drip with sarcasm, but the excessive formality he employed treating Tenel Ka as some distant ruler, ignoring all that they had been to each other, was just as hurtful. At Kuat, you put me into an untenable situation, being abandoned to my enemies, abandoned by one for whom I once had considerable affection and respect, was like being murdered. And surviving... So I'm going to repay the favor. You have a choice to make, like the one you tried to force upon me. You will put all Hapen military forces under my command, with ship's senior officers to be supplied by the Galactic Alliance, or your daughter will die. Jason leaned forward, so that his face more completely filled the monitor screen. His eyes were bright, inhuman in their intensity and focus. They even seemed lighter in color than usual. By doing what you did to me, you changed me into someone capable of doing exactly what I have promised. This threat is not a bluff, and if it takes place... It will be your doing. Something to keep in mind the next time you play the hapen cultural game of backstabbing and bloodletting. The screen went dark. Tenelka let out the breath she realized she'd been holding since Jason first appeared on screen. Isolder said nothing. Finally, she turned to him. She struggled to keep her voice even, 
but it wasn't easy. Her breath wanted to come in pained gasps. Prince Isolder, in your opinion, is he capable of carrying out his threat? I don't know him nearly as well as you, Queen Mother. But, yes. He glanced at the monitor. I've watched the recording a dozen times, and each time I see a man whose humanity has been utterly extracted from him. Tears came to Tenelka's eyes. He was right, you know. It's like being murdered and surviving. Chapter 7 Kashyyyk, Mytel Base, Hangar Housing the Millennium Falcon Waru set the oversized metal case down on the sabbat table. The Wookiee offered a mild growl of a question. Han looked down at the case. It looked like the sort wealthy travelers used to transport delicate, expensive clothing. Outfitted with foam inserts, a case like this was also ideal for transporting weapons, and this one was large enough to hold several blaster rifles with folding stocks or a couple of squadrons worth of blaster pistols. Han, opposite the Wookiee, shook his head. You got me, pal. You sure it's for me? Waru nodded. Leia looked closely at the case. I don't feel any sense of menace from it. Did you do a routine scan? Waru grunted an affirmative. Clean, huh? But no indication who sent it. Han gave the top seam locks another look. In the shadow cast by the case itself, the broad locking tabs glowed slightly. That's not too comforting. It's a scanner. Jag, leading Jaina and Zek, was walking in from deeper in the hangar, where their X-wings had their bays. Just back from a routine patrol, he had reported that the firebreak lines carved by Lilibanka with the help of the Solos and other pilots, including Lando Calrissian, were holding. They read thumbprints. Huh. Experimentally, Han placed his thumbs over the tabs, but did not touch them. He glanced at Leia. I assume you'll give me a push if this starts to blow up? She affected disinterest. Probably. Yeah. He placed his thumbs on the tabs. They beeped, shrill little noises, then gave way under the pressure of his thumbs. He pressed harder, and they clicked into place. Gingerly, Han lifted the case's lid. The case did indeed have foam inserts, but it did not hold firearms. In the bottom was the front piece of a breastplate, shaped in a stylized representation of a male human chest, well-muscled. In the top of the case were two metal gauntlets, nearly elbow-length, all three items were made of a dull metal, something like brushed silver or burnished iron. A piece of flimsy was tucked into the gap between one gauntlet and the foam insert that held it. Han pulled it free, unfolded it, and read aloud the words hand-printed on it. With deepest sympathy. Leia frowned. Sympathy for what? A weight settled on Han's chest. He tried to ignore it. These are crush gaunts, a Mandalorian weapon, illegal for generations, plus very hard to make anyway, on account of the Mandalorian veins of Beskar mostly ran out. That's what they're made of. Jag shook his head, not recognizing the term. Beskar? Mandalorian iron. Tough, tough metal. Legend says armor made from the stuff can take a lightsaber hit and survive. 
Mechanisms in the gauntlet hands allow them to crush whatever they grip. Necks, heads, blaster rifles. Just about anything. I saw a pair once years ago. Another smuggler showed them off before delivering them to Jabba the Hutt. Jaina looked puzzled. Is this that pair? No, sweetie. These are new. Unscarred. The answer did not clear up Jaina's confusion. So the armor is a Mandalorian breastplate? Han nodded. Yeah. The back plate is probably under it. He lifted the front plate, revealing a matching piece of armor, its surface contoured more like a human back, lying there. The front plate was not heavy. It felt more like aluminum than iron. Uh-huh. Jaina shook her head. I still don't get it. It's a present, Jaina. From Boba Fett. Han heard Leia's intake of breath. He sat heavily in his usual chair. Not wanting to worsen Leia's pain or his own, but unable just to ignore Jaina's continued curiosity, he held up the piece of flimsy. Get it? Sympathy for my loss of a son. Something he understands since he lost a daughter. A daughter tortured to death by my son. He's saying, so sad you lost your kid. Here's a little toy you can finish him off with. Jaina's face became impassive. Oh. Are you going to use it? No. So he's wasted a lot of money for nothing. Han nodded. A lot of money. Even if the Mandalorians are mining Beskar again, this is a lot of credits and effort for a snide joke. He looked at the case's contents again. Except it's only half a joke. He'd like to help whoever it is kills the killer of his daughter. He'd probably like to do something for whoever takes Colonel Solo out of the equation. He may even feel real sympathy. He reached over to slam the case lid down. His message is as complicated, as much of a mess, as Fett himself. Jaina, clearly uninterested, shrugged and turned away. Time for a Sanistine. She tugged at Zek's sleeve. Then more training. He followed, protesting, How about training first, then the Sanistine? That way we don't have a pointless Santa's team in the middle. Jag remained behind, eyeing the case. Han, at the risk of sounding insensitive... Han snorted. If you think it's insensitive, whatever it is will probably take the paint off a hut's refresher. Jag gave him a brief apologetic smile. You're really not going to use this gear? Han shook his head. Armor that stops a lightsaber? With a Lima Rar, our target... You think it would be useful to you? Not as useful as something you said the other day. But yes, very much so. Han frowned, puzzled. What did I say? Something about Alima's tactics. But Jag did not elaborate. All right, kid. Take it. It's yours. Leia broke in on Han's words, on one condition. Jag stopped in the act of picking up the case. Of course. Name it. Tell me what's wrong with my daughter. Jag hefted the case experimentally. It was apparently nowhere near as heavy as he had expected. She is entirely focused on our target, Ali Marar. I know that. But even facing a dangerous enemy shouldn't make her so cold, impassive, emotionless. Jag looked after the departing Jaina and Zek. They were walking toward a tree-shaded glade they often used as a sparring site. Well, it's the whole Sword of the Jedi thing. She thinks she's figured out what it is to be the Sword of the Jedi. 
Going after Ali Marar is just practice for her. She thinks she's going to have to face her brother, and that one of them's not going to come out of it alive. Han sighed. He reached up to take his wife's hand. Leia's fingers gripped his hard. Sure, kid. A lot of people are looking forward to a showdown with Colonel Solo. Jaina... Jag hesitated, struggling for the words. She thinks that any distraction now could be fatal to her then. That means enjoyment of any sort. Anything that would make her smile is the enemy. The thing is, she's really a lot like her brother, before his change. And I don't want her to cast off her humanity the way he has. He offered Leia a brief smile of apology for those words. I'm trying to find a way to tell her that if you sharpen a sword all the time, even when it's not dull, by the time you need it there's no metal left. It will break. But she's not listening. Leia's voice was low, concerned. Have you used those exact words? She doesn't learn from words, Jedi Solo. She only learns from success. And failure. Jag gave her a sympathetic look and walked out into the sunlight, metal case in hand. Chapter 8 Coruscant, Galactic Alliance Guard Building Alana opened her eyes. In front of her was the corner of the bed she was lying on, a plain bed, its mattress very soft and comfortable, but old-fashioned, not adjusting its shape to her as she moved. Beyond it was a bare brown wall, its simulated wood pattern hard to make out in the dim light of half-shadowed glow rods. She didn't know this place. She rolled over to see the whole room, and there he was, seated in a chair by the bed, tall and handsome, wearing his black uniform, his eyes so bright and intent they almost frightened her. But she shouldn't be frightened of him. He was her mother's friend. She held out her arms. Jason. His face twitched a little when she called his name, but he came to her and held her. Alana. You slept a long time. Where am I? Her voice was muffled against his shoulder. He drew back to look at her again, and now his eyes were normal. You're on Coruscant. Where's Mommy? She's back on Hapes. Alana fidgeted, and, reluctance on his face, Jason released her. Why is she there and not here? You don't remember? She shook her head. Bad people came to your palace. They wanted to hurt you and your mother. Like before? Jason nodded. They used coma gas, which puts people to sleep. Since you're little, it put you to sleep for a long time. I had just arrived there for a visit. Your mother thought you'd be safer if you came home with me. That way... The bad people won't know where you are. Oh. That made sense, but her mother had said that anyone Alana was going to be sent away with like that, even if there wasn't time for a goodbye, would know the special words. And Jason hadn't said the special words yet. Can I talk to Mommy on the holocom? Jason shook his head. Not yet. The bad people could trace the transmission. Do you know what that means? Alana nodded. Like following a trail of breadcrumbs. Exactly. That would lead them right here, which would undo all the good your mommy and I have done. So we'll just have to stay hidden for a while. But I'm arranging to have all sorts of things brought here for you to play with. Toys and gadgets and musical instruments. And friends? Not yet. Soon, 
I hope. I'll have a droid friend for you tomorrow. He gave her another hug. I've got to go, but I'll be watching through that holocam. He pointed straight up, but Alana could see nothing on the ceiling there. So you'll always be safe. Just call for me if you need anything. All right. She watched him leave, then lay down again. And she wondered how long it would be before Jason remembered the special words, and what she should do if he never said them. Coruscant, beneath the Galactic Alliance Government District. There were five of them, Jedi all ranging in experience from a teenage girl to a graying veteran who had first seen action as a stormtrooper serving Palpatine's empire. Valin Horn, son of Corrin, breathed a sigh of relief that he was not at the low end of the age ranking. In his late twenties, he was, by a statistical accident that seemed to plague him, often paired with much older Jedi. Here Master Kyle Katarn was indeed his senior, by some forty-odd years, but the Faline male, Fawn Mithric, and the Bothan female, Kolir Hulia, were both his junior by several months, and the human girl leading them, Siha, was youngest of all. Not that seniority mattered much on a mission like this. Valen was just pleased that he was getting old enough not to be at the bottom of every age sorting. All five Jedi wore matte black garments that covered them from neck to toes. The material, slick against abrasive surfaces like duracrete and metal drainage pipes, retained heat in cold surroundings like water, but radiated it in warmer environments. The Jedi carried, and sometimes as now, dragged or pushed packs containing their lightsabers, robes that could be folded into very compact bundles, other weapons, and climbing equipment, none of which was likely to help them at the moment, as they wriggled their way like worms along a damp, constricting waste fluids pipe. Siha had said that it hadn't served its intended purpose in all the time she had been alive, but cracks all over the ancient city infrastructure allowed water from other pipelines to leak in, some of it foul-smelling and Siha had told them that during a fierce rain, pipes like this could be flooded and washed clean. Don't worry, she'd said. If there's a flood, we'll have a few moments' warning. You just whip out your lightsabers and cut a hole in the pipe. Can you whip out your lightsaber, Colier? Valen made his whisper loud enough to carry to the ears of the Bothan, who crawled before him. All he could see of her were her black-clad feet and lower legs, barely discernible in the light from the glow rod tucked behind his ear. Her voice, a low growl, floated back to him. Quiet, you! Just asking. Polite conversation. You're not claustrophobic, are you? No! Because that would account for your irritability. So would hunger, and you're beginning to sound a lot like red meat. When we're done here, I'd be happy to treat you to dinner. Sons of famous fathers do have to try harder to compensate. Valen grinned. At least she could banter. He heard a familiar buzzing noise from ahead and stopped to listen. Yes, it was a lightsaber, but not being used in haste. Collier stopped, too. The buzz went on for nearly a minute, then ceased. Collier finally passed back the news. See her reached a new obstacle, a metal grate. She was using her lightsaber to cut through it. Her lightsaber which I suppose she dropped, and now she needs to borrow one. Very distantly, he heard Siha's voice. I heard that. Then Collier was crawling forward again, and Valen followed. 
Moments later he wriggled out through the newly opened, still warm end of the tube and dropped lightly to a duracrete floor two meters down. Here, too, there were no working glow rods, but at least he could stand upright. He stood aside to let Mithric drop beside him. Valen glanced around. The others had smudges of grease and filth on their faces. Collier's tan fur was matted and encrusted in places. Mithric's ponytail had a spherical, six-legged bug climbing through it. Valen assumed he himself looked equally unappetizing. Siha, the least filthy of them, glanced around to get her bearings. We're inside the second security zone, under the plaza approach to the Senate building. She pointed in the general direction the pipe end faced. That way is toward the Senate building. If we keep going, we run into the innermost ring of security, the thickest concentration of sensors. It's not that they're especially hard to get past individually, just that there are so many with overlapping coverages that it's practically impossible to disable them all or get through them undetected. It could be done, but even someone with much better skills than mine would take weeks to do it. Master Katarn nodded as if satisfied. Staging from here will be fine. Though it would be better if we had several lines of sight and firing positions. Sea had gestured forward and up, toward a dark vertical shaft accessed by durasteel rungs inset into the permacrete. That's the closest one. There will be a sensor at the access hatch, but we can disable it. I can take you laterally to three or four similar spots, each with a view of the front entrance. Katarn considered. I need to have the position closest to Colonel Solo's usual approach to the building. We'll spread out among all the accesses. See, huh? I want every one of us to be able to find our way back to this spot by touch. And this will be your station, too. Your job is to stay alive, stay here, and get us all out, regardless of whether the mission is a success or a catastrophic failure. Siha nodded, clearly intimidated by the responsibility placed on her. Chapter 9 Kaminor At times like this... Lieutenant Kareg Oldathon wondered who creaked more, himself or the aging K-Wing assault starfighter he flew. Both of them had been recalled from honorable retirement to active duty when the Civil War had begun, and both were in dire need of maintenance and rest. Not that they were likely to get any today. Rising through high planetary orbit to the engagement zone, where Alliance ships were once again arriving to assault planetary defense forces, he shook his head and offered up a near-silent curse. The Alliance units being brought to bear against them were not enough to crack Commodore's defenses, but were sufficient to keep them from being deployed to other theaters of war. They were enough to wear those forces down over time, and Oldathon was certain they were doing their job. One minute to contact, he said. Weapons check. Lasers in the green. That was the voice of Lieutenant Dannon, his bombardier gunner for this mission. He occupied the starboard cockpit of the vehicle's dual cockpit arrangement. Bangers report operable. Bangers were, in Kaminori military parlance, concussion missiles and this K-Wing's hardpoint attachments were laden with them. Oldathon would have preferred boomers, or proton torpedoes. His starfighter's primary mission was to prey on capital ships, but at this point in the conflict they were in short supply. The next voice over the comm board was not Dannon's, but that of their flight controller, operating from a sensor station on the ground. Greyfeather Squadron, report! Oldathon frowned. Grey Feather One here. 
Divert to heading 180 immediately. We're picking up an intermittent blip that suggests a vessel approaching on the night side, but we can't get a fix on it. Coordinates should be on your sensor board now. Oldathon glanced at his sensor board and saw a broad green dot over Equatorial Commodore a few thousand kilometers to the west, which marked the start of their new search zone. Got it. Grave feathers on the move. Out. He took a moment to retransmit the coordinates to the other four K-wings in what was left of his squadron, then led them westward. In atmosphere, the trip would have taken hours, but a high ballistic trajectory like this outside of atmosphere would be done in a fraction of the time. Still, Oldathon was twitchy with impatience. The battle zone, where his comrades were fighting and dying, was behind him. This was like running away. Unless, of course, the phantom blip was indeed some sort of alliance attack not just another malfunction of Commodore's overtaxed planetary defense sensor system. When they reached the target zone, they found it empty of airborne traffic, except for one ground-based courier shuttle sprinting off into space, its crew hoping to get clear of the planet's gravity well and enter hyperspace before Alliance forces detected and intercepted it. Nothing else showed up on sensors. Oldathon shook his head. Annoyed. Another monkey lizard chase. All right. Two and three. Head spinward a hundred clicks. Four and five. Anti spinward. Begin spiral patterns outward. I'll stay here and do the same. Report all contacts instantly. He received four confirmations and saw the two wing pairs peel off to head toward their respective start zones. He felt no undue worry. The shovel-headed, thick-winged starfighters were not particularly fast or elegant, but he knew they could take care of themselves. They were more heavily armed than just about any comparable vehicles the enemy was likely to field. As he began his own spiral pattern, he tuned in to the general fleet frequency to listen to the battle's progress. Things weren't going badly. One enemy frigate had been destroyed— one enemy cruiser had sustained enough damage that it had withdrawn. Starfighter losses were about even between the two sides. But there were disturbing little signs in the comm transmissions. One rescue shuttle pilot reported, "'Have retrieved six friendly walkers!' That meant six pilots who were extravehicular from having ejected before the destruction of their starfighters. But what were the odds that randomly— the rescue pilot had run across only friendly pilots. Most rescue beacons were on common comm channels and unscrambled, with interplanetary rules of war dictating that forces of any side perform rescues. Had the shuttle pilot just ignored signals from enemy walkers? Had he fired upon enemy ejectees? Oldathon didn't know. What he did know was that he'd been hearing more and more of these communications in recent weeks. He knew that rumors of harsh treatment of enemy prisoners of war were increasing, both in G.A. camps and in Kaminori camps. He knew that overtaxed Kaminori personnel were increasingly channeling their anger and frustration into private activities, entertainments made specifically to cater to their changing tastes, such as underground blood sports or so rumor had it. This bothered Oldathon a lot. It was something his fellow pilots, sophisticated, educated men and women, compared with many serving in the armed forces, had not done even at the height of the frustrations and terrors of the Yuzhan Vong War. The military leaders officially didn't see any of this. Unofficially, they approved. Fewer pilots were cracking up. That meant more experience was staying in the cockpits. That was all that mattered. Dannon's voice interrupted his musings. I just saw a star disappear. Sure you did. Oldathon checked his sensor board again. He saw nothing but the five starfighters of his squadron. 
If the Alliance can make whole stars disappear, we need to surrender now. No, really. In the jeweled lizard. Second star from the end of the tail. Oldathon craned his neck to look upward, then brought the nose of the K-Wing up so it would be easier for him to look. Sure enough, the tail of the familiar constellation had only four stars in it now, not five. Then the missing star reappeared. Almost holding his breath, Uldathan sent the K-Wing into a spiraling climb toward that distant point in space, widening the pattern as he ascended. A moment later, the last star in the lizard's tail vanished, then reappeared a few seconds afterward. And there was still nothing on his sensors. Greyfeather Wanda Squadron! Gray Feather One to Starfighter Control. We have an anomaly here. Space word from my position, distance unknown, size unknown. Suspect it may be a cloaked capital vessel. Starship cloaking mechanisms were rare due to the tremendous power drains they cost their host vehicles, and, depending on the design, the usually fatal price of the vehicle controllers having no ability to detect anything outside their cloaking fields. But they did exist, and had been used within living memory. Greyfeather One acknowledged. Oldathon switched to squadron frequency. Two through five, maintain your current patterns, but scan visually along the line I'm about to transmit. He had Dannon plot a missile-firing solution toward the anomaly zone and transmit it to the others. It appeared on the sensor boards as a line from his current position to the farthest reaches of the Commodore system, toward the end of the jeweled lizard's tail. A few moments later, Greyfeather 4 reported in. I have it, sir. Give me a plot. Seconds passed, and then another red line appeared on the sensor board. Together with Oldathon's line, it formed two sides of a very long, narrow triangle. The third line, the triangle's base, had it been drawn, would have been much shorter than the other two, and would have spanned only a fraction of Commodore's diameter. Everybody keep at it. Update sightings on our sensor board. I'm heading up. Oldathon switched back to fleet frequency, then sent his K-Wing on a rapid ascent straight toward the target. Control, Blip is definitely an inbound ship. We're triangulating to get its speed of approach. Understood, Greyfeather One. We'll have support your way within minutes. Oldathon shook his head. Starfighter Control was not likely to divert vehicles already engaged in Commodore orbit meaning that what he'd get would be some reserve squadrons, likely as not some planetary defense TIE fighters so old that their solar array wings wobbled. As Oldathon climbed away from Commodore, the other Gray Feathers continued to supply him data. More lines appeared on his sensor board. They didn't form a clean image. The triangle was shortening. Dannon muttered to himself as he ran mathematical calculations— Best guess, it's now at about 20,000 clicks, and moving at about 40,000 clicks per hour. Oldathon grunted an acknowledgement. It should begin decelerating pretty soon. Under constant acceleration, Greyfeather One closed the distance to the target in short order. Oldathon decelerated and swung wide of the incoming vessel's approach path. Not being able to see it or precisely calculate its speed made him twitchy, nervous about collision. But now his target was easy to detect. Sensors still did not pick it up, nor could the naked eye, but there was a growing dark spot in space where the stars just blanked out. A big dark spot in space. Dannon, can you give me an estimated size? Uh, circle it, would you? Oldathon did drawing ever closer as he maneuvered. His own estimates made his mouth go dry. 
I hope your numbers are friendlier than my guesses. I don't think so. I'd hazard thirty, forty kilometers across. At least. Gray feather one to control. Incoming blip is meteor sized. Repeat meteor sized. Nature and identity still not known. Blip is cloaked. Request authority to fire upon it. There was a chance, a bare chance, that it was a friendly vehicle, planetoid sized, arriving under the auspices of and with the permission of the planetary government, and refusal of authorization would be a sign that this was the case. Greyfeather, you are authorized to fire. Uldathon turned toward the void and accelerated. The rapidness with which it grew in his viewport suggested that he was close to it, but he had no good way of determining how close. No way before now. Arm two bangers. Report their transceiver codes to squadron and control sensors. Then fire. Danon's voice, now that he was engaged in acts of war, was cool, professional. Yes, sir. A moment later, the K-wing shuddered slightly, and two glowing lines streaked away from its outer wing hardpoints. Emissions from the concussion missiles Dannon had launched. The two lines converged in the distance, and seconds later ended in what looked like a single detonation. Uldathan checked his sensor board. It showed the missile paths as lines and reported a distance to target of 321 kilometers. He swore swung the nose of his starfighter out of line with his target, and banked to fall in behind the target's approach path. Now, as he turned back toward the planet, he saw the void as a featureless blackness obscuring the middle of the planet. Something's happening. Danon's voice sounded professionally detached. Sensor readings. On Uldathan's sensor board, a shape appeared for a moment a huge shape, then disappeared again. Moments later it returned, and through the forward canopy he could finally see his target. It was roughly oval, but very irregular, with a dark mottled surface. There was activity on its surface, lights igniting. He increased magnification on his visual scanner and could see small craft launching from what looked like a power plant installation on the surface. One vehicle was a shuttle. There were also a dozen or more starfighters, and something that looked like a small, highly modified blockade runner style frigate, but with a prow shaped like a balloon instead of a sledgehammer. Dannon no longer sounded matter of fact. Nickel iron asteroid! Millions of tons! We've got to... We've got to... Words failed Uldathan. There was nothing they could do. It would take hours, maybe days, to mount an operation that could divert or destroy such a target. Commonor had no planet buster weapons, no Death Star main gun, nothing that could cope with this. As he watched, the fleeing enemy craft cleared well away from the asteroid and then bright lines appeared on the asteroid's surface, as though a giant child were scribbling on it with a pen filled with glowing ink. The asteroid separated into dozens of chunks, each massing hundreds or thousands of tons. They drifted apart, moving in a slow, curiously stately fashion away from the center of the explosion that had shattered the asteroid. Got to evacuate! Helpless, Uldathan shook his head. He had to do something. By an act of will, he got his voice under control again. Dannon, transmit constant sensor feed to control. Control, here's what's coming at you. He didn't have enough firepower to affect any shard of that asteroid. But he could, perhaps prevent the enemy from using the same equipment to employ the same tactic. He reacquired the flight of enemy starfighters on sensor 
and swung toward them. Gray feathers, join me here. Primary target is the vehicle with the balloon-shaped prow, which I'm assuming is the cloaking mechanism. Secondary is the shuttle. All others insignificant. He heard affirmatives from his squadmates. He pushed them from his mind. He wasn't likely ever to see them again. But maybe he could delay the enemy's exit from the system long enough for the other Grey Feathers to reach them, to finish the job he was about to start. He engaged the K-Wing's auxiliary thruster, the one used for short bursts of acceleration, and roared toward the enemy formation. Hey, Dannon. Yeah? Good working with you. Yeah. You too. Chapter 10 Coruscant Undercity, near Senate Building Hours after their arrival at their destination, each Jedi was positioned beneath a different plaza-level access cover, except for Siha, who shared Master Katarns. Valen studied his hands. His palms were bandaged over the scrapes and cuts he'd picked up, both in getting to this spot and then from the hours of training Siha had put them through, tracing and retracing routes from their assigned stations to the exit point where Master Katarn and Siha were now situated. But he didn't mind. Now he suspected that he could make his way back to the exit point if he were blindfolded, during a quake with a full orchestra blaring away beside him. The only things likely to thwart a mad scramble to the escape route would be the many crawling, venomous denizens to be found in the Undercity, so much more numerous since the Yuzhan Vong had executed their Vong-forming of Coruscant and introduced thousands of new species as part of their effort to reshape the world. Valin hung in a vertical shaft similar to the one Siha had pointed out earlier. Suspended from durasteel access rungs by cables and snap two climbing hooks, sitting on a broad cloth sling that had been comfortable an hour earlier, he was a bare meter below the exit hatch. In addition to the slick suit and his backpack, he wore a set of optics. Not electrobinoculars, but a holocam monitor structured as a set of goggles. Attached to them was a tiny optic cable that ran up and through the locking mechanism of the access hatch. Its tiny holocam end protruding through the other side and oriented toward the main Senate building entrance. Just now it showed little. There was still an hour or more to go until dawn, and there was little pedestrian or speeder traffic at surface level. Overhead, however, the streams of airspeeder traffic remained constant, multicolored glows of movement in hundreds of trails of light. That was Coruscant, in wartime or peacetime, never asleep always vividly colorful. The holocam cable was not the only one that ran from him. Another ran from the earbud he wore to the wall, to which it was attached by a lump of greenish glue. It ran down the shaft and off to the station Katarn and Siha shared. Comlink transmissions might be detected, especially so close to the Senate building where security was so high. Exchanges of images or feelings through the Force might be detected by Jason Solo. That left an antiquated but remarkably reliable standby. The intercom. Mithric's voice came across it now. Collier has got her antenna up and out, and she's receiving Holonet news. Valen snorted. What's new? Elements of the Third Fleet attacked Commonor. In addition to hammering at military forces, they dropped asteroids onto the planet proper. They hit population centers like city buster bombs. Valen whistled. Had to be Colonel Solo's orders. Not Admiral Neothel's. That's the weird thing. Apparently it was neither. The task force commander did it on his own initiative. He's been brought to Coruscant to face charges. The next voice Valen heard was Collier's. The Kaminori are going to retaliate. I mean, beyond just a normal military response. 
Aren't they? Probably. That was Master Katarn. Even if it wasn't because of orders from the Chiefs of State, the G.A. just violated conventions of war. How is Admiral Neothel going to persuade them that it was a rogue commander, that the Kaminori should fight fair? I don't think it's going to happen. Valen's holocam view, a wrenching 360-degree panorama, showed distant lights inbound, a short stream of them at ground level. Heads up, Jedi. Looks like a convoy approaching my position. Mithric snorted. Relax. It won't be Colonel Solo. He only shows up when there are holocams on hand to record the event, the better for Alliance morale. Valen frowned. A logical fallacy. The only occasions we know about are his public entrances. We can't conclude that he doesn't make private ones. Mithric's voice turned baiting. Do all the horns delight in their logical faculties? Master Katarn's response was mild. Quiet, please. But it served to shut everyone up. The convoy, three airspeeders, passed Valen's position. The first one was a black Galactic Alliance Guard vehicle, a small, speedy four-passenger model. The alert lights atop the vehicle were not active. The second was a civilian speeder, long, black, enclosed, and from the way it bobbed on its repulsors as they crossed uneven patches of Plaza Duracrete, very heavy, probably armored. The third was a black GAG group carrier. Its slab-like sides could lift away to reveal up to a full squadron of armed and armored troopers. And the one individual whose identity Valen could make out through the second speeder's side viewpoint set off alarm bells in his mind. Uh, this could be him. It's all G.A.G. and a V.I.P. Katarn's voice remained outwardly calm. Did you see Solo? No, but there's other bad news. The second vehicle is carrying a YVH combat droid. The Yuzhang Vong hunter droids, designed at the height of the Yuzhang Vong War, were formidable. In a one-on-one -on -one match between a Jedi Knight and a YVH droid, the odds were about even. If the Jedi was inexperienced, if the battle dragged on long enough for her to tire, she was likely to be the loser. A dead loser. Oh, I hate those. There was a wealth of dismay and experience in Collier's tone. Ready yourself. Katarn continued to sound calm, almost bored. They're pulling to a stop near my position. Valen sat up and out of his sling seat, hanging on to the durasteel rungs, and reached into his backpack for the grenade launcher there. He hooked his elbow through the wall rung so he could more easily use both hands to open out the weapon's folding stock. It clicked reassuringly into place. He did all this by touch, watching through his holocam feed as the three vehicles slowed to a simultaneous stop. First, the side slabs of the troop carrier lifted. Six GAG troopers with blaster rifles stepped out from the benches on each side. Six flanked the center vehicle. The other six moved toward the Senate building and then stopped, arrayed in two lines of three with three meters of space between the lines. Valen climbed until his head was just beneath the hatch. This was looking more and more like a go. The doors of the second vehicle rose, and the first being to emerge was the YVH. The angular droid moved out from the front seat, opened the rear passenger's side door, and extracted a shipping crate from the back seat. At a meter tall and wide, a meter and a half long, black like most GAG gear, the crate was large enough to be unwieldy. The droid pulled it partway out, then lifted it, demonstrating remarkable care and delicacy. Valen wanted desperately to reach out through the force, 
and see if he could divine the crate's contents. But any such action might alert Jason. He just bit his lip. Then the rear driver's side door opened, and Jason Solo, his cape fluttering in a light breeze, stepped out. Katarn's voice remained maddeningly calm. Wait until he's a few meters from the vehicle. Solo himself waited until the combat droid carried its mystery package around to his side of the speeder. Then, side by side, they walked toward the Senate building entrance. Go! Behind him, from all over the nearly deserted plaza, Kytus heard four metal clanks and knew there was trouble. He and YVH-908 spun. He heard a faint exclamation of complaint from inside the crate as Alana was whirled. Then, from out in the darkness, came a succession of pum 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 noises, familiar to him as the sounds made by a grenade launcher set to sustained automatic fire. He ignited his lightsaber. Secure the package. In his peripheral vision, he saw the combat droid whirl again, completing a 360-degree turn, accompanied by another woof from Alana, and then begin running toward the doors, its metal heels clanging with each step. A flare ignited high in the air, and Kytus reached upward, sensing through the force, feeling the descent of many tumbling metal cylinders. He raised a hand to sweep them away, but a tingle of alarm caused him to stiffen. This came not through the force, but from a simple mathematical realization. Four metal clangs, two grenade launchers firing. What were the other two positions doing? He had a moment before the descending grenades would be close enough to explode and do him harm. So he looked down, out toward the darkened plaza, and extended his perceptions in that direction and felt them. More metal cylinders, at least a dozen, rolling toward him rather than flying. Now he could feel the ripples in the force as they were propelled telekinetically toward him. Contemptuous, he flicked his hand toward the darkness and felt his own power turn the cylinders around. They began rolling back the way they had come. The sky above lit up as though noon had come more than six hours early. Worse, for the brightness surpassed that of high noon. Troopers all around him cried out, threw their arms over their eyes. The visors of their helmets could not darken fast enough to protect their wearers from these dazzle grenades. Kytus cursed. His assumption that the falling missiles were explosives, that he had a second before they reached him, had just cost him his support troops. But he, at least, could see. Out in the darkness... The rolling grenades exploded with moist crump noises. Gas grenades, then. Coma gas? Stun gas? The breeze was from behind him. The gas would not reach him or his troops. Finally, he detected more than just telekinetic pushes. He felt presences as his enemies drew on force abilities. He felt them rush toward him caught sight of them as they entered the glow of lights from the front of the Senate building. Four Jedi, Master Kyle Katarn foremost among them. Katarn ignited his lightsaber as he came to a stop a few meters away. Care to surrender, Colonel Solo? Not to a traitor. Titus looked at the other three as their force-augmented sprints came to an end, leaving them in a semicircle before him. Three Jedi Knights, the younger Horn, the Faleen Mithric, the Bothan Hulia. He resisted the urge to snort. Separately or collectively, these Jedi Knights were no match for him. Katarn, though, was a threat. Still, the Jedi had only moments before GA reinforcements would arrive. Their attack was already a failure. He sensed Katarn's attack, threw up his blade in a block so well practiced that his muscle memory could have performed it while he slept. With his free hand, 
he gestured at the Bothan Jedi. She was suddenly airborne, hurtling sideways to slam into the Falene, knocking them both down. Katarn's blade struck his, rebounded with a snap hiss, and came around from the other side as the Jedi Master executed a lightning-fast spin. Kytus stepped back from it, not engaging the blade. He watched the blade flash harmlessly past him. He stepped forward again into a sidekick, aimed not at Katarn, but at the onrushing Valen Horn. His boot heel caught the Jedi Knight on the point of his chin, knocking Horn backward off his feet. Two seconds had passed since the attack began. Only Siha's head protruded from the pavement hatch as she watched her four companions assault Colonel Solo. In one sense, it was a beautiful and brilliant thing to see. The five combatants moved as though they'd been choreographing this event for years, and had planned all along that the two sides would somehow be even. Each time the lightsabers came together, the resulting flash of light slightly greater than two glows by themselves, cast the five combatants into relief. Around them, blinded G.A.G. troopers withdrew, finding one another by touch, keeping their blasters up and at the ready, waiting for the moment when their sight would return and allow them to open fire. Above, though at a distance from the Senate building, the trails of airspeeder lights glimmered in their passage. And Siha still had one task to perform. In her free hand she held a patch of black cloth. It was square, five centimeters to a side, and very soft and pliant, despite the fact that its center layer consisted of circuitry embedded in a flexible polymer. One side was covered by a transparent layer of flimsy. With her teeth she worried an edge of the flimsy free then pulled the whole layer off, dropping it into the access hole she occupied. The removal of the flimsy exposed a layer of adhesive. With her own force powers, so much less subtle than those of her allies, she sent the cloth patch flying, centimeters above ground level, toward the fight. But she couldn't send it on to her target. Not yet. Master Katarn had been clear about that. She had to wait until things were at their most chaotic, their most distracting. So she guided the patch ever closer to the fight, but waited. Waited. Ten seconds. Kytus rolled out of Katarn's kick to his head, catching a scrape along his cheek, and swung at the master's leg. But Collier's blade intercepted his before it bit into flesh. His strength batted her weapon away but she had deflected his blow and spared Katarn an amputation. They're coordinating. Good for them. Bad for me. Kytus heard a siren, an oncoming G.A.G. vehicle. No, two. Maybe three. He allowed himself a certain satisfaction at their speed of response. He hadn't expected anything of the sort for another half-minute. Then, from the corner of his eye he saw the first oncoming vehicle, an aging Sentinel-class armored shuttle. It was yellow with spots of rust. He could not make out its markings without looking at it, but he knew it was not in G.A.G. or Alliance colors. Entering airspace above the plaza, it began a dangerously steep and fast repulsor lift descent. Behind it came three G.A.G. airspeeders, one of them firing a top-mounted laser at the shuttle. Ah, so they were not responding with brilliant speed to an alarm. They were chasing the Jedi escape vehicle. Kytus swung at Horn, a blow meant not to connect, but to cause the young Jedi to flinch away into the path of the Falim, which he did. While they were interfering with each other, Kytus gestured at the Bothan Jedi, hurling her toward Katarn. Katarn hurled his lightsaber off to the side, and caught Julia with both hands, preventing her from falling, prepared to pull her out of harm's way if Kytus followed through. Kytus did not. He kept his senses on Katarn's lightsaber, and when it vectored to fly toward him from the side, 
he negligently swatted it away with his own blade. Fifteen seconds. Kytus gave Katarn and Hulia a little smile. You could save yourselves a lot of pain by telling me now where Luke has set up the new Jedi headquarters. I swear, when you are in my hands, you will answer that question. The Bothan got her feet back under her and stood at the ready. Katarn caught his returning lightsaber. Meaning you will torture us to death. Are you listening to yourself, Jason? Do you even know who you are anymore? I do. It's you who have no idea who I am. He felt force energy growing within Mithric and Horn. He gestured, telekinetically yanking the Bothan forward, positioning her between him and them. He felt their force exertion as it was suddenly cut off. Katarn advanced, lightsaber at the ready. Kytus withdrew before him. With part of his awareness, he was keeping track of the four inbound vehicles, plotting their trajectories. One of the GAG vehicles was circling ahead and to starboard of the descending shuttle. Its arc, intended to put it toward the bow of the shuttle so it could fire on the cockpit, would bring it near the combatants, just a few meters above them. The pilot's maneuver was smooth, the vehicle clearly under control. Kytus could see the Jedi barely registering its presence, since it did not figure into the combat. Kytus reached out a hand, as if intending to hurl Katarn away from him. The master raised his own hand, a deflecting gesture, but Kytus exerted himself against the oncoming G.A.G. speeder, yanking it down and toward all of them. A moment's inattention or focus elsewhere. That's all it ever took. By the time Katarn felt the speeder coming toward him, spinning, its stern a mere two meters from his back, it was already too late for him to send a command even to force-augmented nerves and muscles— his face changed with the awareness of danger. Then the speeder's port quarter hit his back, hurling him forward to slam into Kytus. The speeder, continuing its out-of-control motion, slid through the location of the other Jedi, knocking Hulia to the permacrete, causing Horn and Mithric to leap to safety. Katarn now stood so close to Kytus that every facial feature was visible every scar and line in his weathered face, every hair on his brow, mustache, and beard. Kytus felt a rush of satisfaction, enjoyment, as Katarn's expression turned from one of surprise to pain. Katarn looked down to see Kytus's lightsaber buried to its hilt in his chest. A noise, something halfway between a groan and a death rattle, emerged from Katarn's lips. Smiling, Kytus yanked his lightsaber free and let the stricken Jedi Master fall face first on the pavement. Chapter 11 Siha felt all breath leave her body, as though it had been her chest, not Katarn's, that had been pierced. Jason Solo's exultation washed through the force and over her like a wave at a beach, almost knocking her free from the rung she held. No, no, no. The words rang in her head and were echoed by Mithric. The Falene Jedi howled as he charged Solo, his anguish giving him speed and strength as he threw blow after blow at his enemy. Things were at their most chaotic. The words sprang up in her mind, incongruous, like golden flowers in a burned field. And her last task, the one Master Katarn had given her, was not accomplished. She focused herself on the distant black patch. It was now only three meters from where Colonel Solo disinterestedly blocked Mithric's attacks. Valen Horn was charging toward the combat. Collier was up too, but limping badly as she headed toward their enemy. The shuttle was just meters above the plaza, 
settling precisely into place, so that its belly hatch was positioned exactly above the access hole through which Collier had emerged. Laser fire from the GAG speeders was raking the shuttle's top armor to pieces. See his vision blurred with tears. She dashed them away and flicked a hand at the distant patch. As Colonel Solo twirled, causing his cloak to flare up and away from him, the patch flew to its lower hem and merged with it. Now the three Jedi Knights assailed Solo all out, a fight they were doomed to lose. Siha could not save them. Her tasks were accomplished. She should leave before Colonel Solo detected her. No, she couldn't. Not while a good man, a teacher, lay dead on the Duracrete in an enemy capital. She reached out to Kyle Katarn. His body jerked, and he slid a meter toward her. She poured more of herself, of her concentration, into her effort. Master Katarn's body began sliding again, continuously now, picking up speed as it scraped its way across the plaza. One of the GAG troopers fired his blaster at Mithric. Collier, hobbling, managed to get her lightsaber blade up and caught the bolt. But it meant the trooper's vision was returning. Siha saw the Jedi exchanging words. Valen spun away from the engagement with Jason and moved toward the one-sided trooper. That man fired again, and Valen deflected the bolt with his lightsaber, deflected it straight toward Jason. The improvised attack evidently came as a surprise. The bolt grazed Jason's right leg, sending him to his knee. Mithric redoubled his attack, hammering away at Jason's defense like a toolsmith on a primitive world, battering away at a stubborn harvester droid. Collier, bent over from distress more than pain, hesitated, then turned and moved at a fast hobble toward the shuttle. Siha pulled one last time, and Master Katarn, shoulders first, slid into her grasp. Katarn's eyes opened. His voice was little more than a wheeze. Go! You're alive! Explosives package! Give me one! Other one to block exit! Siha hauled him into the access hall, lowering him face down, wincing as the movements made him gasp with pain. I'll blow up our exit route, yes. We'll all get out. Girl... Leave me. She had to rely on her telekinetic power to lower him to the floor. Her skill was not the greatest. She lowered him four meters without incident, rotated him so that for the last portion of the descent he would be supine, and then, not meaning to, she dropped him. He fell two meters and slammed down onto Duracrete flooring. He grunted, and his eyes closed. Siha yanked the hatch shut. She took a few moments to patch one of her explosives charges into the holocam goggles she would be leaving behind. Then she scrambled down the ladder. I'm going to get you out alive, or we can blow up together. Titus hadn't felt the blaster bolt coming. His concentration was slipping and this madman of a Falene Jedi was starting to beat down his parries. His strength was slipping. He wasn't yet recovered from his duel with Luke. And now, as more of his troopers began firing, Horn began deflecting more bolts at him. The imprecise, barely-aimed nature of the attacks worked in Horn's favor. The shots were unpredictable and Kytus had to divide his attention between a mad swordsman and a growing number of half-blind snipers. But he was still the best lightsaber swordsman around, excepting possibly Luke, perhaps the best there ever had been. Kytus waited until the timing was perfect, waited until an incoming bolt arrived at the same moment as one of Mithric's attacks, so he could devote a single maneuver to both. He caught Mithric's blow toward the hilt of his lightsaber. He caught the bolt near the tip, deflecting it up and straight into Mithric's chest. Mithric staggered back, 
the center of his chest blackened as the smell of burned skin and meat filled the air. Kaidus leapt up and executed a single, precise lateral blow. Mithric's head fell from his shoulders. His body toppled down half a second later. Kaidus and Horn spun to face each other. An expression of sadness crossed Horn's face, but his dismay did not distract him. He caught three more blaster bolts with his lightsaber blade without looking at their firers. Kaidus gestured toward his troopers, signaling them to cease fire. They did. Now the only ranged fire to be heard came from the speeders, still chewing the shuttle to pieces. Kaidus flexed his injured leg experimentally and decided it was not too bad. It would take his weight and allow him some footwork. He gestured toward Horn. You going to try this alone? Horn shook his head. Kaidus smiled. You're a fraction of the man your father is. Funny, that's what I was going to say to you. Horn seemed to blur as he dashed toward the shuttle, his sprinting speed augmented by the force. Don't be an idiot. That thing will never take off again. Kaidus left off his harangue as Horn ran up the side ramp where the Bothan had disappeared moments before. No matter. The shuttle would not take off. Horn or Holia or both would be captured, and after a lengthy enough interrogation, Kaidus would know where Luke and the Jedi were now hiding. He bent over to pick up Mithric's head by its ponytail. The Faleen's eyes were still open, staring forward, eerily lifelike, but his skin color had gone to gray. Kaidus dropped the head and looked around. Where was Katarn? The door slid open, and Alana saw Jason filling the doorway. He was sweaty, but calm. She wasn't sure why, but the first thing she said was, You're hurt. He nodded, unconcerned, and entered. A little bit. Nothing important. I put a bandage on it. What happened? Well, when YV was taking you out of the speeder, bad people showed up to try to take you away from me. Uncomfortable, she fidgeted. I don't like riding around in the box. It helps keep people from seeing you. That way it's harder for them to figure out where you are. Harder for them to try to take you. Is it uncomfortable? Not really. In fact, it had a miniature cooling unit that kept the air fresh and clean, and she had her data pad in it. And YV, though he was dull and didn't know any games, except shoot the scarhead which he wouldn't tell her how to play, carried it in a very smooth ride. But it was cramped. She couldn't stand up or move around in it. I just don't like it. Well, this morning was just a test. Most places will be able to drive right into a building in the speeder and not worry about the crate. But you'll still have to use it sometimes. She knew her voice sounded glum. All right. She looked at him, waiting again for him to say the special words, but he didn't. He did have other special words, though. I love you, Alana. I love you, too. But I miss Mommy. So do I. His voice turned sad. So do I. Sanctuary Moon of Endor Jedi Outpost the thorns dug deeper into Ben's cheek, pressing against him in the fevered way the creations of the Yuzhan Vong had when inflicting pain, and he could feel them injecting their venom. His cheek swelled and kept swelling. He could feel the skin growing taut, the tissues beneath it beginning to rip, his nerves screaming. And so he knew it was a dream. 
He was gone from the Anakin Solo, out of the embrace of pain, away from Jason and his tortures. It was over. He didn't wake up immediately, but the dream ended there with his realization. The vine had no more power over him. It went limp and still. His cheek ceased to hurt. A moment later, he realized that he was growing impatient, bored, and it was then that he opened his eyes. Actually, his cheek did hurt, just a little, and was still slightly swollen. He rubbed it as he stared around. His room had once been a walk-in wardrobe belonging to the commander of this outpost, and as such it was large enough for the military cot, small table, and chair that had been brought in as his personal furniture. It wasn't much of a room, but it was better than most of the Jedi here received. He rose, tossing his blanket aside, and took down his robes from the hangar. Dressed, he moved out into his father's living room. It was still and dark, and Ben assumed at first that he was the only occupant. Then he saw his father sitting cross-legged before the big viewport, staring, as was so often his custom, at the trees of Endor. Ben watched his father for a minute. Luke sat perfectly still, expressionless, blinking less often than was normal for a man who was awake. He had to be aware of Ben's movements and scrutiny, but he did not react. Ben knew why. His father had been so solicitous of him in the days since his rescue from the Anakin Solo that Ben had begun snapping at him. The realization made Ben wince inside. Pain, self-consciousness, a pervasive feeling of betrayal from Jason's torture of him— and, for all he knew, the teenage hormones everybody talked about all the time had made him twitchy and angry. Ben felt he had plenty of reasons to be twitchy and angry, reasons that went beyond the torture he had experienced. He suspected, he knew, deep down, that it had been Jason, not Ali Marar, who had killed his mother. And in all the universe— he seemed to be the only one who recognized that fact. It was hard to be the one person keeping alive a thought that big. But his father didn't deserve his anger. Maybe Ben couldn't always stop himself from being that way, but he could at least recognize that it wasn't his father's fault. Ben spent a few moments juggling words in his head, then moved over to sit beside his father, facing him, but in the same pose. The posture made his joints ache. The medics had said he would ache for weeks after what Jason had done to him. He tried to make his voice calm, mature. I did my homework, you know. Luke blinked several times in succession. He did not look confused, but Ben knew and took a little uncharitable delight in the fact that his words had baffled his father. Luke turned toward him. What homework? The assignment you and Mom gave me just before I went off to Almania. Luke shook his head. I'm glad you did it. But I don't understand what you're saying. It was about my grandfather, Anakin Skywalker, how he got to be Darth Vader. The Emperor did horrible things to him, made him suspicious of his friends so they wouldn't be friends anymore, made him kill younglings so no one would ever trust him again, made him alone, made it so nobody else in the universe understood him, except the Emperor. I bet, just before he became Darth Vader, he probably hated the Emperor, but the Emperor had worked it out so that he was the only one Anakin Skywalker had. Luke considered, then nodded. I expect you're right. So I figured it out. That's what Jason was doing to me. Comprehension dawned in Luke's eyes. 
That's exactly right. And if I had killed him that day, I would have turned into Darth Vader. Maybe. For a while. Maybe forever. Maybe. Luke shrugged. But if you understand that, if you remember it forever, you'll never turn into Darth Vader. He shifted to look out across the forest vista again. I think you're probably smarter than my father. I got my brains from Mom. Luke snorted, jarred out of his contemplative mood. As well as your tendency toward verbal abuse. You sent Valen Horn off on a mission. Yes, I did. Even though he's the son of an old friend. I have to forget about that sort of thing when deciding who to send off on missions. If I don't, I'll compromise the ethics of the Order, and the trust the Jedi Masters and Jedi Knights have in me. I might even cause the downfall of the Order. Would you send me off on a mission where I might be killed? You've been on missions like that. Center point. Yeah. With Jason. You were actually sending Jason, not me. Would you send me, as a Jedi Knight? When you're a Jedi Knight, you've only just been appointed as my apprentice. Ben took a deep breath. If you could kill Jason, or save Valen from going to the dark side, which would you choose? Luke didn't answer. Ben fell silent. If he started talking again, his father could ignore the question. But Ben very much wanted to hear the answer. Ben, I would kill Jason. So you gave me special consideration you wouldn't give Valen? Yes. Luke lowered his gaze to his hands, which rested in his lap. Speaking as the Grand Master, I shouldn't have. It makes me... Ben choked up and stopped. He spent a few moments regaining control of his voice. It makes me partly to blame that he's still out there. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. And I'm not saying anything except I don't want any special treatment... Not anymore. Not when there's anything important riding on it. Luke nodded. You're right. He gave Ben a sidelong look. You realize what a concession that is for me to give. How hard it is for me, as your father, to do it. Yeah. I want a concession from you. What is it? If you're ever in the same position you were on the Anakin Solo, with Jason at your mercy, you take your shot only if you can do it without hate. No kidding yourself. No logical gymnastics. Without hate. Deal. Ben extended his hand. Luke shook it. Kip's coming. He glanced over his shoulder. Ben felt a little pulse in the force and heard a click from the button on the door jam. The door slid open, revealing Kip Duran in the act of reaching for the chime button outside. Kip stepped in. Grandmaster, Apprentice Skywalker. He held up the data pad in his other hand. I have news. Luke rose. From Coruscant? Yes. Luke moved to a table and sat, gesturing for Kip to take the seat opposite. Let's hear it. Kip paused, glancing at Ben. Ben stood, too. I'll go. I need to arrange to be moved into the apprentice dormitory. Luke shook his head. You staying here is not special treatment. 
you're my apprentice, until and unless I decide to reassign you. Kip, he can stay for this. He's full of insights today. Kip shrugged and sat. Ben took a stuffed chair next to the table. Kip's voice became more sober. The mission group reports partial success. Colonel Solo remains at large. Master Katarn was badly injured, but has been successfully taken to a safe house. Jedi Mithric lost his life. The others are with Katarn. The droid-piloted shuttle did not get off the ground after its landing. The surviving team members did successfully evacuate through it into the Undercity, but since it never got airborne, traces of their escape route were detected. We can anticipate that the Undercity will not be a viable approach in the future. Luke took in the news, shaking his head over Mithric's death. And the package? The package is on Colonel Solo. Ben frowned, puzzled. What's the package? A tracer. Luke outlined a square about five centimeters across on the table surface. About so big. Black cloth. As long as it remains on Jason, we can accurately plot where he is. Get a better sense of his movements. Ben considered that. So, you were sure that the mission you sent Valon on would fail? Kip nodded. The ambush portion of it, yes. Once I realized that we couldn't mount a successful grab-or-terminate mission against Jason without being able to control the place and the time, I decided that it should be as realistic as possible, but also that it would serve chiefly to set up future operations— ones that have a chance of succeeding. Did the team members know? Luke shook his head. Only Master Katarn. We couldn't risk any of the others being captured and tortured into confessing. I was certain Kyle would be able to escape. Or die before being broken. Kip caught Ben's eye. So, insights? just that he'll try to punish the Jedi now. He may have called them cowards and stuff in the Hollow News before, but he didn't do anything that would make it impossible for you to go crawling back to him. Attacking him like this probably made it clear you're not going back. He'll discredit the Jedi every chance he gets and hunt us with whatever resources he can. Luke nodded. We need to improve our resources, too. I think it's time to call Wedge Antilles. Booster Tarek. Talon Card. See what kind of surprises we can arrange for Jason. It's time to come up with some new plans. Kip smiled at him. Welcome back. But there was a look in Luke's eye. A distant worry that told Ben his father was not truly back, not truly recovered. Not yet. Chapter 12 Kashyyyk, Mytel Base The popular conception of the Wookiee world of Kashyyyk was that it was all forest, pole to pole, kilometers deep, with the forest floor an impossibly thick layer of organic matter, twisted roots, monsters, and darkness. And, of course, there were huge belts of terrain that could be described exactly that way. But there were also oceans, mountains, and regions where the vegetation, growing atop shelves of rock only a few meters down, was no taller than on any other world. There, living beings could stand on the ground and see the sky through the branches. It was at such a place that Palpatine's occupation forces had built Mytel Base some six decades before. They had landed prefabricated buildings, had poured duracrete, had raised hangars and installed perimeter defenses. From places like this, they had ruled the world. Then, after Palpatine died, the Wookiees had reclaimed their planet, 
one base at a time, driving the stormtroopers into flight. The wildlife of Kashyyyk had overgrown many of the bases, while others, like Mytel, had been kept in sporadic use as sites where offworlders could be housed and their spacecraft could be landed. Zack, panting in the shade of a tree less than thirty meters tall, decided that the years had not blunted the base's utilitarian ugliness. Though green and brown vines snaked across the roofs of many of the buildings, the walls remained a dirty gray-white, shining like bones in the sun. The streets and landing strips were precise straight lines, intersecting at right angles, all at odds with the flowing organic nature of the world around them. Though currently employed by the Wookiees as a base to stage firefighting operations, this place still didn't belong here. Hey! Jaina's call was curt. Again! Zek looked over at her. She stood in her Jedi robes, perspiring and tense, lightsaber unlit in her hands. Zek sighed. Give me a minute. I need to practice. I'm not sure you can gain anything from sparring more with me. You've outstripped me with the lightsaber. Practice is all you think about, day and night. I doubt any Jedi Knight can stand against you. You need to practice against a master. Come on! Her tone was not wheedling, but commanding. Shaking his head, sure it was a bad idea, Zek approached her again. He thumbed on his lightsaber. Before he could even bring it into line, Jaina gestured. The hilt popped out of his hand and flew into Jaina's grip. Anticipating her rush, he twisted out of the way as she dashed up to him. He ducked under her attack, grabbed the hilt of her own unlit lightsaber, and yanked. But she did not release it. Using his own strength to augment her move, she somersaulted over him. Then, as she landed, she kicked out, hammering the side of his knee. He fell, rolling away from her follow-up blow, and felt a chill of fear. Hold it! End practice! She paused, annoyed, and looked down at him. What? If I don't have a lightsaber, I can't parry. Well, you should hold on to yours. She switched it off and tossed it to him. Then she retreated to her start position and took up her ready stance again. Come on. We're switching to training lightsabers. Scowling at her, Zek moved to the pack of workout gear they had brought. He dropped his lightsaber on the blanket beside the pack. Then, from inside, he drew out two practice weapons. Made for use by Jedi trainees and apprentices, their energy blades delivered a painful shock but no accident with one could sever an arm. Or a head. I'm not going to learn anything from facing a shock weapon. Come on, pick up your lightsaber. Zek shook his head and approached her, one training weapon in each hand. You're not going to learn anything from practicing with me unless you switch to shock weapons, because otherwise I'm not going to be a part of it. Jaina, you're playing too rough. You're a danger to yourself and others. Zack, you know you can trust me. I know I used to be able to, before you turned into... Zack saw what was approaching them from the direction of the Millennium Falcon hangar, and his voice trailed off. Jaina's eyes narrowed, as though she saw through his simple trick and was offended by it. Then, either through the Force or simply by being convinced by his expression that someone was indeed approaching, she turned to look. Walking toward them was Jason Solo. He was clad head to foot in a black guard uniform. He wore thick jackboots and thick gloves. His helmet's full-face visor concealed his features. His cape billowed behind him as he strode. Zek felt a chill of almost supernatural dread. In his full regalia, Solo looked so much like Darth Vader that anyone allied with the Jedi 
remembering or having studied the bygone times of the Jedi Purge, would be similarly affected. Jaina's voice came as a whisper. Too short. Yeah. Vader was much taller. Too short even for my brother, idiot. She raised her voice so the intruder could hear her. Whoever you are, that's not funny. Reaching the edge of their practice clearing, their visitor pushed up his visor, revealing the features of Jag Fell. I wasn't trying to be funny. But Zek, you should have seen your face. Zek blinked at him. Trying to get a date with an Alliance loyalist? No, because you're not going to find many on Kashyyyk. Jag gestured at Jaina. I came to spar with her. You know, lightsabers. Jaina gave him a scornful look. Jag, do you even know how to use a lightsaber? I know lesson one. Don't grab the glowy end. Jaina paused, obviously uncertain as to how to respond to his curious request. She walked up to face him. Jag, I don't want to hurt your feelings. I have every respect for you as a pilot, as a tactician, as a soldier. But in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you're nowhere near my equal. And you can't begin to simulate Jason's abilities. I won't get anything out of a practice session, and you might get hurt. I might indeed. He looked around. Which are the real lightsabers, and which are the fakes? Zek handed him one of the practice weapons. This is one of the safe ones. He handed Jaina the other. Show him what you're talking about, Jaina. I could use the rest. Unwillingly, she handed Zek her lightsaber. He knows exactly what I'm talking about. He's studied Ali Marar for years. He knows what she's capable of. I'm worse. Well, then, this won't take too much of your time or energy. Jag looked down at himself, then gave his thigh a slap. Here, give me a jolt, so I know what I'm in for. Shaking her head in exasperation, Jaina lit the training weapon. Its violet blade leapt into life with a softer snap hiss than that of a true lightsaber. Then, slowly, she leaned over to strike Jag's leg. The blade made a crackling noise. Jag's leg jerked, a muscular spasm, and he almost fell. He put weight on it again, took a few experimental steps around. Ah, got it. I bet that teaches the young Jedi the virtues of not getting hit. Zack nodded. It does. All right, let's do it. Zack, you call it. Jag flipped his faceplate down, becoming a believable, if slightly short, simulacrum of Jason Solo. He thumbed his training lightsaber into life and raised it in a credible two-handed grip. Go. Almost faster than the eye could follow, Jaina lunged. Jag moved his blade laterally to sweep her point out of line, a clumsy maneuver suited to a first-year sword student. Jaina disengaged before their blades met and thrust, popping her blade across the side of Jag's neck. Jag let out a yell and staggered back, patting at the point of the blow. Wow! Necks aren't too bad. Zek rubbed his own in sympathetic memory. Wait until you catch one across your eyelid. Or groin. Recovered, Jag stood once more in ready position. Again. Go. This time Jag initiated the attack. A basic vertical slash. He was strong enough to give it a lot of power. Jaina stepped aside, and her lateral blow hit him across the upper arm. Ow! Blast it! Jag rubbed the spot of the injury. 
Jaina gave him an exasperated look. Technically, this bout isn't over, because all I did was take your arm off, in theory. A Jedi might be able to continue for a while with a wound like that, but let's call that one a win for me. Sounds reasonable. Jaina, you're fast. I'm going to keep going until I think I'm fast enough. Are we done? Oh, I'm not bright enough to be done yet. Jag resumed the ready position. Again. Zek snorted, amused. Would it be wrong of me to admit that I'm really starting to enjoy this? Yes. Go. Jag tried the same maneuver. Jaina stepped aside again. Swung. Jag took the blow on his left forearm. The glowing blade bounced. Jag's arm didn't twitch, didn't react at all to the electric shock. He reached out with that arm. Fast as a blaster duelist, drawing and firing, he caught the hilt of Jaina's practice weapon just above her hand and squeezed. The weapon crumpled, the beam cut off. Jaina, caught off guard for only a fraction of a second, stepped back, chambered her leg, and kicked Jag in the solar plexus. His solar plexus went, conk, a metallic noise. Jag wrapped his training sword against her support leg. It spasmed, and she fell. She rolled out of her fall, but Jag was already swinging in the direction of her roll. His blade caught her across the back of the neck. She completed her roll ending up on her back, looking up at him with a pained expression. What was that? Jag shrugged and pushed up his visor again. I won. Jaina's face twisted in anger. Flying's what you're best at, so fly. She gestured as if pushing the air before her. Jag's feet left the ground. He hurtled backward five meters and crashed into the bowl of the glade's shade tree. Then he slid down atop the tangled roots. Leaves rained down on him. Jaina! Zek ran up to Jag, bent over him. What do you think you're doing? Jag grimaced. Punishing me? For embarrassing her. Jaina flipped acrobatically to her feet and stalked toward Jag. I am not embarrassed. You tricked me, she was shouting now, and Zek saw distant heads turning to look. Wookies working in the area, humans in the Falcon hangar. What part of tricking you would be impossible for Alima Rar or Jason Solo to do? Stiffly, Jag began to rise, and accepted a hand from Zek for aid. Jag's gloved hand felt to Zek rigid and metallic. Once Jag was on his feet, Zek wrapped the man's forearm with his knuckles. What have you got on under there? He repeated the experiment on Jag's chest, which also rang metallically. The crush gaunts and Beskar breastplate from the other day. Jaina came to a stop in front of Jag almost spitting in her anger. What are you trying to prove? That you're training yourself to lose. To die. That stopped her. She stared up at him, her anger vanishing in an instant, replaced by surprise. And doubt. Jaina, I've watched you for a long time now, preparing yourself for a confrontation with Alima and... You're not kidding anyone here. Your brother. You've trained and trained, and sweated and persevered. And as far as I can tell, you've done a brilliant job at the wrong task. Explain that. Her eyes searched his. Zek was surprised not to see more anger in hers. She must have been afraid of exactly what Jag was talking about and, in typically Jaina-ish fashion, not discussed it with anyone, not dealt with it except through avoidance. Sword of the Jedi! That's what you are! 
even though nobody's sure what it means. But I'm sure of this. There are two important words there. Sword and Jedi. You've been sharpening yourself into an amazing sword, but you've forgotten what it means to be a Jedi. You're not qualified to say that. Answer me this. What Jedi do you know who would have thrown me into that tree that hard for winning a practice bout? You didn't know my armor protected my back. You could have broken my spine. The helmet didn't protect my neck. You could have broken that. What Jedi would have done that to a friend? She shook her head. It was as though Jag's arguments were blaster bolts, and she was batting most of them harmlessly out of the way. But the occasional bolt was getting through, striking her, searing her. So, you're a good sword and a rotten Jedi. But even if you get back to being a good Jedi, you're going to die. You know why? Because you're training in Jedi skills as though you're going to have a straight-up Jedi duel with your enemies, all lightsabers and light-side force tricks. But you need to be thinking like someone who hunts Jedi. Like me. He stepped so close to Jaina that Zek thought for a moment he was going to stoop and kiss her. That's what I did, and I beat you. Once. Her words were soft, uncertain. The third time. Are you absolutely sure that if I'd tried that tactic on our first bout, it wouldn't have worked? She was silent for a long moment. Then she shook her head. Jag unbuckled his helmet and took it off, holding it at his side. Jaina, as your commanding officer, I'm ordering you to take today off. No training, no strategizing, nothing. Report to me first thing in the morning. At that time, if you think you need another day off, I require you to tell me so. You'll get it. Yes. Colonel. Jag nodded at her and Zack, then spun and headed back to the hangar. Jag maintained his brisk walking pace until he reached the Falcon's hangar. Then he looked around, and seeing no one within sight, moved more slowly and heavily to the Falcon's boarding ramp. He sat on its slope, leaning away from its angle of descent to remain upright. He set his helmet down, then slowly peeled the thin black gloves off the crush gaunts, staring blankly at the floor as he did so. I expected... The voice came from the tall, dark figure who seemed to materialize in front of Jag. Jag jumped up, reaching for a blaster pistol that was not there, then relaxed as he recognized the speaker. You to be jubilant. Zek frowned down at him. Not jumpy and morose. Jag sat again and scowled up at the Jedi. Carefully, he used his right hand to pull his left-hand crush gaunt free of his arm. He set it down beside the helmet. I'm not morose, and I'm a Sullustan. Yes, the ears tipped me off. Zek managed a brief grin. I just wanted to say congratulations. For what? For getting through to her. She looked as shocked as if you'd clobbered her with a force pike. Now she's thinking. Good. Jag pulled the other crush gaunt free and set it down. He looked at his palms, which were red and sweaty. I didn't like shouting at her. Well, you don't shout much. That's not it. Jag's eyes focused past the floor to some distant place and time. Years ago, I thought I could see my future in her eyes. My future. Maybe even the future of my line. My name. Since then, she's slipped away from me. 
I helped that happen. Out of anger. Out of pride. He shook his head and met Zek's gaze again. But I can't let her slip away from what it is to be human. Zek was silent for a long moment. And when he spoke again, his voice was unusually gentle. Jag, I'm going to let you in on a secret. You're an irritant, like itching powder in an enviro suit. Jag glared at him. On top of that, you've got no sense of humor. You're more force-blind than a rock. You handle a lightsaber like a drunken hut, and you're short. But after today, I'm exceedingly proud to have you as a comrade in arms. He extended his hand. Jag looked at it as if expecting a final insult to be written on its palm, then shook it. Thanks. So do I have today off, too? Jag's shoulders slumped. Sure. Go have a drink or something, Colonel. Zek spun and headed out through the hangar's main entrance, walking toward the base crew quarters. Jag sat where he was for long minutes, then collected his gear and left. Leia, silent, stepped out from the shadows at the top of the boarding ramp and shook her head. She glanced back over her shoulder. Han? Yeah, sweetie? How do you teach a man not to be a noble, long-suffering, self-sacrificing idiot? I don't know, sweetie. Mostly I shoot them. I'll consider that. Chapter 13 Coruscant The war raged on. Back in control of his portions of the Alliance military and no longer distracted by Alana's absence, for secretly she accompanied him everywhere, smuggled between G.A. government buildings and the Anakin Solo in shuttles, guarded by only the most trusted officers and YVH-908, Kytus found himself stymied on some fronts, wildly successful on others. First, there was the Hapes situation. Tenel Ka did not immediately turn over her fleets to his control. Instead, she withdrew them to Hapes Consortium space and cut off all communication with the Galactic Alliance and with the Confederation, with the world of Kashyyyk, and, as far as anyone could tell, with the Jedi. Kytus did not know quite what to make of this maneuver. Tenel Ka could have been killed by the explosion that allowed Kytus to escape her palace, or subsequently deposed, her successor choosing to return the consortium to a neutral position. Or Tenel Ka could be taking what she must see as a terrible chance with the life of her daughter. Either way, Kytus had still been able to turn the situation into a victory. By using his intelligence resources, to suggest to Confederation analysts that Tenel Ka's non-aggression treaty with them was now void, Kytus ensured that the Confederation maintained resources to monitor and safeguard against possible Hapen attack. And that gave Kytus some breathing room. Soon enough, he could determine whether Tenel Ka still ruled the consortium, get in touch with her, and persuade her that Alana's life was forfeit if she did not cooperate fully. While waiting to reach Tenel Ka, Kytus concentrated on other things, such as the Jedi. They had been quite successful at going underground after the battle at Kuat, so much so that the only sign he had seen of their activity had been the futile attack on him a few days before. He dispatched Tahiri in her stealth X to run down her own leads and sources, to find out where the Jedi had headquartered themselves. He had thought she could simply use her association with other Jedi to find out the information, but no, 
it appeared that Tenel Ka had managed to communicate her suspicions of Tahiri to the other Jedi at Kuat. Tahiri still had no answer for Kytus. It was a big galaxy, and she was, in his eyes, a stupid girl. And a needy one, constantly importuning him for new chances to flow walk into the past and re-experience the wonders of Anakin Solo in the days and hours before his death. Kytus shook his head over that. He had seen so much of Anakin in recent months that he had come to despise the brat. The reasons why he had ever held the boy in any regard, why he had chosen to name his Star Destroyer for him, were now lost to Kytus. Meanwhile, the war raged on. With the Hapens back in play, the Alliance no longer had to worry about staging a fighting retreat. The balance of power was now once again slightly in the Alliance's favor. Kytus personally led new fleet operations at Kuat and on the outskirts of the Corellian system, commanding elements of the Fifth and Second Fleets, respectively. And his Sith battle meditation ability helped his forces inflict heavy losses in both theaters of operation. Commodore retaliated for the asteroid bombardment, and in savage fashion. The first sign of it was a statistical spike in the number of head colds among humans who had recently passed through Galactic City Spaceport, civilians and military personnel alike. Within days, those head colds developed into raging fevers and dangerous dehydration, and the infection spread like Kashyyyk's forest fires through the ranks of the armed forces and lower social classes. Left untreated, the illness could kill. It was a flisseria, caused by an airborne bacterium, the cure for which had been discovered a century before, with the illness pronounced extinct not long after. There were no stores of a flisseria-specific antibiotics. There had been none needed in a hundred years. Quantities were cultured and rapidly distributed. To the military, there was not enough to protect the civilian population and by the third week of the outbreak, when the first doses began to filter into the civilian distribution network, the illness had reached epidemic proportions, causing massive personnel shortages in critical fabrication industries. Spies captured and interrogated by the guard confessed to being Kaminori and to spreading the bacteria. The Alliance-controlled portions of the holonet howled with outrage. Civilian space traffic was severely curtailed as quarantine measures were put into effect. The war raged on. There were other annoyances. Kytus's subordinates reported that Dr. Saya, failed spy of Centerpoint Station, had disappeared minutes before they moved in to arrest him. In subsequent days, no sign of him turned up suggesting strongly that Kytus had been right to suspect him. He was obviously a double agent and had been rushed to safety by his Corellian masters. Alana was responding with less and less enthusiasm to her time with Kytus. He had to keep his frustration in check and wait for her to get over missing her mother. Perhaps it was time to work on her a bit, to diminish her affection for Tenelka by judiciously erasing some of her memories here and there. Some faint misgivings stayed his hand for the time being, but if the situation continued worsening, he would take that step. And the war raged on. Kashyyyk, Mytel Base, Hangar Housing the Millennium Falcon Han eased the Falcon off the Duracrete roadway and into the shadow of her usual hangar. The ship, he knew, was covered in soot from the firefighting mission they had just concluded. No firebreak mission. This time they had gone in to rescue a unit of Wookiee firefighters who had been cut off by fire moving more rapidly than expected. He was sure the freighter was covered in soot, because Leia in the co-pilot seat certainly was, from head to foot, 
except for a goggle-shaped patch of pink around her eyes and a breather mask-shaped oval around her mouth. The Wookiees she had brought aboard were similarly discolored by and stank of smoke. As soon as the Falcon entered the hangar, and Han's eyes adjusted to the deep shadow there, he and Leia spotted a new visitor. Parked in the bay next to the Falcons was a long yacht with curved lines and a swirling sky-blue and green hull. Its exterior, too, was marred with patches of soot and burn, evidence of its own recent contribution to the firefighting mission. Han winced. Do you suppose when Lando's back is turned we could get some Wookiee teenagers to vandalize her? Put graffiti all over her hull? Leia's tone was more thoughtful. I thought Lando was stationed halfway across Kashyyyk. He was. Lando was nowhere in sight. Han and Leia had set the Falcon down, ushered the Wookiee firefighters off, and called in for routine refueling before Lando made his appearance. The boarding ramp of the Love Commander came down, and he stood at its top, clad in purple synth silk and a flowing velvet hip cloak in black. But it wasn't the same old Lando. His face was fixed, nearly emotionless, his complexion waxy. Leia didn't wait for him to descend. She started up the ramp toward him. Lando, what's wrong? I have to go. Lando managed two faltering steps down the ramp before Leia reached him. She held him there, steadied him on his feet, then turned and assisted him down the ramp. Han tried to keep his own voice steady, unperturbed, but Lando's appearance set off alarm bells in his head. What's going on, old buddy? At the bottom of the ramp, Lando reached into a tunic pocket. He fetched forth a data card, which he looked at blankly for a moment before handing to Han. That's everything you need for the love commander. Registration, annotated schematic, everything. Thought I'd donate her to the cause. Firefighting, side missions. You can sell her if you're ever strapped for credits. Lando, what's wrong? By this point, Leia could no longer keep a sharp edge of worry out of her voice. It's Tendra. Leia paled, and Han felt a jolt of dread. Tendra had to be dying, or already dead, for Lando to be so affected. It wasn't fair. Lando had found his perfect match long after he had given up on the thought that he ever would, and so much of his and Tendra's life together had been interrupted by protracted crises, including the Yuzhan Vong War. And now this. Lando was clearly struggling to continue. Tendra's... She's... going to have a baby... Leia froze, staring up into his shocked features. What? What? A smile started to spread across her face. Han sagged in relief. Is that all? You had us really scared there. All? Is that all? Lando put a hand on the yacht's hull to steady himself. Fine, you can stop being scared. Not me. I'm too old to be a father. Emperor's black bones, I'm not ready. Leia embraced him. Lando, there are two types of people in this universe. Those who think they're not ready to be parents, and those who are kidding themselves. Suddenly relieved of a crushing weight of worry, Han sagged. He bent over putting his hands on his knees. Buddy, the next time you scare me like that, you'll shoot me? Do I have your word on that? Lando, listen. Leia's voice was compelling. You and Tendra 
are going to be the parents every child dreams about. Rich, famous, dashing, and so scared of fouling up, you're going to spoil your child to death. Am I right? Lando considered. His expression was starting to return to normal. How old does he have to be before I start him on Sabacc? Two. Han straightened up. And no wine appreciation training until he's at least four. Leia corrected him. She. It's just... This is something I can't fix with charm, or a rigged game, or a holdout blaster. Leia smiled up at him. You can't fix it, because it's not broken. Yeah. Lando took a deep breath, fortifying himself against the future. I have to go. My transport home lifts off in half an hour. I was worried that I wouldn't get to see you at all before I left. Han clapped him on the shoulder. Well, your luck is holding out, old buddy. Lando gave Leia a final squeeze, grabbed Han for a quick hug. I want to know where you two are at all times, in case I have to holocom you for advice. Just send your message to wherever the noise is the loudest. It'll be either us or Luke. Right. His walk once again jaunty, Lando headed for the main doors out of the hangar. He waved, giving them one last look over his shoulder, and took a final wistful glance at the Millennium Falcon. Then he was gone. Leia tucked herself under Han's arm, wrapping it around her shoulders. I am so jealous. I'm not. Imagine trying to take care of a baby with this war going on. Imagine having one thing, one innocent life to think about, to the exclusion of everything else, including the war. Well, yeah. You have a point. He wheeled her around toward the Falcon. Come on, let's see if we can trick some big furry guys into washing the ship. Aboard the Anakin Solo It was good to be back home, and it surprised Kytus that he had truly begun to think of his ship that way. All through his life, home had been wherever he hung his robes at night as his parents' missions, and then his own missions and goals, carried him from one end of the galaxy to the other. Now he could travel those same distances and still sleep in the same bunk each night. He could keep Alana with him, safe, as safe as she could be anywhere in the galaxy, in the hidden quarters so close to his official cabin. Having a familiar location wherever he went offered comforts that he had never experienced before, offered some small compensation for the loss of friendship he had experienced since embarking on his plan to restore order, and he found himself appreciating that fact. Of course, he could keep Alana even safer, and have even more comforts if he traveled in a bigger, more powerful, more heavily defended vessel something suited to the Chief of State of the Galactic Alliance. He'd have to go to the drawing board and do a little preliminary designing. These were his thoughts as he stood on the Anakin Solo's bridge, looking out through the forward viewports in a rare moment of inactivity. Ahead and down relative to the ship's keel, he could see a Golan Three Space Defense Nova gun, one of several space stations packed with shield generators and weapons, guarding space above Coruscant. It was far enough away to be little more than an elongated blue triangle with tiny bumps and knobs all over it, like an odd-shaped blaster pistol aimed out into space. Also visible was the constant, soothing stream of vehicles and vessels entering or leaving Coruscant's atmosphere. Troop transports, freighters hauling military supplies— Holonews transports, 
naval interceptors, ensuring that everything was as it should be. Sir? Kytus turned to face the speaker. Captain Kral Deuce Neville, a male quarren with a distinguished record in starfighter operations, had, like many fellow pilots, made the transfer to naval operations and a command role when his cockpit skills had begun to diminish. Now he wore the blue naval uniform with the same professionalism with which he had worn the garish orange of the X-Wing pilot. But Kytus sometimes wondered if he brought the same enthusiasm to his role as the Anakin Solo's new captain. Kytus nodded, acknowledging that he had heard his captain. Admiral Neothel is coming up, sir, on her personal shuttle. Really? Kytus considered that. Whatever news she brought had to be important enough that it couldn't wait for their next regularly scheduled meeting. Nor could it be committed to the potential insecurity of holocom transmission. Make standard preparations for her arrival, and have security do a sweep of my conference room. Yes, sir. Neville saluted and withdrew. Chapter 14 Neothel barely waited until her GAG security escort was out of the conference room and the door shut behind them before getting to the point. She did not even bother to sit. Sadris Koyan, Corellia's five worlds prime minister, is talking to us about changing sides. Really? Kytus sat and leaned back in his chair. Just betraying the rest of the Confederation, and risking retaliation. My analysts suspect that the boost of hope he might have received when the Hapens withdrew from the war was lost when they isolated themselves from the Confederation again, and that he would much prefer to be on the winning side. She offered a good simulation of a human shrug. It's not inappropriate for his psychological profile. Koyan had been chief of state of the Corellian world of Trollis, but had been elected by a majority, though not unanimous, vote of the other chiefs of state when Dur Gedjan had been assassinated. A member of the aggressive Centerpoint party, he had probably been seen by the other chiefs as the lesser of several evils in the succession scramble that followed Gedjan's death. What are they offering? They want to negotiate with you. You, specifically. We designate a point in space. Any point. Equidistant between Corellia and Coruscant. The two sides bring an equal number of vessels in equivalent class ratings. You and their negotiator can negotiate either face-to-face -face or ship-to-ship -ship through tight-beam transmission. Who is their negotiator? I do not know. Not Koyan? Neothel shook her head. His profile suggests a distinct aversion to being in the company of dangerous people. This is clearly how he has survived so long. I don't like it. No longer even pretending to be at ease, Kytus leaned forward. Even if they give us the opportunity to choose the spot for the meeting, they can communicate that information to a secondary force, as can we, which can then jump to that site and attack. As can we. They have no advantage. Except in insisting that I be there. If their plan is intended to be an attempt on me, then success on their part, even if military losses are equivalent, disrupts our own coalition government, and removes me as a strategic resource for the military. Neothel cocked her head, a gesture of curiosity. You are unusually cautious today. Learning from Koyan himself... Kytus opened his mouth to hurl back a retaliatory remark, 
then closed it again. Neofel was right. He was more cautious, not because of possible danger to himself, but because of danger to Alana. He was not going to let her be more than a few paces from him until the war was resolved. Taking her into the vicinity of what might be a trap was the last thing he wanted to do. On the other hand, Neothel could not be allowed to learn that Kytus's behavior was changing because of concern for the child. So far as she knew, Alana was a hostage, leverage against the Hapen Queen Mother. For Neothel to suspect that Kytus's feelings were more personal, more heartfelt, could endanger both of them if Neothel ever turned against him. Kytus relented, shrugging. Fine. I'll do it. Do you mind if I make an effort not to get killed, when this turns out to be a trap? Do what you need to. I'll have units of the Second Fleet standing by to jump to the talk site, to deal with whatever forces Koyan decides to bring in. As you wish. I'll calm the Corellians with an acceptance. Caius nodded, a gesture of agreement that he meant as one of dismissal as well. Whether she understood that or not, Neofel paused for a moment, looking at him, before turning and leaving. Sanctuary Moon of Endor Jedi Outpost Through the transperistyle of the door separating the waiting room from the infirmary proper, Luke studied Master Katarn's face and listened to the words of Valen and Silgal. Katarn was unconscious, whether from drugs, pain, or voluntary immersion in a Jedi healing trance, Luke couldn't say. His face was flushed, sweating, and he looked as though he'd lost weight in the days he'd been on Coruscant. Silgal managed to impart considerable worry and sympathy into her gravelly Moncal voice. The attack severed two ribs, penetrated his left lung, and exited through his left shoulder blade. A few centimeters off, and it would have gone clean through his heart. He has also contracted the Aflaceria bug, and some opportunistic infections. He is dehydrated and very weak, and traveling so far to get here could not have helped except that it was still a better choice than remaining in hiding on Coruscant. I patched him up as well as I could, as soon as possible after he was injured. Valen sounded morose. But we had to drag him through about a kilometer of filthy pipes before we could do even that. Explosives we planted to seal our escape routes kicked dust into the air. Dust and germs. He shook his head pained by his failure. Basic medical training isn't sufficient for a situation like that. Luke patted his shoulder. You did remarkably well. The fact that he's here alive is proof of that. And if anyone can heal him, it's Silgal. He finally turned away from studying Katarn to look at Valen. The young Jedi Knight was solemn, but not showing evidence of protracted stress or guilt. A good sign. Do you have a full report for me? Valen reached into his belt and removed a data card, which he handed to Luke. I've flagged one or two points of interest on the report. You may want to pay special attention to them. A YVH combat droid that was programmed to get its cargo out of harm's way rather than help its master defend against four Jedi. Mob violence in response to the Aflaceria epidemic, against both state medical officials and people of Kaminori descent. Plus the fact that these reports were suppressed on the Holland News broadcast after they were first reported. Almost as though the GA government isn't whipping the population up into a frenzy about it. Luke pocketed the card. I'll look for those details. He was distracted by a stirring in the force, the imminent arrival of others. 
There was no sense of menace associated with the presentiment, though. He glanced at the two Jedi. Anything else? But the answer came from behind Luke, accompanying a bustle of several moving bodies. Boots creaked, durable uniform cloth rubbed, equipment clattered, and a new voice rose above it all. How about some news from Corellia? Luke turned around to see a half-squadron of pilots headed his way. Wearing sweat-stained orange flight suits, their helmets under their arms, they had to have just come from their starfighters. In front, familiar and reassuring, was Wedge Antilles, sharp-featured and graying. Behind, a step to the right, was Wes Jansen, his alert eyes and broad grin suggesting that he was taking copious mental notes now so that he could engage in a marathon of mockery later. Luke grinned and stepped forward to embrace his two friends. The other four pilots, two men and two women, he recognized as well. Thanks for coming, Wedge. Good to see you, Wes. What news from Corellia? Wedge looked around, noting the presence of Jedi medics and workers in this hallway. Maybe somewhere more private. Three minutes later, a ground-level security door slid open before them, revealing shaded sunlight, as well as a pair of Ewoks in leather caps, stone-headed spears in hand, creeping their way a few meters beyond. As the door slid open, the Ewoks jabbered in surprise, turned, and fled back into the tree line twenty meters away. Wedge snorted. Good neighbors, if you can stay out of their stew pots. Come on. Luke led him out into the fresh air, heavy with the scents of blooming flowers and forest decay. The door rumbled shut behind them. How are Iella and the kids? Iella's great. She's spending her time doing hollow news analysis and passing her conclusions on to me, to Booster, to Talon Card. I'll have her add you to the distribution list if you like. Please. Luke gestured, and the two of them headed in a different direction from that taken by the fleeing Ewoks into the cover of deep forest. I don't hear much from Seal, of course. We're certainly not estranged, but since she's serving with Alliance forces, still on the Blue Diver, and I'm an official enemy of the Alliance and an unofficial target of the Confederation, I don't get much news of her. Miri is still on the air adventure, gathering information to pass along to us, and making a fortune gambling. He shook his head in mock distress. She's going to be the first rich Antilles, and not from following an honest career. I don't know what to think of it. How's Ben? Better than I have any right to expect. They were deep enough in the trees to be out of hearing range of anyone at the outpost, though still close enough to see bits of it through the screen of hanging branches and vines. So. So Corellia. A good friend of mine. A Space Navy lifer with the Corellian Defense Force. He's ninety, been retired for a few years. Was just returned to active duty and assigned a recommissioned Carrot-class cruiser. Luke offered Wedge a dubious expression. A Carrot? What's next? Are the Corellians going to start throwing cans of food at the Alliance fleets? Yes. It sounds like they're shoring up depleted units with increasing desperation. But there's more to it. My old friend is going to be part of a special diplomatic mission to talk to the G.A., a hush-hush negotiation that General Fenner, Supreme Commander of the Confederation Military Forces, wasn't informed of beforehand. Scuttlebutt has it that when he inquired about it with the Corellians, they told him that it was just a delaying tactic, something to distract Colonel Solo for a few days. Now Fenner's people don't know if that's the truth, or if the Corellians are going to try to spring some sort of trap and kill Solo so they can claim the glory and have a bargaining advantage to give them even more influence within the Confederation. 
or whether they're thinking of switching sides. Luke frowned. Where does the scuttlebutt come from in this case? Wedge ticked numbers off on his fingers. One, the granddaughter of my old friend. She got in touch with me by backdoor means to find out if there was any way I could talk her grandfather out of accepting the reactivation of his commission. Two, a pilot formerly under my command, now on Fenner's staff, querying me about what the Corellian Prime Minister is up to, since I'm obviously a neutral party. Three, so it all amounts to this guy I know. Wedge nodded. The fate of galactic civilization might someday hang on an intelligence network consisting of this guy I know. Thanks for scaring me. Luke opened himself to the Force for a moment, but the future remained impossibly distant and unclear. All he could detect was the abundance of life around him, including the two Ewoks creeping in his direction. Their emotions consisted largely of curiosity and nervousness, rather than malice or hunger, so he concluded that attack was not on their minds. If this guy I know could figure out where Jason is going to be and when, it could prove very valuable to us. We have a means to track his movements, but that leaves us very reactive. He goes, and if we respond in time, we can follow him. To anticipate his movements would be ideal. Two days until the meeting with the Corellians. Two days at a halfway point between Corellia and Coruscant. But that's still a lot of space to cover. Wedge frowned, calculating. In two days, if you could have a Stealth X shadow the Anakin Solo out of the Coruscant system, that might give us the exact coordinates. Her course, plus knowledge that the destination will be identical in distance from there to Corellia as well. Right. If we're lucky and he doesn't send the Anakin Solo through an elaborate multiple-leg course, I doubt he will. Whether it is one or not, he has to suspect that it's a trap. Why worry about elaborate routing when you're going directly to the adversary anyway? True. Luke nodded. I'll send out a stealth X immediately. He turned back toward the outpost and led them in that direction. Wedge, it's good to have you here. Speaking of which, no, you're not being paid. Wedge laughed. Just like the rebellion days. No, I was going to say you've brought me in for military advice. You're acquiring personnel and materiel. You have a base of operations and an agenda that involves interacting with two major galactic powers. Has it occurred to you that you're setting up a third government here? No. Well, you are. The Jedi are now a cross-planetary, self-governing body. And you're their chief of state. You might need to start thinking along those lines. Huh. You want the job? No. If it lands on me, I'll give it to Booster Tarek. He'll figure out a way to get us paid. Aboard the Anakin Solo Titus relaxed in his command salon, away from the bustle and noise of the bridge, waiting for the exit from Coruscant space and the short hyperspace jump to the rendezvous point with the Corellian task force. He would have preferred to pass the time in one of two secret rooms near his quarters, Alana's playroom, or his cramped workshop, where finally he was finding the time to build his new lightsaber. It would be a proper lightsaber, with a red blade, the better to announce his new role as Lord of the Sith. Though when it would be time to make that declaration, he still did not know. The monitor before him, showing nothing but stars and tiny fast-moving dots that constituted traffic inbound toward Coruscant, suddenly switched to the face of Lieutenant Tebut. A dark-haired human woman, with a quiet, no-nonsense manner and an imposing air of efficiency, 
she had, like all officers aboard the Anakin Solo, survived the most intensive security vetting the guard could conduct. A candidate for promotion to the position of executive officer, she had, with Captain Neville's blessing, begun a program of mastering every bridge officer's duty. And today, she was at the communications officer's station. Kytus approved of both her ambition and her breadth of skills. The pilot reports readiness for hyperspace jump, Tebut reported. But we're being hailed by a private yacht, identifying itself as Love Commander. Kytus grimaced and briefly considered blowing the vehicle out of space. But no, Lando was only nearly useless, and the old gambler's instinct for self-preservation meant that he often had some helpful information at hand. Kytus pressed a button so that his next words would also go to Captain Neville. All stop. He released it and looked at the monitor again. Put her captain through to me. He waited just long enough for the picture on his display to change from Tebut's face before he began talking. Calrissian, give me one good reason. But the face that materialized on the display was not that of Lando Calrissian. It was Leia Organa Solo. Mother. Leia gave him a slight smile. It seemed to Kytus to be a very sad one. Oh, I'm not Mom anymore? Not really, no. What do you need? I'm in a bit of a hurry. I need to speak to you. And without father? Kytus frowned. Where is the falcon? Back on Kashyyyk, putting out fires. Fires you started. Yes. Fires to punish an enemy of the Alliance. As I must point out, you are an enemy of the Alliance. Is there some reason I shouldn't start a fire in that ridiculous yacht of Lando's right now? The same reason as before. I need to talk to you. That's your need, not mine. Leia simply stared at him. Silent. Implacable. She had to be up to something. Kytus tried to detect what he could of her through the Force. He could sense her, a bright and distinctive presence, alone on the yacht. Interesting. So Han wasn't with her. Nor were there any strangers present. No assassins who might be targeting him. No hapens come to retrieve Alana. Well, he'd simply take her aboard listen to what she had to say, and then throw her in prison, ending the danger she posed to his administration. Han would come after her, and Kytus would throw Han in prison too. Suddenly he felt cheered by his mother's unexpected visit. He sighed as if giving in. Very well. Come aboard my personal hangar bay. You'll be escorted to the command salon. Understood. Chapter 15 Minutes later, two security guards entered the command salon with Leia between them. They presented a ridiculous picture. Two tall men in crisp uniforms, their buckles, buttons, visors, and blasters gleaming, flanking a diminutive graying woman in plain Jedi robes. Still, Kytus didn't think Leia looked diminished enough. She needed to be in restraints, her lightsaber missing from her belt, her expression crestfallen, her eyes defeated. She needed to be suffering for all her misbehavior since the conflict with Corellia began. Well, reality would match his imagination soon enough. He gestured at the guards and they spun and left the salon. The door shut behind them. He didn't bother to keep impatience and indifference out of his voice. Well? Leia looked him over. Clearly, the visual image he presented 
a tall, dangerous force user in all black garments and cloak, was again reminding her of her father more than her son, and Kytus enjoyed having discomfited her. But she didn't let what she was feeling be reflected in her face or voice. Jason, it's time for you to look at yourself. I'm well aware of what I look like, Mother. I have to cultivate my image carefully for Holonu's appearances. I'm not talking about your looks. I'm talking about your life. He sighed. You know, I was actually hoping you would come up with some exciting, imaginative new argument to sway me from my path. Not that it has a chance of succeeding. But it would be more entertaining. Don't you have some new heart-wrenching appeal? Some brilliant metaphor to hurl at me and cause me to double over in the anguish of guilt to reevaluate my whole ethical structure? She shook her head, and there was no missing the sadness in her eyes. All I have is the truth and the memory of who you used to be. He pressed a button on the arm of his chair. The door behind Leia slid open. You're wasting my time. Leave now. She glanced at the button, and it clicked down without Kytus' help. The door slid closed again. You no longer have time for me? Which you? The mother you used to be, or the interplanetary criminal you've become? I'm not the only one who's changed. History decides who's a criminal, Jason. Finally, real irritation began to stir within Kytus, and he rose to the argument. No, the law decides who's a criminal. History just forgives them, and for reasons as stupid as they are varied. Han Solo was a spice smuggler an unapologetic lawbreaker. You, even when you were a teenager, were a traitor to the legitimate galactic government, a conspirator planning war and overthrow. The puppet government you put in place may have forgiven you both, but you'll be criminals for the rest of your lives. Her expression graduated to scorn. Have you ever studied Darth Vader? Clearly you got your intelligence and your political acumen from your grandfather. He nodded. There, we are in agreement. In the private hangar bay set aside for the use of Anakin Solo's commander, a team of security specialists, carrying standard scanning gear, walked down the yacht's boarding ramp. Moments after the last one reached the hangar floor, the ramp rose into place, sealing the yacht. Jaina Solo, stretched out on her back in an oppressively enclosed space, watched them leave. She did not watch them directly, but through the portable monitor she held in her hands. A shielded data feed led from the device into the metal wall of this smuggling compartment. Beside her, Han stirred, but did not open his eyes. Are they gone? Jaina twisted a dial at the bottom of the screen, flipping its view through all of the Love Commander's exterior holocam feeds. No, they're walking the yacht perimeter, doing a final scan. Irritated, she checked her chrono. How long can Mom keep Jason distracted? Han shrugged. Hard to guess. My estimate is that he's not going to fall for guilt. But he's pretty reactionary these days. If she can push the right argument buttons, he'll be defending his politics and decisions from now until his next birthday. How is that going to make Mom feel? Han's expression turned sad. How do you think? An ominous scratching sounded from the far end of the compartment. Jaina looked past her feet to the cage situated there on the compartment floor. 
a cube one meter in each dimension. It was made of thin, brightly painted durasteel bars. Within it was a jagged piece of polymer shaped like a stunted tree bowl, and holding onto the sculpture was a reptile, a little over a meter long, greenish, with two sets of clawed legs and a long tail. It stared at them as if waiting for a reply to its statement. Jaina wrinkled her nose at it. I hate that thing. It was an Isalamir, a lizard from the world of Mirkur, one of a species that had long ago evolved the ability to project an invisible bubble of force energy in counterbalance to the force all around it, making everything inside its border undetectable by force sensitives outside its range. So long as Jaina and Han and Zek and Jag in the next compartment remained nearby, Jason could not detect them. Of course, force sensitives within the bubble were blind to the force while they remained there. Han's voice turned mocking. Poor little girl. Suddenly has to rely on just her sight, hearing, and wits. It's still like losing one of your senses. Just like her old man. He opened an eye and peered down at the reptile. He waved. Hang on there, little guy. I'll get you back to card when we're all done here. As if in response, the Isalamir flicked out its tongue for a fraction of a second. Movement on the monitor drew Jaina's attention. Sensor crew is leaving, but there are still two guards on the exit, and two just outside. Han leaned over to peer at the monitor. Got the hangar holocams picked out? Jaina nodded. Yeah. I don't want to force flash them constantly, but we can use blind spots between parked vehicles a lot of the time. And we have one piece of real luck. Jason's shuttle is right here, in this hangar. Let's go. Han exerted himself against the durasteel panel directly overhead, and it swung open, admitting cool air from the Love Commander's atmosphere conditioners. They executed their plan in several stages, each accomplished very quickly and with the precision that only Jedi and someone like Han Solo could manage. Silently, the four exited the Love Commander through a cargo hatch in the blind spot between her starboard side and the mass of maintenance machinery immediately beside her. Jaina, carrying the electronics package whose construction had been supervised by Iella Antilles, a package now disguised as a mouse droid, reached a wall data jack and plugged the package in. Its code optimized not only for this task, but for this specific vessel as well, sampled hangar holocom feeds, looped them, and extracted visual glitches such as glow rod flickers that might alert viewers they were watching a recording. Then the programming subverted security measures, not the ship's main programming, just those pertaining to the holocams, and began sending the looped recordings instead of the live feeds to the bridge. Next, as Han and Jag covered the door from concealed positions, Jaina and Zek rushed the guards there. The advantage of surprise allowed them to cross meters of distance before the guards could bring their blaster rifles into line, and a few swift blows put them down. The Jedi dragged them aside, out of sight of the door. The third stage was just as potentially dangerous and just as successful. The four of them positioned themselves out of sight of the hangar doors, two to either side, and then opened them. They heard a surprised exchange from the guards there, but no footsteps suggesting additional traffic out in the corridor. Blaster rifles at the ready, the two guards stepped into the hangar. As the pair caught sight of the intruders in their peripheral vision, Jag hit the button to shut the doors. Jaina and Zek stepped forward and launched attacks. Jaina's kick took her target clean off his feet, breaking ribs despite his chest armor and sending him into deep unconsciousness. But Zek's opponent, clearly an experienced hand-to-hand -hand combatant, blocked Zek's punch with his rifle butt and swung the barrel around to fire. So Han shot him in the face. 
his blaster pistol was set on stun, and the guard merely spasmed and fell. Zack breathed a relieved sigh, not at the removal of danger, but at his opponent's size. This one's big enough. Get into his armor and get going. Jaina took up her ersatz mouse droid and headed toward Jason's shuttle. Despite what Dad says, we can't guess how long Mom's distraction will give us. Yes, boss. Han helped Zek strip the armor from the tallest guard and don it. He lowered his voice to a whisper so Jaina would not hear. I'm used to her being intense, but I don't think I've seen her flash a smile in, I don't know, months. She hasn't. She's lost a lot since this war began. Leia's lost just as much, and Leia can still smile. Leia knows that she has to from time to time, or go crazy. I don't think it's a problem anymore, Han. I think Jag got through to her. Han glanced over at his daughter, who, having cracked the shuttle door's security, was just entering that vehicle. I hope you're right. Zek stood and swept his long hair up to the top of his head, holding it there while Han put the last piece of armor, his helmet, in place. Zek pulled the helmet down low and picked up the guard's blaster rifle. Next stop, tractor beams, and the installation of some very specialized holocom gear. Han gave him a lopsided smile. Jason's going to get sick of people improving his ship. Good. So if you believe that Palpatine's rule as emperor was legitimate, you have to believe that any government, no matter how destructive, is legitimate. Leia practically spat the words out. Why did we bother taking back Coruscant from the Yuzhan Vong? By your figuring, they were the legitimate rulers of the galaxy. Kaidas stirred, irritated, but did not rise. That's not what I said, and don't put words in my mouth. Palpatine worked within the system to gain prominence. That establishes a continuity of government. That's part of the legitimacy. What you did with the rebels, like what the Yuzhan Vong did, was come in like an agricultural planet former, digging up and destroying everything in its path. A second set of doors the ones leading forward to the bridge, opened. Lieutenant Tebat stood there, looking momentarily surprised to have interrupted the heated exchange between two of the most famous people in the galaxy. Grateful for the reprieve, Kaidus swiveled his chair toward her. Yes? We've dropped out of hyperspace, Colonel. We're at the negotiation site. Thank you. Kaidus rose. Come to the bridge, mother. In the unlikely event that this is not some sort of trap by your Confederation friends, you might witness a successful negotiation for their legitimate return to the Galactic Alliance. Leia accompanied him to the door. I can't root for either result. You don't deserve to negotiate and benefit from a peace— and I don't want to be here if it's a trap. Behind Tebat, they walked through into the bridge and were assailed by all its usual noise, chatter of officers at their stations in the pits to either side of the main walkway, the hum of computers and other machinery, the distorted and modulated voices of personnel coming across comm frequencies and intercoms. Kaidus marched up the walkway to the vast viewports at the bow end, he could see the hull of the Anakin Solo stretching away below and before him, with the domes of its gravity well generators protruding like habitat shells and the distant, slightly irregular shapes of enemy ships among the unwinking stars. Report The officer in the sensor station, a woman with a Coruscanti accent, called up, They dropped out of hyperspace thirty seconds after we did. Their numbers match ours, ship for ship. We're running data on the ships themselves. The Anakin Solo's opposite number is the star destroyer Valorum. Valorum? Kytus's surprise was genuine. 
intelligence, best guess. Did they name her for one of Palpatine's political opponents to goad me? No, sir. The man at the intelligence station was dark-skinned. Though young, he was completely bald, and his accent suggested worlds of the unknown regions. That was her original name upon launch, about sixty years ago. She's Victory Class, from the last years of the Old Republic. Titus turned to his mother. Ancient hardware. They're getting desperate. Leia nodded. Which affects the chances of this being a legitimate negotiation and a trap equally. So it's information, but not informative. Stop trying to teach me politics, mother. I've already attained the highest rank you ever did, and I'm not done yet. Except that I attained it by being elected to it, not by rewriting the law and jailing my predecessor. Kytus turned away, shaking his head. Leia was deluded if she thought there was a meaningful difference. Communications. Has the enemy initiated calm contact? Lieutenant Tebut, back at her station, nodded. Yes, sir. They've sent routine greetings and asked for you. Let them wait. Have we established contact with the Blue Diver? Yes, sir. Put her on hollow. A moment later, a hologram swam into resolution before Kytus and Leia. It showed a female of the Duros people, with bluish skin, large red eyes, and a lipless slit for a mouth with no nose above it. She wore a white admiral's uniform. She nodded to Kytus. Colonel. Recognizing Leia, she nodded again, her voice taking on a slight note of surprise. Jedi Solo. No, Admiral Limpen. Sadly, my mother has not seen the light of reason and rejoined the Alliance. Are you on station? We are. Kytus glanced his mother's way. I plan no violation of the terms of our meeting today, mother. But if they spring a trap, I have elements of the Second Fleet standing by to jump in as a little surprise. Speaking of surprises, Admiral, if our holocom contact is broken for more than fifteen seconds, consider that authorization to jump in. They could always manage some sort of sabotage or jamming to break contact between us. Understood, sir. Anakin Solo standing by. The hologram of Admiral Limpen vanished. Kytus's data pad tweedled, indicating that he had received a message, and the intelligence officer called, That's the breakdown of enemy forces, sir. All old ships, some of them nearly derelicts. Some are still listed as decommissioned. Kytus didn't bother to read the listing. Very good. Communications. Put the enemy commander on. Let's get this farce moving. There was no hologram this time. The Valorum was either too old to have a holotransmitter, or too strapped for resources to use one. Monitors all over the bridge, including those near the bow viewports, flickered simultaneously to show an aging woman, long-faced, in the uniform of a Corellian Defense Force captain. Kytus moved up to stand before one of the monitors. Tebut nodded to him to let him know its holocam was now broadcasting. Kytus allowed a little discontent to creep into his voice. A captain? They sent only a naval captain for this negotiation? Captain Hawklaw. The Corellian woman gave him a nod of mock-friendly greeting. Technically, you're a colonel, as I recall, but we both have the power and authority to enter into binding negotiations. I suppose. So you're prepared to surrender? I'm prepared to come to the best agreement that is in everyone's interest, involving the Corellian system's return to the Alliance. But if your first words are going to be... 
So you're prepared to surrender? This could take even longer than it has to. I see you're standing. Perhaps you should summon a chair. Kytus could see that Captain Hawklaw was seated in a comfortably padded officer's chair at the back of her bridge. Thank you, no. Let's begin. Chapter 16 Jag and Han got the panel covering the main motivators for the hangar exterior doors down and to the floor, revealing the machinery beyond. Jag shook his head. I do fine with mechanical gear, but I prefer to have manuals and charts on hand. Jaina's better at this sort of thing than I am. Han smiled in combined pride and self-appreciation. Don't worry. She got it from me. He pointed a long, calloused forefinger at an expansive cluster of chips. The main security module will be there. We just have to figure out which chip. Out of, oh, three hundred or so. Sure, no problem. Han took a moment to wave at his daughter, who was visible in the bridge viewpoint of Jason's shuttle, then bent for his toolkit. Just stand back and learn something. Alone, all but forgotten except by a black-clad guardsman at the door into the command salon who watched her every movement, Leia stood listening to the exchange between her son and the Corellian captain. Frowning, she moved to a monitor at the stern end of the bridge and leaned in so close that her right ear was adjacent to the device's main speaker. She shook her head and returned to the center of the bridge walkway, then stepped clean off of it, dropping nimbly to land beside the bald-headed intelligence officer who had been providing Jason with data. Rather than being alarmed, he offered her a sardonic smile. Is this an attack? If it were, it would be over by now. Can you give me an isolated audio feed of just the Corellian side of the transmission, so I can hear it without all this ambient noise? I could, of course, but I won't. Technically, you're a prisoner of war. You mean I'm the enemy? Yes, that's what I mean. I'm also Colonel Solo's mother, and this vessel was named for my other son. I don't want to see either one destroyed, which might happen if my worst-case suspicions turn out to be true and I don't get some cooperation. The officer looked at her for a long moment, then sighed. Over Leia's shoulder he called, Tebut! Isolation helmet, please. Tebut opened a cabinet drawer beside her station and withdrew a helmet. Not a piece of protective gear for pilots. It was smaller, smoother, with a full-face polarizing visor. She lobbed it to the intelligence officer, who set it beside his monitor, typed a pair of commands on his keyboard, and then handed it to Leia. She donned it and immediately heard Captain Hawklaw speaking. Asking us to bear a tremendously disproportionate burden of the cost of rebuilding. If I agree to the numbers you suggest, the Corellian system would be reduced to poverty for generations. There was a long pause. No, that's not justice. That's vindictiveness. And it presupposes that the entire burden of blame— that every wrong done in the course of these events should be laid at the feet of the Corellian government. There was no other noise, no background conversation, no clattering of fingers across keyboards. Hastily, Leia removed the helmet. Can you send a message, a text message, to Jason's monitor so he can read it, but Captain Hawklaw can't see it? Of course. Here's my message. She told him, and as the words registered, she could see his instant decision to send the message on to his commander. Impatient, Jaina glanced at her chrono. 
Leia had to be doing a magnificent job of delaying Jason, but even so they couldn't stay here forever. Her mouse droid had drunk in much of the raw telemetry data from the shuttle's memory, but there was plenty more to go. She saw Jag turn away from helping her father, and blaster pistol drawn, trot over to the hangar's internal doors. He keyed a command to open them, and stayed to one side, pistol aimed. But it was Zek, still in alliance armor, who marched in. As soon as the doors slid shut again, the tall Jedi relaxed. Talking with Jag, he caught sight of Jaina. Fist upraised, he waved to her, a gesture of success. She nodded. One more task down. But they couldn't relax, couldn't lose focus, could never, ever lose focus. As Kytus continued expressing his very reasonable demands, words appeared at the bottom of his monitor screen. Jedi Solo reports no bridge or personnel noises in enemy transmission. Communications has analyzed and confirms. Suggests enemy command ship bears only skeleton crew or is automated. Despite the distraction, Kytus did not miss the import of Captain Hawklaw's last words. He adopted a look of mild confusion. Step down? Why would I? Because if you do, we might be able to transform this conversation from a simple negotiation to a genuine peace. We might bring an end to this war. I could take the fact of your cooperation to the Confederation as a whole. My sources tell me that a concession like that would earn a lot of favor within the Confederation. Kytus felt a flash of irritation. That's not on the table, Captain. He was also growing impatient. Why had the Confederates not sprung their trap? Perhaps they would not until it became clear that the negotiations could not, would not, succeed. Well, he could make them aware of that right now. Captain, you've heard my terms. I will not budge on any of them. In fact, as I grow annoyed with you, I will make them harsher. I'll give you ten standard minutes to accept them as is. If you do not, when we begin talking again, you'll be in a worse bargaining position. He switched off the monitor, and Tebat, alert, cut the transmission altogether. Kytus turned. The bridge walkway behind him was empty. Where is my... Where is Jedi Solo? The intelligence officer gestured toward the doors at the stern end of the bridge. The guard there accompanied her back into the command salon. Ah. Kytus concealed the sudden chill those words stabbed into his heart. I'll be back in ten minutes. At a trot, Darth Kytus headed aft for what he hoped would not be a confrontation with his mother. Center Point Station, Fire Control Chamber As with every such enterprise, the use of an unbelievably complicated, incalculably important piece of machinery in the hands of the military, the involved parties were divided into groups, each of them secretly condescending to an uncomprehending of the others. In the control areas of this large chamber, where consoles, keyboards, monitors, readouts, and data jacks predominated, technicians were hard at work. They analyzed energy throughputs, calculated damage to systems from anticipated energy spikes, theorized about side effects, and discussed recent hypotheses about the physics of gravity. In one open area where once a twice-human-height droid that had believed it was Anakin Solo had lived, and died, military officers in the uniforms of the Corellian Defense Force now waited. One of them, a woman in white instead of the lower-ranking browns, irritably consulted her chrono. Tall and broad-shouldered, she had an intelligent expression and a gaze that moved everywhere in the chamber. 
cataloging hundreds of details and events. The third group, nearest the doors leading out of this chamber, was made up of government representatives. Sadrus Koyan, a short, burly man with thinning hair and an aggressive manner, had a gaze as sweeping and restless as that of the white-uniformed woman. But he seemed less to be registering details than waiting for some signal to satisfy his impatience. Beside him stood Denjack Stepler, a younger man with bland but confidence-inspiring features. Tepler had worn many occupational hats since the crisis had begun in Corellia. He was now Minister of Information, a post disparagingly and accurately referred to in other offices as Minister of Propaganda. Around these two men were arrayed aides and advisers, all dressed in expensive, subdued business garments that were so similar in style that they, too, might as well have been uniforms. Finally, Coyan's patience broke. "'What's the hold-up, Admiral Delpin?' The woman in the white uniform moved toward him, stopping at the edge of her group as though it were an invisible national border. "'Sim firings are suggesting an unacceptable chance of catastrophic failure. We're locking down and locking out the subsystems that are most likely to be damaged by overloads, it's just a matter of a few minutes. Solo is going to jump out of there before we can even get the thing online. Tepler shook his head. I don't think so, sir. Captain Hawklaw says they're in a brief break between conversations. But that Colonel Solo is giving Hawklaw so much to work with, she could probably stall him until her next birthday. Oh. Mollified, Koyan nodded. All right, then. One of the technicians at the control board nodded in response to something he heard over his earpiece. He turned and flashed five fingers at Admiral Delpin. She, in turn, caught Koyan's eye. Five minutes. Koyan nodded and mopped sweat from his forehead and cheeks with his sleeve. Good. Star System MZX-32905, near Bimiel. Alima wondered about worshippers. Now that she was a goddess, she should have some. At the moment, of course, she did not look very goddess-like. She sat in the topmost chamber of Lumia's former habitat, the chamber with the curved, bookcase-laden walls and transparent steel dome, in a ridiculously comfortable stuffed chair, in her old body, the crippled one. In moments, though, she would shed that body again, float free through the galaxy, restore balance to the universe, and please herself. How stupid Lumia had been to use this gift to further some ancient Sith agenda. Speaking of the Sith, she would have to deal with them soon. Once she had reduced Leia to a tearful, useless wreck, as she imagined Luke now to be, she would turn her attention to Korriban and begin to exterminate the dangerous pest colony the Sith enclave there constituted. It would take time. Her last projection to Kashyyyk had tired her immensely. She had slept for days afterward. That would probably be true again this time, but Lumia's notes had made it clear that with practice came stamina. Alima relaxed, closing her eyes, and invited the immense pool of dark power waiting hundreds of meters below her, in the asteroid proper, to ascend to her, to flow through her. She stiffened, as she felt the power grope its way blindly toward where she reclined. As it washed across her, it seemed to be half hot waterfall, half galvanizing electric current, but too full of malicious emotion to be cleansing or refreshing. It imparted to her a sense of greater power and destiny, yes, but it was also an invasion of herself, 
and that part of it she did not relish. Now, fully intermingled with the dark power, she set her mind adrift, looking for familiar presences in the Force. She knew where to start looking, at the cluster of presences where long-life patience warred with animalistic strength and rage. The world of the Wookiees. But Han and Leia were not among those presences. Vexed, Alima broadened her search. Minutes passed, with each minute taxing her personal energy further. And then she found them, not together, but close by each other, with thousands of lives around them. But only thousands, not millions or billions. That suggested they were on a ship somewhere between worlds. She propelled herself to be near them, then went looking among the other presences, the other glows in the force, for one that would be suitable. Some radiated too brightly. They would be too strong for her to merge with. Others were too dim. They would not anchor her as she needed to be anchored. One stood out. It was bright with power, but very pure, not marked by anger or sophistication. She circled in toward it, charmed by its simplicity, its innocence. As she touched it, she decided that it was a child, a human girl, asleep. The child stirred as Alima reached her, almost coming awake, but Alima poured out comforting thoughts through the Force, emotions of safety and security, of being in the nest, surrounded by thousands like her, all clicking and whirring on their many legs, all nearly identical. Her emotions did not so much soothe as stifle the child. But that was enough. Alima wrapped herself around the girl. Now she was fixed in that place. She had a base from which to go hunting. She went looking for Han Solo. Aboard the Anakin Solo Kytus strode into his command salon. Only officers were there. Where are Jedi Solo and the guard? Captain Neville pointed toward the stern doors out of the salon. Princess Leia asked for some privacy. The guard accompanied her to your private office. The chill in Kytus's heart intensified. Without answering, he dashed toward the doors. Moments later, he entered his private office. The guard, a muscular man with yellow skin, was there, slumped in Kytus's desk chair, unconscious. A bruise was already beginning to appear on his chin. Leia was nowhere to be seen. Kytus shoved him and the rolling chair aside, hearing but not looking as the chair toppled and deposited the guard on the floor. Kytus brought up his desk monitor and clicked it over instantly to his secret chambers, where Alana now lived. There she was, curled up on a little daybed. Nearby, an entertainment monitor flickered, unwatched, its screen displaying an entertainment broadcast in which Ewoks spoke basic and befriended shipwrecked little girls. Kytus tensed, remembering the deception he had perpetrated in Tenelka's palace, but saw her features and relaxed. This was the real Alana. He thumbed his comlink to life. Security. Find Jedi Solo and report her location to me. At once, sir. But it wasn't at once. Thirty agonizingly long seconds went by. Then the voice returned. Sir, she's approaching your personal hangar bay. Alone? Alone, sir. Alert the guards there. Secure both the internal and external bay doors. If she tries to perform a bypass on the internal doors or begins to cut through them with her lightsaber, unsecure the outer doors, open them, and vent the hangar to space. I doubt she'll want to play in hard vacuum. Yes, sir. There was a pause. Doors secured remotely, sir. But the door guards aren't responding. There's no sign of them on Holocam. 
thoughts clicked through Kytus's mind like sabbat cards going through an automated shuffler. She was under observation until moments ago, so she couldn't have gotten rid of the guards herself. Conclusion, she has allies aboard, or she smuggled in allies on her yacht, probably the latter. She doesn't have Alana, so Alana was not the goal of her mission. He pulled out his datapad and used it to transmit a query to YVH-908, the combat droid serving as Alana's bodyguard. The droid sent back an immediate response, indicating no intrusions, no problems. But to be sure, Titus moved to the wall panel concealing the secret door that led to those chambers. It opened before him, and he stepped through into one of the best-kept secrets aboard ship. The narrow corridor led aft to a succession of small rooms that almost no one living knew about. A few steps later, another door opened for him, presenting him with the same happy view of Alana he had seen on his monitor. She opened her eyes, groggy, and yawned. No more work? I'm sorry. Lots more work. But I wanted to stop in to look at you. I dreamed there was a lady here. Well, have another good dream. I'll be back soon. He smiled, then stepped out again and let the door shut behind him. No, Alana had not been Leia's objective. So what is? Sabotage of the long-range turbolasers? Surely she knows that Luke took care of them. They won't be repaired for weeks or months. Engineering. Commence a tiered diagnostic scan of all the ship's combat and sensor systems. Yes, sir. The security officer's voice crackled across his comlink almost immediately. Sir Jedi Solo reached the bay doors. We had them locked down, but they opened right up for her, and she walked in. Holocam image inside doesn't show her. The holocams must have been subverted. Titus hissed in frustration. Vent the outer doors immediately. We did, sir. Issued the command, I mean. The system acknowledged, but exterior holocams show the doors still shut. Bring up all weapons. Prepare to blast that yacht to plasma the instant it launches. Remembering the stratagem he'd used on Hapes, Kytus felt a new fear. Perhaps Leia and accomplices had brought a bomb aboard. He never would have suspected it of her, but the idea had a beautiful simplicity to it. A sufficiently large explosion in his private hangar would cripple or destroy the Anakin Solo. Worse, it would harm or kill Alana. He spun, re-entered the room he had just left, and smiled down at his daughter. I was wrong. Work is done for a little while. Let's go for a fun ride. Center Point Station. Fire Control Chamber. The chief technician's voice was quiet and somber. Anakin Solo imprinting lockout bypasses are holding. Energy charge is holding. Targeting system is holding. We read ready. Admiral Delpin nodded. Acknowledge ready. She turned Coyne's way. We await your authorization to launch. Coyne gulped. Launch authorized. Admiral Delpin, I also authorize you to fire the weapon. Don't wait for me to authorize. Fire when you think the moment is perfect. Acknowledged. Delpin raised her comlink. Force Yimmy, move in. Force Zex, all squadrons, make your jump and commence your attack. She paused long enough to hear two confirmations, then turned back toward Koyan. We're committed. Chapter 17 Aboard the Anakin Solo
The little personnel speeder, Kytus at the controls, hurtled down the main passageway of the Anakin Solo, causing crew members, uniformed pilots, and civilian observers to leap cursing out of its way. In the passenger's seat, strapped down tight, Alana laughed. A child's throaty chuckle Kytus could hear even over the roar of the repulsor lifts. Ordinarily, he would have been charmed. Now he was simply alarmed. He would remain so until he was off the Anakin Solo and away from whatever it was Leia had brought aboard. Nor could he leave in the vehicles he knew and trusted most, his shuttle and Tahiri's stealth X. They were in the same hangar as Leia's yacht so he raced toward the main starfighter bay. He'd take out something fast and well defended, and stay far enough away from the Anakin Solo that Alana would remain safe if a bomb detonated aboard. He hadn't forgotten his negotiations with Captain Hawklaw, but they were no longer important. He sideslipped into a pedestrian downramp, causing a half-squad of infantry to dive over a railing to avoid him. Alana laughed again. He glanced at her and forced a smile. Having fun? Lots of fun. Can I drive? Next time, sweetie. Finally, there they were, double doors leading into the main starfighter bay. They slid aside at his approach. He roared in, clearing mechanics standing on either side of the door by a handspan. He glanced at the arrayed ranks of starfighters, old and new, trusted and experimental, and veered toward the line of various TIE series. One in particular, an experimental design he'd flown once, drew his eye. The prototype TIE reconnaissance fighter, nicknamed the Blur by GA pilots, resembled the old TIE bomber. It had low-profile, curved solar array wings and two cylindrical fuselages mounted side by side, making the vessel look curiously like a pair of macrobinoculars mounted between a pair of cupped hands. Unlike the situation with the original bomber, the port side pod on the blur was an electronics housing, carrying a modern-era hyperdrive, astro-navigation computers, a shield generator, life support systems, and sophisticated electronic countermeasures. It was the closest thing to a stealth X to come out of Sinar, its manufacturer. This blur was painted in black, undecorated except for small Galactic Alliance symbols on the outer wings. Kytus slewed to a stop beside the blur and was unstrapping Alana as a mechanic ran up to him. Can I help you, sir? Kytus lifted Alana out of her seat. I'm taking the blur out. Oh, uh, yes, sir. But Captain Olavi is doing a test run in fifteen minutes. A sweep near the Confederation Task Force... Push it back. Not waiting for a boarding ladder, Kytus leapt atop the blur and lifted the boarding hatch. You fill out the forms for me. Yes, sir. Kytus's comlink beeped. Carefully, he clambered with Alana down into the cockpit, pulled the hatch shut, and settled into the pilot's couch before answering. Yes. It was his sensor officer. Sir, sixteen squadrons of starfighters have dropped out of hyperspace. They're heading toward us at full speed. The Confederation capital ships are also moving in. Signal Admiral Limpen. Tell her to bring her task force in now. Launch all starfighters from all vessels. As he spoke, Kytus powered up the blur and glanced his way through an abbreviated pre-flight checklist. Move the Anakin Solo to the rear of our formation, and do not, repeat, do not bring up our shields until the last possible moment, or until the diagnostics that are running pronounce them safe, whichever comes first. Yes, sir. I'm launching now. Alana in his lap, Kytus finished pulling webbing tight over the two of them, then activated the blur's repulsors. In his haste, he caused the vehicle nearly to jump up off the hangar floor. Alarms filled the air, and suddenly mechanics were everywhere, running to the squadrons of starfighters in the hangar, prepping them for the imminent arrival of pilots. The glow rods surrounding the main hangar doors in the floor lit up, 
signifying that the atmosphere containment field had been activated. The doors themselves began to draw aside, revealing Starfield below. Kytus didn't wait for them to finish opening. He banked across and dropped through the half-opened portal, eliciting a squeal of delight from Alana. And then he was outside, away from the life-threatening explosion he was sure the Anakin Solo represented. Kytus breathed easier for a minute. Outside, surrounded by hard vacuum with enemy starfighters and capital ships racing in his direction— at last he felt safe. Aboard the Anakin Solo, Jason Solo's private hangar. Leia marched through the doors, and Jag hit a series of buttons on the keypad beside them, closing and locking them. Han, visible through the viewport of the Love Commander cockpit, waved. Then his voice crackled across the comlink. Sweetheart, get aboard. We've got it, and it's time to fly. Leia put on a force-augmented burst of speed and dashed up the yacht's boarding ramp. She heard Jag hurrying in her wake. Zek was just inside the yacht's main cabin, standing by to seal the exit hatch. Leia moved forward to the cockpit, where Han occupied the pilot seat, Jaina the co-pilots. Leia dropped into the captain's chair, which Lando formerly had occupied. We're in deep space, about halfway between Coruscant and Corellia. Jason's occupied talking to the Corellians. Now might be the time to go. Han half turned and cocked his head at her. Maybe, maybe not. They've already tried to lock you out, lock us in, and depressurize this hangar. They don't want us to leave. The question is, are they tractor beam angry or turbo laser angry? Good question. But Zek disabled the tractor beam. In the manner of a cantina drink hustler, Leia batted her eyes at her husband. Surely you can outfly a few little old turbo laser beams, like last time on Kashyyyk? Han scowled. In that case, strap in tight. Jag's boot heels rang on the boarding ramp, followed by the sound of the ramp being raised into place. Leia's ears popped as the hull sealed for space. And then there were Han's muttered words, barely audible as he started the engines. Told you we should have been flying the Falcon. Leia rolled her eyes. In the Falcon, we never would have persuaded them that you weren't aboard. Han's next words were lost as General Quarter's alarms began shrilling in the hangar. Kytus brought the blur around and above the Anakin Solo, giving him an unimpeded view of the vessel and open space before it. Alana cooed with appreciation at the vista of stars and ships. Suddenly there were more ships. A bluish streak resolved itself into the curved, graceful lines of the Moncal cruiser Blue Diver, flagship of the GA Second Fleet forward and to port of the Blur's position. Other capital ships, a score of them, ended their hyperspace jumps in formation all around the vessels already on station. Starfighters now began to stream out of the Anakin Solo's belly and the starfighter bays of other vessels, like piranha beetles swarming out of a just-damaged nest. And if the Blur's sensors were to be believed, the enemy starfighter squadrons and capital ships increasingly outnumbered, continued to race forward. Kytus saw that the enemy capital ships were not assuming any formation he was familiar with. They remained spread out, too far apart to reinforce one another with overlapping fields of fire. He snorted. He wouldn't need to employ his Sith battle meditation technique to turn this into a gruesome victory for the Galactic Alliance— the Confederation couldn't have mounted a worse approach than the one he was seeing. A light appeared on his comm board, and he heard Admiral Limpin's voice. Sir, I'm arraying us in battle diamond formation, overlapping fields of fire to deal with the starfighter problem, and holding here, since they seem anxious to do all the work. Unless you have other specific orders... 
No, Admiral. I'll monitor from here, and maybe assist in defending against the Starfighters. And maybe not. That seems to be an unnecessary risk, sir. But an opportunity to test out the capabilities of the Blur. Yes, sir. The light faded. Alana's voice chided him. You're working again. Sorry, sweetie. Something came up. He banked to port and climbed well above the Blue Diver's relative altitude, activating the Blur's electronic countermeasures as he did so. In moments, he was well outside the GA formation, and he hoped not registering on enemy sensors. Below him, the leading edges of Confederation Starfighter squadrons came within firing range of their GA counterparts. Lasers, little needles of green and red light, flashed between the two forces. The lines of starfighters wavered and broke, dissolving into dozens of dogfights. Kytus frowned. Curiously, the Confederation starfighter force was not hammering its way into the GA formation and going after the big ships. They remained skirmishing in a big furball just before the formation. He shook his head. This was the most extraordinarily stupid way to lose a surprise attack that he had ever seen. Abruptly, his father's voice sounded in his ears, words spoken twenty years before or more. Jason, when you're so much smarter than your opponent that you know you don't even have to make an effort to beat him, that's when he smiles and hands you the vibroblade he just cut your heart out with. Kytus shook his head to clear the memory away. His father didn't have anything to teach him anymore. Now would be the time for the bomb to go off. But no wash of fire burst out of the open hangar door in the Anakin Solo's hull. Baffled, Kytus shook his head. Somebody went away. Alana's voice was faint. What? Somebody went away. And somebody else. They're going away. There was now a world of hurt and dread in Alana's voice. Kytus leaned forward to see what he could of her face, and was surprised to witness tears rolling down her cheeks. But what? Then he knew the answer. She was Force-sensitive. Pilots were dying, and she was feeling the diminishment in the Force that accompanied each death. Inured as he was to death in combat, he paid no more attention to it than he would to a breeze stirring his hair. But Alana was experiencing each event as a little stab of pain. He hesitated, caught off guard. What could he tell her to make the pain go away? No soothing words would keep her from feeling each distant loss. And he was suddenly helpless. Aboard the Love Commander Jaina's calmed signal activated the receiver and chip Han and Jag had planted in the outer door machinery. Rows of warning lights flashed around the outer doors, indicating that the atmosphere shield was being activated. Moments later, the doors slid aside, revealing a number of capital ships looming in the starfield. Han eased the yoke forward. The love commander glided to the entryway, and her prow emerged through the atmosphere shield. But Han did not increase thrust for a run into space. As the yacht's nose entered vacuum, Han meticulously turned to port, toward Anakin Solo's stern. Leaving the hangar, the yacht maintained a distance of less than two meters from the Star Destroyer's hull, too close for the ship's guns to target him. They could not depress that far, and even if they could, a clean hit would hull the yacht and damage the Anakin Solo itself. Jaina nodded. Nice. Slow as a teenager taking her first speeder parking test— 
but nice. Han shot her a dirty look. Now we just have to find the perfect time to make our run for it. Chapter 18 Jag and Zek were just strapping themselves into couches in the yacht's den, plush, embarrassingly comfortable couches, when Alima Rar emerged from the hatch to the stern refresher. Her smile was all innocence. Hello, boys. Does Han Solo have a moment for us? Zek was up in an instant, his lightsaber igniting with a snap hiss. Alima raised her own from beneath her black robes and ignited it. Unbuckling and rising, Jag turned toward the cockpit. Trouble! Alima! Facing Alima again, he did not bother drawing his blaster. He knew the futility of that, at least while she had him in sight. Instead, he reached for the large travel bag at his feet, rummaged through it, and brought out a helmet. It had a large visored slit over the eyes rather than a full faceplate, and was an undecorated burnished gray in color. Swathed as Alima was in her robes, it was hard to tell whether this was the maimed Twi'lek he had followed for years, or the miraculously cured one Han, Leia, and Waru had faced on Kashyyyk. But her face, unblemished, no sign of muscle damage or old breaks to the cheekbone, suggested that it was the latter. He caught Zek's eye and shook his head. Then Jag slipped on his helmet powering up its internal system with a flick of the switch under its collar. Alima attacked, lunging at Zek with speed surpassing that which her Jedi training should have allowed her. The tall Jedi parried, trying to bind Alima's blade with his own. But her attack was not in earnest. Alima's movement carried her past him in a rolling dive that would have sent her over his most likely counterstrike had he thrown one. She hit the compartment's carpeted floor past him, rolled to her feet, and, speed undiminished, charged into the narrow passageway leading to the cockpit. Jag heard the buzz and crackle of lightsaber striking lightsaber. Alima immediately backed into the compartment again, Leia following her, the two of them exchanging lightning-fast blows with their weapons. But where Alima was genuinely striking at Leia's neck, waist, and limbs— Leia looked like a stage performer, her blows designed to connect with her opponent's blade and nothing else. Even Jag, no swordsman, could see Leia pass up an opportunity to cut the Twi'lek down. Jag cycled through the helmet suite of sensors, looking at Alima for a few seconds with each. Primary sensors showed everyone present as a fuzzy image. Flesh did not reflect sensor pings as well as hard surfaces— but Alima was even fuzzier than the others. Under infrared, where Leia was varied shades of green, clothing and different areas of the body showing up as slightly different intensities, Alima was a homogeneous color, the same exact hue from head to foot, except for her lightsaber blade, which radiated far more brightly. Experimentally, he launched a sonar ping, Registering higher than the range of hearing of most species, it was not audible, but it returned an image about as crude as that of his radar set. And Alima was nowhere on that image. Jag smiled. As she danced before Leia, alternately advancing and retreating, Alima failed to guard her back from possible assaults by Zek. The tall Jedi stood inert as though he were not tempted. When Alima's retreat threatened to run her into him, Zek merely stepped aside, giving the two women room to maneuver. How gallant! There was contempt in Alima's words as she left off hammering at Leia to glare at Zek. Well, we will simply have to kill you one at a time, instead of all together. She looked among them. Unless Han Solo wishes to come out and save you trouble by dying nobly, of course. 
Who will be first? None of them moved. None but Jack, who gestured toward the stern. Airlocks that way. Fight us! Leia shook her head. I'm sorry, Alima. We're just not that bored. Alima gaped at her. Then realization dawned. You know. Who told you? Jag shrugged. Lumia, of course. She hated you, you know. He tried to make the lie sound casual, offhand. Liar! Alima sprang at him, her anger and speed catching Jag flat-footed. But Leia was there first, interposing her blade, catching Alima's attack and blocking it, a dismissive expression on her face. If you just want some more sword training, Alima, come back to the Order. Luke will whistle you up a youngling to practice against. Alima glared at Leia, her expression suggesting that an entire thesaurus of expletives was flashing through her mind. Then she wavered. This was not the waver of a person who was tired. It looked instead as though Alima were painted onto a sail that had just caught the first gust of morning wind. She rippled at her waist, and the ripple spread in both directions to her head and her feet. Then she was gone, as if she had never been there. Jag took a deep breath. Thanks, Leia. She deactivated her lightsaber. You might think about learning to dodge. Did you get anything useful? He grinned. Lots. The stealth exes of Red Sword Flight, Luke, Kip, Corin, Tyria Tainer, the Rhodian Twull, and Sonola Tai of Dathomir, dropped out of hyperspace and were confronted with the vista of the Galactic Alliance Task Force drawn up in tight formation, the Confederation Task Force approaching it in some sort of suicidal, spread-out array, and a furious screen of starfighter dogfights raging between them. Luke frowned, considering. The engagement zone, not yet the sort of chaotic battlefield he was used to with capital ship engagements, was certainly not going to provide the Jedi with much cover for their run on the Anakin Solo. Luke felt a distraction, something drawing his attention away from the engagement zone toward an empty area of space far to the port side of the GA capital ships. It took him a moment to recognize the source of the distraction. Twull, whose stealth X carried fewer armaments but better sensors than the other vehicles of sword flight. Twull, whose job it was to detect Jason Solo's tracking device with those sensors. Twull had to be tracking Jason now, and Jason had to be at the point toward which Twull had directed Luke's attention. Luke felt, and quickly attempted to quell, a sense of excitement, even celebration. If Jason was out on some sort of joyride— perhaps observing the capital ship engagement from a safe distance, then the Jedi might be able to ignore several levels of Jason's defenses that they had prepared for. The cargo compartments of their stealth exes were loaded with equipment especially chosen and crafted for this mission, which originally entailed having the squadron creep up close to the Anakin Solo as it waited in space, then launching a salvo of engine-crippling proton torpedoes and having most of the Jedi divert retaliatory attacks and starfighters while Luke and Kip, laden with equipment, secretly boarded and tried to reach Jason. If Jason really was hovering away from the Anakin Solo, though, Luke's squadron could conceivably just fly over to him and compel his surrender. Or shoot him. But how would Luke convey a complicated revision in orders to the others— while he observed calm silence. He thought about it, then relaxed. He wouldn't have to. 
The standing orders he had put together for this mission would suffice, even in this new situation. The other Jedi were to follow Luke in toward the Anakin Solo. He would initiate the Jedi battle meld, not used before then, so that Jason would not be forewarned, and all Jedi present were to begin accomplishing their respective assignments. But with this new situation, Luke merely needed to give the others a sense in the force of his new direction, and begin heading toward the spot Twull had pointed out to him. As they all neared Jason, their own passive sensors, less sensitive than Twull's, would pick up the signal from the tracking device Siha had placed on Jason's cloak. When they were near enough, Luke would open fire on Jason's vehicle and simultaneously initiate the battle meld. No additional communication was necessary. With the faintest of follow-me nudges to his comrades through the force, Luke banked toward the distant target. Each of the three masters had a Jedi Knight as his wingmate, and Luke's was Sonola. Because she was the youngest Jedi Knight on this mission, she was paired with the most experienced master, which bothered Luke neither intellectually nor emotionally, except that he was reminded, approximately three times per second, that it should have been Mara's stealth X pacing his own. Though not actively seeking her in the Force, he could feel Sonola trailing behind him, close enough that she could keep tabs on him visually, far enough back that a moment's inattentiveness would not cause her to collide with him. She was a good, studious Jedi, and though young, had inherited the piloting skill that characterized her aunt, Karana. Luke did not need to worry about her. A glance out the port side of his canopy showed him that the Confederation capital ships were nearing the Starfighter engagement zone. Streamers of dueling vessels were now flowing away from the zone. It appeared that the outmatched Confederation starfighters were fleeing, pursued by their vengeful G.A. counterparts. Luke frowned. He felt no sense of panic from that direction. But that was not his concern. A red target blip appeared on Luke's sensor board, identified as the signal from Jason's tracer. Luke eased off his thruster and coasted the last few kilometers, open to the force, but not expressing himself through it. The white crosshairs representing his stealth X neared the target zone. Patient, Luke waited for the other Jedi to arrive. He could feel them, faintly, nearing his location. It was time. Luke reached out for the other Jedi and felt his awareness merge with theirs, combining into the battle meld that made them so effective in group missions. Simultaneously, not bothering to work with targeting computers, blips, and brackets, he swung his snub fighter's nose a trifle to starboard, located his target by feel, and fired. Four lances of red light leapt from his stealth X and converged on a distant point in space. Titus felt the change a moment before he understood what it meant. One instant he was floating in space with a crying little girl, distraught because he could not charm or coax away her tears. The next he was expectant, hopeful, ready for a fight. They weren't his emotions. He had been enveloped by a Jedi battle meld. Even Alana felt it. Her head came up, her distress momentarily forgotten. With a curse he had not intended to utter in front of his daughter, Kaidus grabbed the blur's control yoke and hit the thrusters. Not fast enough. The inner surfaces of his solar arrays flashed red, and his blur kicked as it was hit from behind by a full-strength laser shot. The blur spun from the impact. Then the thrusters kicked in, and he was hurtling away from that spot in space, executing one more tumble before he could gain complete control over his prototype tie. Use shields, or continue to use stealth technology. Each choice was equally good, equally bad. He decided on the latter. Hoping that his sudden burst of speed had taken him out of direct view of his attackers, he could begin to make out the identity of his ambushers now. Luke, 
The Shining Presence, Kip Duran, Corin Horn, two or three others he didn't know well enough to recognize. Three masters this time. They'd learned their lesson at the Senate Building when he'd finished off Kyle Katarn. Both times they'd attacked when he was in the company of his daughter. His anger grew, ready to fuel his powers. He felt his enemies seeking him, felt them turning after him. He made himself smaller in the Force, reducing his presence to nothingness. He would give them nothing to work with. Lasers erupted behind him, missing by meters. He veered to starboard. The laser burst tracked his movement, clipping his port solar array wing before the burst ended. Kytus growled. They were doing a fine job of tracking him. Either the blur was not all it was cracked up to be, or they had some other means of determining his location. Then Alana started crying again, and Kytus knew he had his answer. They were homing in on Alana's force presence. They had to be. They were using her to target him. Hypocritical opportunists, for all their talk of protecting the innocent, they were now going to use a blameless little girl, shredding her life to get to him. His anger grew, consuming him, casting everything he saw within the cockpit, every star outside the viewpoint, in a haze of redness. So great it was that he could no longer contain his presence in the Force. His anger flowed through him, through Alana, through his pursuers, through everything in tune with him or the Force. The Love Commander waited, clamped by magnetic landing gear to the stern of the Anakin Solo, Han and Jaina staying alert for an opportunity to launch when the ship's gunners were likely to be distracted. The opportunity had not yet come, the Star Destroyer's complement of starfighters had launched, joining the engagement between the capital ship fleets, leaving none behind to harass the yacht. But the instant the yacht moved away from the vessel, it would come within sight of its turbo lasers and ion cannons. Leia, seated in the captain's chair, grew more restless, and then was hit by a wave of hatred. Redness and heat swamped her. Hatred for the Jedi, hatred for Luke, for the Confederation, for lasers and explosives and chaos. She gasped, her back spasming from the overload of emotion. In the starboard seat ahead of her, she saw Jaina jerk. But her daughter was less affected than she had been. Sweetheart, Leia, what's wrong? In an instant, Han was by her side, gripping her flailing hand, helpless concern on his face. It's Jason. He's out there. She gestured to starboard, well away from the Anakin Solo. He's... I don't know. I've never felt him like this. She shook her head to clear it. Luke's there, too. Han's expression shifted from concern to grim determination. All right. We're going now. Turbo lasers or no turbo lasers. Time to prove that I can fly a sand bucket through an ion storm. He returned to his seat, strapped himself in. Jaina's voice was a rebuke. That we can. Right. We'll argue over who's second best when we're out of here. Chapter 19 Luke felt the wave of hatred flow through him. It was so strong it felt like a kick in the gut, and he wondered for an instant if Jason had perfected some new force attack. But no. The undercurrent was of frustration, helplessness, even fear. It was no attack. It was like a man in his last seconds of life recognizing that fact. And Luke did not hate. He fired again, his laser cannons chipping away at the top of Jason's fuselage as his target, through brilliant evasive flying, 
kept his attacks from striking a more vital portion of the starfighter. Luke remained calm, reactive, ready to defend, ready to kill. He felt the other two stealth X-wing pairs approach his position. Soon they would be in firing range. Soon this would be over. Shields, then. Kytus disengaged the electronic countermeasures and activated his shields. Since he could not evade detection by his enemies, he would have to elude them for a while. Nor was there any need to maintain calm silence. Solo to Anakin Solo. I'm under starfighter attack. Get me some starfighter support here now. Bring the Anakin Solo as well. Tebut's smooth, controlled voice answered him. At once, sir. Kytus heeled over to commence a sprint back to the capital ship formation. But he could feel Kip and Corin vector to place themselves in his path, while Luke remained close behind. Kytus stifled a curse. Blast, but they were good, herding him away from his safe haven. If anything, his rage grew. And with each increase in his anger, Alana's sobbing grew louder, her body shaking against his. He could not comfort her. To comfort her now would be to die. Juking and jinking, his own skills and force insights making him an unpredictable target, he moved away from the Alliance formation, driven by his pursuers, his maneuvers eating up so much of his speed that he had no chance of outdistancing them. Luke's lasers, sometimes joined by Kip's or Corin's, came perilously close to him, occasionally brightening his shields and rattling his blur. He became lost in time, lost in his rage, existing in the moment. He could not have remembered his name, only that he had to fly, that he had to protect his daughter. Sweat poured from him, his flight suit had ceased absorbing his sweat long ago. Now it pooled in his boots and drenched his pilot's couch. Then there was... intrusion. More presences. Kip and Corin were suddenly farther away, reducing the number of inbound attacks. Kytus hazarded a glance at his sensor board. It showed a changed battlefield. He was now far away from the Alliance formation. In fact, it no longer was an Alliance formation. The Alliance and Corellian capital ships had merged into a single formation, one in which the antiquated Corellian vessels were taking a horrible beating, but fighting on. Most of the engagement starfighters were away from that zone, the Corellians leading the Alliance away in the distance. Closer, there were Alliance-marked starfighters in Jason's vicinity trading fire with the stealth X's, tracking them by their laser emissions. As Kytus watched, the stealth X's ceased laser fire. Now they would rely solely on shadow bombs, launched with use of the Force and therefore undetectable by ordinary sensors. Not Luke. He stayed on Kytus's tail, still pouring laser fire at the blur, as did Luke's wingmates but a trio of Alliance starfighters, two XJ-7 X-wings, and one of those ungainly, round-nosed Aleph starfighters, now harassed Kytus's pursuers. Some distance away, a red blip representing an enemy the size of a small transport was inbound. Its transceiver signal showed it to be the Love Commander. Beyond that, the Anakin Solo was also inbound. Kytus nodded. He returned his attention to his flying. A moment's distraction now would kill him. But the end of this engagement was in sight. The Anakin Solo would arrive. Its turbo lasers and ion cannons would chase the Jedi away. And he could return to safety. Luke stayed on Jason's tail, but the situation was worsening. Sonola Tai had dropped back, to engage the enemy X-Wings and Aleph. But if their pilots were good, she couldn't hold them. And without the other two masters to help hurt him, Jason would be able to turn back to the Anakin Solo. 
Luke had to finish this fight now. He opened himself further to the Force, hoping that it would give him insight not just into where Jason was, but also where he intended to be in the next second. Jason was not concealing himself in the Force now. He was... He was... He was with a little girl. Luke started. He took his thumb off the laser trigger and probed again. There was, in fact, a little girl in the cockpit with Jason. Her presence had been washed out by the hatred Jason was pouring into the Force, but now Jason was calming, and the little girl's distress made her a brighter presence. Luke's stealth axe shook. A quad-laser blast from the pursuing Aleph had grazed him during his moment of surprise. Kill Jason. Kill an innocent. Luke veered away from his target and sent a non-verbal command for the other Jedi to form up on him. He felt their surprise and distress, but he made his intent stronger, insistent. The stealth exes veered away, toward empty space. The starfighters they had been dueling continued to chase them, but gave up after perhaps half a minute. They returned to surround Jason's TIE prototype, acting as his escort. Titus sagged as he gave way to exhaustion. He kept one hand on his control yoke, guiding the blur back toward the Anakin Solo, and used the other to hold Alana to him. She looked up at him, red-eyed, her tears unabated, hiccuping in her distress. Colonel Solo to Starfighter Escort. Who's piloting the Twee? A woman's voice came back immediately. Dancer One, sir. I mean your name. Yes, sir. Lieutenant C. Al Antilles, sir. Off Blue Diver. Kytus grimaced. He'd been helped by the oldest daughter of an enemy. Yet another traitor to the Alliance. Still, he had always promised to reward loyalty and merit. And moments ago he had decided to do just that for the Aleph pilot. It's Captain Antilles now. Ah! Uh. It wasn't so much a word as an exhalation. Titus couldn't tell whether she sounded more pleased or pained. Through the force she felt only shocked, though the other presence in the cockpit with her, doubtless her gunner, felt elated. Seal's voice was cool, professional. Thank you, sir. And be advised that the stealth ex-pilot you chased off was a pretty good pilot himself. Antilles, you just sent Luke Skywalker into retreat. Ahead of him, space far in the distance behind the Anakin Solo, back in the vicinity of the capital ships, was suddenly transfixed by a column of light, kilometers wide, that twisted and writhed like something alive. Space curled and wrenched, as though a vengeful child were playing with the controls of a monitor, stretching and distorting everything in the middle third of the screen. Kytus saw ships, silhouetted within the beam, elongate, as though they were being drawn into wire. Turbolaser fire curved impossibly. One blast bent back on itself, slamming into the shields of the cruiser that had fired it. Ships contracted to tiny dots and disappeared entirely. With the brightness and distortion came a blow in the force. It hammered at Kytus, a vast instantaneous loss of life. Alana's sobs cut off. She slumped in Kytus's lap, mercifully relieved of the burden of consciousness. Then space darkened and twisted back to its normal shape. Where once scores of ships had floated and fought, now there was only nothingness, or perhaps twisted wreckage, with no destructive beams or running lights to illuminate it. 
on the verge of distributing hyperspace coordinates for their first jump, Luke bent over as the wave of pain and dread hit him. It was far from enough to incapacitate him, but he could feel a resonating shock from the others in his battle melt. He put up a rear holocam view on his cockpit monitor. It showed the Anakin Solo and tiny flashes of the ever more distant main starfighter engagement, and emptiness where all the capital ships should be. Numbed, he considered options. Turn back to help? Help whom? With six stealth X's? Look for the cause, without a core of scientists or adequate sensory gear? Jason was alive. Luke could feel him. He could feel Leia, too, not far away, and Jaina and Zek. They were safe. Whatever had hit the region seemed to be an all-or-nothing attack, and it was done. Dry-mouthed, he activated his comm board and transmitted the jump route. Let's go. Proximity alarms screamed all across the Love Commander's bridge. Leia felt a yawning emptiness rise up to swallow her. She forced it back, saw Jaina turn toward her, pale-faced. It was like that day long ago, when she had seen Alderaan destroyed. She hadn't known then that she was Force-sensitive, hadn't realized that she was feeling the shock of those millions of deaths, as well as her own sense of loss and horror. This blow through the Force was much less severe, but her sensitivity to such things was much greater. She stood on shaky legs. What just happened? Han glanced between her and Jaina, then returned his attention to his sensors. Something just appeared in back of us. In back of the... Behind Colonel Solo's ship. Something huge, if its gravitic signature is any indication. Then it faded. The proximity alarms thought we were too near a planetary mass. He looked again, gave a grunt of surprise. The two task forces are gone. Gone? Just gone? Just gone. Most of the starfighters are still out there away from where the capital ships were. Center point. Jaina's voice was subdued. That had to be center point station firing. Yeah. Han banked sharply to port and accelerated. Colonel Solo's ship is behind us. Starfighters are headed our way from ahead. It's time to go. Leia cast out with her feelings and picked up a strong presentment of Luke, a fading presence that was Jason. They were alive. In Jason's case, she felt both relief and dread.